Recorded Books and R.B. Digital present The Widows of Malabar Hill by Sujatha Masi Narrated by Sunila Nankani 1921 Chapter 1 A Stranger's Gaze Bombay, February 1921 on the morning Perveen saw the stranger, they'd almost collided. Perveen had come upon him half-hidden in the portico entrance to Mystery House. The unshaven, middle-aged man appeared as if he'd slept for several days and nights in his broadcloth shirt and the grimy cotton dhoti that hung in a thousand creases from his waist to his ankles. His small, squinting eyes were tired, and he exuded a rank odor of sweat mixed with betel nut. A visitor to Mystery Law this early was rare. The firm was located in Fort, Bombay's first settlement. Although the old wall had been taken down, the district was still a fortress of law and banking, with most openings between nine and ten. Assuming the man was a sad sack client, Praveen glanced down, not wanting him to feel overly scrutinized. The idea of a woman solicitor was a shock to many. But when Perveen glanced down, she was disconcerted to see the man wasn't poor at all. His thin legs were covered by black stockings, and his feet were laced into scuffed black leather brogues. The only place men wore British shoes and stockings with their dhotis was Calcutta, about twelve hundred miles away. Calcutta, the city that would always remind her of Cyrus. As Perveen looked up, her alarm must have revealed itself. The man scuffled backward. Just a minute. Are you seeking mystery law? She called as he rushed across the street. Feeling perplexed, Perveen rapped on the door, which was opened moments later by Mustafa, the longtime butler in charge of Mystery House. The elderly man touched his heart and forehead in greeting before taking the tiffin box she'd brought with the day's lunch. Adab, Perveen Memsab, he said. And where is your honorable father this morning? He's got Jayanath's trial at the High Court. Mustafa, did you know someone was waiting in our doorway? He looked past her into the now empty portico. No. Where has he gone? Across the street. He's the man wearing the dhoti. Perveen saw that the man was now standing in the shadow of a building. Mustafa squinted. Although dirty, he isn't a beggar. Not with shoes. Shoes and stockings, Perveen pointed out. Had he knocked, I would have told him to come after ten. You are too busy first thing in the morning for such strangers. Although I saw no appointments in the book today. Perveen noted the worry in his voice. Mustafa knew that it was a struggle for her to attract clients. I didn't book any appointments today because an old friend is sailing in from England. I'll meet her when she arrives. S.S. London? Perveen smiled. You must have checked today's paper for the listing. The grizzled old man tilted his head downward, accepting the praise. Yes, indeed. I'll inform you when the London is unloading. And tell me, will your English friend come to Mystery House? I could prepare a small tea. I think Alice will go to her parents' home in Malabar Hill first, but perhaps she'll visit soon. Perveen surveyed the marble foyer, which was softly lit by lamps and gilded sconces. She would relish showing the Bombay Gothic building to her friend, Alice Hobson Jones. The twenty-foot ceilings were a design feature of which Abbas Kaya Mystery, her late grandfather, had been especially proud. It always seemed as if her grandfather were watching from the long portrait guarding the entryway. His eyes, as inky black as his flat-topped feta, 
were all knowing, but not warm. I've got a load of papers to work through upstairs. I hope Papa's back for lunch, because I've brought a very good one today. He must win at court, inshallah, Mustafa said piously, or he won't have an appetite. He loses very rarely, Praveen said, although that morning's case would be a hard one. Both she and Jamshedji had been quiet in the car coming in, he looking over his notes, she gazing out the window, thinking of their young client in jail a few miles away, wondering if this would be the day he was freed. Your father wins with his God-given ability to know the thoughts behind people's faces, Mustafa told her. Mystery Saab can read the judge's face like a newspaper. Herveen sighed, wishing she had the same talent. She had no idea if the stranger was a lost soul or harbinger of serious trouble. Putting the awkward incident aside, she trudged upstairs to address a half-done property contract on her side of the big mahogany partner's desk. Legal paperwork was sometimes numbing, but the subtlety of one word could mean the difference between a client's success and his ruin. Three years of reading law had built her understanding, but a half year working under her father had taught her to inspect each line backward and forward. As the morning grew sunnier, she switched on the small electric fan that sat in a central window. Mystery House had been the first building on the block to pay for electric service, and due to its high cost, she was supposed to use it sparingly. Praveen glanced out the window and down to the street. Fort's twenty square miles were once the East India Company's original fortified settlement. Now the district was known for the high court and the many law offices around it. Nestled alongside the British and Hindu and Muslim law offices were a significant number owned by members of her own religious community, the Indian-born Zoroastrians. Although Parsis accounted for just 6% of Bombay's total inhabitants, they constituted one-third of its lawyers. Iranis, the Zoroastrian immigrants who had come from the 19th century onward, prided themselves on running superlative bakeries and cafes serving cuisine influenced by their ancient homeland of Persia. Such was Yazdani's, the bakery cafe across the street. The shop drew more than 200 customers every day. This morning, the customers going in and out were working their way around a solitary obstacle. It was the Bengali stranger. He'd left the place where she'd seen him earlier and set himself up in the shadow of the restaurant's awning. This allowed him to face Mystery House without roasting in the sun. Praveen felt a surge of apprehension, and then reminded herself that she couldn't be seen inside the second floor of Mystery House. From her perch, she had a bird's-eye view. In a corner of the office, a tall Godrage cabinet was Praveen's alone. It held umbrellas, extra clothing, and the Bombay Samachar article touting her as Bombay's first woman solicitor— She'd wanted to frame the news story and hang it on the downstairs wall, along with Jamshedji Mystery's many accolades. Her father had thought it too much to throw in the faces of clients who needed a gentle introduction to the prospect of female representation. Perveen rummaged in the cabinet until she found her mother-of-pearl opera glasses— Back at the window, she adjusted the focus until the man's sinister face appeared close up. He did not look like anyone she'd ever seen in Fort, nor could she remember seeing him in Calcutta. Praveen laid down the opera glasses and turned to unopened letters from the previous day. A thick envelope engraved with a return address, 22 Sea View Road, topped the stack. An existing client was a priority. This client, Mr. Omar Farid, was a textile mill owner who had succumbed to stomach cancer two months previously. Praveen read the letter from the appointed estate trustee, Faisal Mukri. 
Mr. Mukri wanted her to make a change that would disrupt the estate settlement on which she'd been working. Mr. Farid had three widows, all of whom still lived together in his house, and a total of four children, a humble number of offspring for a polygynist, according to Jamshedji. Mr. Mukri had written that all the widows wanted to give up their assets as donations to the family's wakf, a charitable trust that provided funds each year to the needy while paying a dividend to specified relatives. While a man or woman certainly could donate wherever he or she desired, wakfs were assiduously monitored by the government in order to prevent fraud, and a sudden infusion of money might be cause for scrutiny. Praveen decided to speak with her father before responding to Mr. Mukri. Praveen placed the offending letter on Jamshedji's side of the desk as Mustafa came in with a small silver tray holding a cup of tea with two Britannia biscuits perched jauntily on the saucer. After a tiny sip of the hot, milky brew, she asked Mustafa, Have you been out to the street? I haven't. Why? She couldn't express her deep-seated worry, so she only said, The man who was blocking the doorway has stationed himself across the street. Lurking on Bruce Street? From Mustafa's grim expression, she thought he looked ready to grab his old Punjabi regiment rifle that he kept in a kitchen cabinet. Shall I toss him to the esplanade? There's probably no reason to, but if you want to look at him, try these. Praveen went to the window, where she picked up the opera glasses. It took her a few minutes to show the elderly man how to adjust the lenses to his needs. Ay, such magical spectacles. One can see all over with these. Aim toward Yazdani's. Do you see him? The man in the white dhoti. Mustafa sighed. Now I'm remembering he was nearby when I went outside to buy milk. How early was that? Usual time, twenty, thirty minutes before your arrival. This meant the man had been staking out their building for three hours straight. Legally, he had the right to stand where he wanted, but Brew Street was Praveen's second home, and she felt anxious to know for whom the out-of-towner was waiting. Trying to sound matter-of-fact, she said, I'll walk over and ask why he's there. Mustafa put down the glasses and looked at her with alarm. You are a young lady alone. I should be the one to send that but marsh packing. Praveen regretted pulling Mustafa into her worries. Please stay. There are so many people around that nothing could happen. Still grumbling about danger to young ladies, Mustafa followed her downstairs. He opened the heavy door with great ceremony. Scowling dramatically, he remained on the marble step after she went out. A bullock cart rolled past, and Praveen took advantage of its cover to cross the street unnoticed. As she came up in front of the Bengali, he acknowledged her arrival with a sharp upward movement of his face. Then he pivoted away, as if meaning to hide himself. Good day to you, Saab. Do you work nearby? Praveen asked politely in Hindi. La, ah, uh, ah. Uh. His answer came in the form of a raspy cough. Saab, are you waiting for someone on Bruce Street? Nah. He responded fast this time and glared at her with his bloodshot eyes. Striving to keep her voice steady, she spoke again. Do you know Cyrus Sodawala? His mouth opened, revealing crooked, pond-stained teeth. He stood still for a moment, and then he ran. Praveen stared after him in dismay. She'd hoped he'd say no. She had anticipated a flat denial, not a departure. Huzzah! 
Mustafa was waving his arms side to side, as if she'd bowled a perfect cricket score. Parveen felt too shaken to return to Mustafa. She waved back at him and decided to venture inside Yazdani's. Lily Yazdani was working behind the counter. The fourteen-year-old's long hair was tied up with a traditional matabana cloth, and she wore a snowy apron over a pretty yellow sari. She beamed at the appearance of Perveen. Kimcho, Perveen? Lily called out a greeting in Gujarati. Good morning to you, Lily. And why aren't you in school? A water pipe burst yesterday, so it's closed. Lily drew the corners of her lips down in an exaggerated frown. I'm missing two tests. Perveen winced. I hope mystery construction isn't at fault. I believe the company built your school. Who cares about the pipe? I'd rather be here baking cakes with my papa. Perveen was sorry to hear this. She had a nagging anxiety that Lily would leave high school too early. Thoreau's Yazdani emerged from the kitchen, his round face damp from heat. Wiping flowery hands on his apron, he said, What is your pleasure today, my dear Perveen? The dahitan were fried an hour ago and are soaking in sweet rose syrup. And of course, there are the cashews and almond fudges and the pudding and custard cups. Because of her inward agitation, Perveen didn't think she could force anything sweet down her throat without gagging. At the same time, she couldn't walk away without a purchase. I'm welcoming an old friend from England at Ballad Beer later on today, so I'd like you to pack me a small box of your prettiest dahitan. Most beautiful and sweet, just like you. Feroz's wide grin split his face like a cracked persimmon. By the way, did you serve a fellow from outside Bombay this morning? Feroz looked puzzled, but Lily spoke up. We had a dark and grumpy customer with a funny accent. He bought a date nut cake and some almond fudge. I told him he could sit at a table, but he went outside. He stayed outside for a few hours, Perveen said. I asked him something, and he ran away as if I were a nasty British policeman. Probably he arrived on the overnight train because he seemed quite tired, Lily reflected. He asked in the funniest accent what time law offices opened up in this area. I said nine o'clock for most firms, and half nine if it's the mysteries. What are you doing giving out such information about our esteemed neighbors? Feroz wagged a reproving finger at his daughter. Feroz knew things about Perveen that he blessedly never disclosed. She could have said the name Cyrus to him and his eyes would have flared with recognition. But she would not parade her past mistakes in front of his impressionable daughter. That accent is a Bengali one. Now that Lily's described him, do you recall him? She asked him. The baker shook his head. My cardamom dough needed attention, so I was in back. It's good that you told off that velgard. A wise woman can catch trouble before it starts, Lily said, as she tied a fine bow around the box of sweets. Papa, would you let me run your business later on, just as Mystery Saab is doing with Perveen? My father has hardly done that. He'll work for many more years, and I still must prove my worth. Perveen spoke sincerely. It was a heavy responsibility to be the only woman solicitor in Bombay. She couldn't bring shame on Jamshedji mystery. This was why the stranger's presence bothered her, and the reason she wasn't going to tell her father about it. Chapter 2 Behind a Curtain Bombay, February 1921 Back at Mystery House, Perveen handed off the sweets to Mustafa for safekeeping and gave a brief summary of the words she'd exchanged with the stranger, not mentioning Cyrus. 
She didn't want the garrulous Mustafa to ask any more questions. She needed to work. Upstairs, she opened the file cabinets to search for any documents relating to the late Omar Farid. There was plenty to wade through. Property deeds, maps of land holdings, contracts with the government for the production of khaki drill cloth. She was startled two hours later when Mustafa knocked on the door to say lunch was served. Her father had just come in and was washing his hands downstairs. She put the papers aside. Did my father tell you the outcome? He said he's hungry. Praveen hurried down to the dining room, where her father was seated at the long rosewood table. Jamshedji Mystery was a trim, good-looking man of fifty, with a thick head of graying brown hair. His most dominant feature, which Praveen had inherited in a slightly reduced version, was a beaky nose. Outsiders joked about Parsi noses, but Praveen loved their shared trait. The two bent their heads and recited their prayers. Then Mustafa served up the lunch sent by John, the mystery's Goan cook. John had worked hard preparing lamb koftas, a tamarind chicken curry, a thick yellow dal with mustard greens, and caramelized rice. He'd also sent tangy vegetable pickles, fragrant wheat rotlis, and a tin of almond honey brittle large enough to last a week. Mustafa looked disapproving when Praveen requested smaller servings than usual, but her nerves had affected her appetite. Papa, I'm waiting with open ears. Did we win? After accepting a large serving of chicken curry, Jamshedji spoke. Yes, but after a long deliberation. If only you'd seen the opposing counsel smiling anticipating our ruin. Did he call our client to the stand? She'd expected it. That he did, and the boy was prepared for every question. The boy was Jayanth, a twenty-year-old stevedore who'd been charged with inciting unrest through the organization of other workers. Taking into consideration the British fear of communists, Praveen had suggested Jayanth be cast as a hard worker with no political affiliations, just a strong desire for the safety of all the dock workers. This concern would ultimately aid his employer, she had argued, because fewer accidents and deaths would allow for work without interruption. Good, she said, relieved that her coaching had worked. And what was the content of Judge Thorpe's decision? Innocent on all charges. Judge Thorpe ruled Jayanth must be offered his former position and be paid for every day since his sacking three months ago. That I wasn't expecting. Praveen clapped. Splendid! I wish I'd seen you plead the case. Jamshedji raised a finger, playing teacher. Ah, but your work as a contract solicitor is what keeps mystery law profitable. Without contracts and wills, we could not take on pro bonos like Jayanth. This was the most praise Perveen had received in the six months she'd been working. She was performing not only the tasks of a solicitor, but also those of law clerk, translator, and accountant. But who was she to complain? There was not another law firm in the city that would employ a female solicitor. Papa, were you expecting a visitor this morning? Does this have to do with you spying on strangers through opera glasses? Praveen scooped rice into her mouth and chewed. Mustafa obviously had mentioned the morning's excitement. She needed to tell the truth but she also wanted to avoid making her father nervous. A Bengali man was lurking across the street for three hours. Eventually, I went across to inquire his reason. He ran off without explaining anything. Jamshedji shook his head. Our beloved fort is becoming overcrowded with all types, but a woman should never approach a man on the street. Perveen's irritation swelled at her father's judgmental tone. 
It was hardly an approach. You crossed the street and sought him out. Tell me, is that the European behavior you learned at Oxford? No, I... Perveen felt herself reddening. I first thought he might be waiting for you, either because he had an appointment or was angry about the outcome of a case. I represent clients from all communities, but no Bengalis in the last year. Jamshedji said, his voice as grating as Mustafa's serving spoon scraping the porcelain rice bowl. Don't worry about such matters. Concentrate on pushing forward the contracts. Yes, one mustn't lose the title of King of Contracts, Perveen said sarcastically. Keep up your efforts and you might become known as the Queen of Contracts. Jamshedji chuckled. Speaking of contracts, we received a request from the Farid household. The cover note was from Mr. Mukri, the family's agent. He wrote that Mr. Farid's three widows want to give up their dowers to donate to the family's wakf. Perveen didn't mask her apprehension that all the women, who no longer had income from a husband, were giving up their only assets to the charitable foundation. But Jamshedji didn't address the issue of walks. Stroking his chin, he said, It sounds as if you are speaking of Mahar. Yes, I am, Perveen sighed knowing she should have used the word for the special two-part dower that Muslim women received from men's families. The first gift symbolized the family's welcome to a bride, the second part, given at either divorce or the husband's death, was a material promise of fair treatment throughout her life. Bombay judges have been rather prickly about Maher these days. Let me look at the documents. After she'd fetched both letters from upstairs, her father pulled out his gold monocle to study the fine sheets of vellum. Then he shook his head. Worthless. Perveen had been perched on the edge of her seat, waiting for such a declaration. Isn't it strange that all three women wish to make a change against their own interests? And that two of the signatures are almost identical? And how convenient for the judge that this letter from the women was written in English. Are they really all fluent in English? I cannot answer the last question because I have never met the ladies. But we must not have immediate prejudices. Jamshedji gave her a reproving look. Perveen didn't hide her surprise. Are you telling me you've never spoken to the wives in all the years you represented Mr. Farid? I have not, he said, signaling with his hand for Mustafa to bring tea. The Farid widows live in strict seclusion. With my late client gone, the only male in the household is the baby son of the second wife. Purda Nasheens don't speak with men, Mustafa said as he came around with the silver teapot. My mother and sisters didn't close themselves in, but many of the wealthy do, especially Hanafi Muslims. Perveen always appreciated Mustafa's wisdom about areas where she knew little. Now her dismay at the women's situation was being replaced by interest. Secluded, wealthy Muslim women could become a subspecialty for her practice— Mustafa, I believe Purda means veil. Does Nasheen mean lady? You are supposed to be studying Urdu, her father interrupted. Nasheen means sitting or dwelling. Therefore, Purda Nasheens means those who stay behind the veil. Perveen took a long sip of Mustafa's delicious tea, a mixture of Darjeeling brewed with milk, cardamom, pepper, and plenty of sugar. What do you think of the household agent, Mr. Mukri? she asked her father. I'm supposed to ask him to help sort out details for the estate, 
but he's not answered many of my letters. Mukri was one of Farid's management officers at the fabric mill. He shifted to staying with Farid Saab during his illness. I saw him when he came in to sign papers relating to his appointment as a state trustee and household agent. A young man, but he was most respectful toward our client. As he should have been. But let's talk about the letter he sent that's signed by the widows. I think two of the signatures might come from the same hand. Jamshedji studied the paper and then handed it back to her. The names signed by Sakina and Muntaz do bear a resemblance. Razia's name appears different. Excuse me, Saab, but you should say Begum. Mustafa interjected from the corner, where he stood awaiting further command. To address these married ladies of high birth respectfully, one must add Begum. After nodding at Mustafa, Praveen said, I am guessing Razia Begum signed for herself. What if the other two were signed for by someone else? Perhaps Mr. Mukri? Conspiracy theory. Jamshade Ji said with a chuckle. We have no way of knowing. Shouldn't we ask them? Jamshade Ji put his teacup down so hard it rattled in the saucer. I already mentioned that the ladies live in seclusion. I haven't reviewed the Maher documents since I drafted them all those years ago. Remind me, are these dowers equivalent in value? That's the best case when you've got multiple wives surviving a husband. The Maher gifts are wildly different, she answered, relieved that he'd ask the question. Your client gave the first wife, Razia Begum, a dower of land, four acres in Girangao, a plot that holds two mill buildings that went up in 1914. Ji picked up his cup and took a long sip. That sounds like quite a large gift, but in 1904 it was swampland. Are you saying the mills that made the company's fortune are there now? She nodded, feeling pride that she'd caught something her father should have known. I consulted the map of his holdings we have on file. Part two of the Mahar, to be awarded at time of husband's death or divorce, was listed as 5,000 rupees. Perveen was glad to have the papers handy, so she could keep the details of all the wives' arrangements straight. Farid Saab's second wife, Sakina Chivni, received a very different kind of mahar, a diamond and emerald jewelry set comprised of earrings, a necklace, and bangles. Her second mahar payment was also 5,000 rupees. Mr. Farid was doing well by 1914 when he married his second wife, Jamshedji said. I don't recall the cost of that jewellery, but we have the insurance papers for many of his valuables. Why did Mr. Farid decide to take a second wife? Perveen asked. Despite what her father had said about the client's good character, she felt squeamish about polygyny which was still practiced by many Muslims and a smaller number of elite Hindus. In truth, there was surely polygyny in her own parents' family histories. Parsis hadn't made it a crime until 1865. The obvious reason. Jamshedji raised his thick salt-and-pepper eyebrows. Offspring? But the first wife, Razia Begum, had borne him a daughter— Eleven years old now, I believe, Perveen said evenly. He had his heir. But no son. He needed someone to work inside the mills. His parents were the ones who insisted and found Sakina Chivni. I tell you, it was quite a disappointment when she bore two daughters straight away. Sakina Begum's son was born a year and a half ago. By then, the complaining parents had both passed. Like I said, he got his son. Praveen crossed her arms. Why did he also need a third wife? 
He met Mumtaz just last year and married her five months before his death. It was a legal choice freely made by him. Jamshedji shook his head, although I considered it rather strange. Eagerly, Praveen picked up on his language. What do you mean by that? Jamshedji toyed with a few leftover grains of rice. She was a musician, working in the entertainment district on Falkland Road. That's the reason for her mahar. Two sitars and one veena, Parveen mused. Did she know he hadn't long to live? Undoubtedly, Jamshedji said. He was very frail at that time of his life, but those musical instruments are a pittance compared to what the others received. I don't think she did it for money. Look at this! Praveen said, studying Mumtaz's marriage contract with new interest. Mumtaz signed this document in July 1920 with an X. Yet her name is signed on the new letter. Did she learn to write in the last seven months? I'm interested to ask her about that discrepancy. Jamshedji blinked. What do you mean, ask her? She'd gotten ahead of herself. Taking a deep breath, she asked, Might secluded Muslim ladies be willing to meet with a female lawyer? He gave her a long look. There's a chance. I'd like to speak to them directly, rather than continue my one-way correspondence with Mr. Mukri. Parveen tried to sound detached and professional. Jamshedji sipped the last dregs of tea and put down his cup. I'm not certain you're ready to make a personal call to secluded women. You must use caution. Praveen felt wounded. I'm always cautious. No, he said with a soft smile. You are impatient and impetuous. I've overheard you speaking about the government. Perveen made a face at him. In private circles only, I know mystery construction depends on government contracts. You've also said more than most are ready to hear about women's rights. Other Parsi women are doing the same. Mama's groups are always working on women's welfare and education. She felt on firm ground because her father had donated generously to her mother's causes. What you say will sound like Latin to these ladies who've been sheltered their whole lives. Your Urdu is less than rudimentary, and you haven't studied enough Mohammedan law. Were these honest criticisms? Or was he just trying to discern how motivated she'd be? Praveen did her best to answer coolly. I've read Mr. Mullah's Principle of Mohammedan Law, which explains everything I need to know. I can speak with the ladies in Hindustani. Surely they'll understand me. But they very likely never met a Parsi, Jamshedji objected. Praveen's frustration spilled over. Papa... You own the only law firm in Bombay with an employee who can communicate directly with secluded women. Why not take advantage of the greatly underused asset that is your daughter? Jamshedji closed his eyes for a long moment. When he opened them, he gave Praveen a serious look. If you go, you must carry out the consultations with the same deference you employ with our male clients. Omar Farid would rise from the grave if he knew I didn't serve his family members with respect. He is not in the grave anymore. He is in heaven, Mustafa objected from the corner. Mr. Farid will be smiling from the clouds once I've helped his family, Praveen said, leaning over to kiss her father's cheek. After lunch, Jamshedji strolled off to the Ripon Club. 
Praveen knew he was headed for one of the Parsi social club's long-armed teak lounge chairs, in which certain barristers were infamous for putting up their legs and snoring away. He probably wanted praise from his friends, a glass of port, and then a long nap. Praveen went back upstairs to the cabinet where client files were stored. As the door swung open, she breathed in the cloying scent of camphor and surveyed stacks of cloth, leather, and cardboard folios. After a few minutes, she located a slim folder of newspaper clippings. Although Omar Farid had died just the past year at the age of 45, the coverage of him spanned only the last five years of his life. There was an article from 1915 about Farid Fabrics creating a new section of mills to weave cotton drill cloth for Indian Army uniforms. Another report, dated 1917, discussed Mr. Farid's charitable donations to returning military casualties. Finally, she reviewed his December 1920 obituary, which included mention of the mills and his charity. The last line read, Mr. Farid is survived by his family, including one son. The obituary didn't mention his wives and daughters. Had they been left out of the obituary because they were considered unimportant? Or because the Times editor thought the details of a philanthropic Indian businessman's polygyny would cast a negative aspect? Praveen scrutinized the small photograph accompanying the article about the mill owner's charitable donations. Omar Farid looked serious and respectable. A close-fitting cap drew attention to his narrow face, with hard-looking eyes and a prominent hooked nose. He wore a high-necked kurta and a dark sherwani coat. His head was covered with a neat crocheted cap, similar to the one that Mustafa wore. His final marriage had occurred just five months before his death. How shocking this must have been for the existing wives, especially if the woman was a musician who'd once worked on Falkland Road, where sex was as widely available as opium. Before he'd departed for the Ripon Club, Perveen had asked her father if he thought the last marriage was a sham. It is the easiest thing to believe, Jamshedji had told her. But a dying man does not feel obligated to observe social norms. He needs no one's permission to take what he needs. From her own experience, Perveen understood. Chapter 3 The Spirit of Ecstasy Bombay, February 1921 Around three o'clock, Mustafa burst into the upstairs office. The SS London has arrived. I saw through the spectacles from our roof over to Ballad Beer. Splendid, Praveen clapped. Alice was just the remedy she needed for her dark mood. A gust of air blew through the window, ruffling the Faree documents. As Praveen collected them, she thought about the cold, damp winds that had continuously buffeted her and Alice as they trudged from St. Hilda's College to their various lectures. How they had talked and laughed and shared secrets. This could be her life again, if she chose to open herself to Alice. Their relationship had started with Perveen serving as Alice's confessor, the Englishwoman's revelation that she'd been expelled at sixteen from Cheltenham Ladies' College for having a girl in her bed had confounded Perveen. It was natural for female relatives and friends to sleep close together. But after Alice explained the longing she still felt for a long-ago classmate, Perveen understood how multifaceted relationships could be. At St. Hilda's, Alice buried herself in her mathematical studies to push away the loss of her true love. Outside of Praveen, nobody knew her truth. Just as Alice was the only one who eventually heard the story of Praveen's own past. 
Now she wondered how much Alice had said about their college friendship to her parents. The Hobson Joneses might be suspicious about any of Alice's female friends, given her past troubles. Praveen decided to be on her best behavior. Ballard Pier was a twenty-minute walk away, but she didn't want to arrive sweaty or with squashed sweets. It was easier to get a lift in Ramchandra's spotlessly maintained rickshaw with its protective sunbonnet. Ramchandra cycled easily through the streets and out to Ballard Pier, where she could see the impressive bulk of a white Pacific and Oriental steamship rising up behind the high stone walls. Stepping down from the rickshaw, she paid Ramchandra, who immediately headed toward a beckoning sailor. She unpacked a sign she'd made on the back of an empty folder that said, Miss Alice Hobson Jones. Holding up a sign for a newcomer put her in the company of hundreds of male chauffeurs who'd come to meet the ship. But what else could she do? As she craned her neck looking for Alice, an Englishman's voice cut into her ear. Excuse me, are you Miss Pavine Mystery? Yes, I am. She turned expectantly toward the red-haired gentleman. I'm Mr. Martin, secretary to Sir David Hobson Jones. He and the others are waiting. Perveen caught a hint of reprimand in the last statement. Mr. Martin, do you mean that everyone is still waiting for Alice to be ferried in? Miss Hobson Jones disembarked twenty minutes ago. Her trunks are loaded, and she's already in the car, so come along smartly. Who did he think he was? A class prefect? Perveen followed the pompous aide through the crowd and to the curb, where he stopped before a long, sparkling silver vehicle. Perveen gasped outright. Is that a silver ghost? She knew for certain it was a Rolls. The shining car's bonnet was topped with an elegantly sculpted silver ornament. A young woman leaning forward, as if ready to dive into life, her arms outstretched like wings. Yes, indeed, Martin said. It was a gift to the governor from the king of a nearby princely state. What a present! Privately, she wondered what kind of favor the monarch expected in exchange. Or was the gift merely a show of wealth? Perveen, you're really here. I hoped you would come. Alice squeezed out of the car's back seat. Within moments, Perveen and her tissue silk sari were crushed against Alice's warm, peppermint-smelling mass. Wrapping her arms around Alice's comfortable bulk, Perveen said, Sorry to have made you wait. I must apologize to your family for having delayed you. Stuff and nonsense. I've been off the ship just long enough for Mummy to get her talons into me. You won't believe. What won't I believe? A very blonde woman who looked barely older than Alice was regarding them from the open-topped touring car. She was sweetly pretty in a lilac-colored frock and a matching cloche trimmed with white silk roses. Praveen looked for a trace of any part of this glamorous creature in Alice, but couldn't find anything past their shared hair color. Everything, Alice answered. From Alice's sarcastic lilt, Praveen realized the mother-daughter relationship wasn't an easy one. And what about Alice's father? Praveen appraised the tall, middle-aged gentleman wearing a beige linen lounge suit and sola topi. Her friend had inherited his height. As if they were schoolgirls, Alice took her by the hand. Mummy and Dad, this is my dearest friend of all time, Praveen Mystery. And Praveen, may I introduce my mother, Lady Gwendolyn Hobson Jones, and my father, Sir David Hobson Jones? We've heard all about your scrapes at Oxford with Alice, Sir David said. He had a deeply textured tan that was typical of British who'd stayed a long time in India. When he smiled, his teeth were very white against his skin. So you are Perveen. 
Gwendolyn Hobson Jones pronounced it slowly, as if it were the name of an exotic place. In your language, what does that name mean? It means star in three languages, Persian, Arabic, and Urdu. My grandfather chose my name. As Perveen finished, she wondered if she had said too much. Alice says you were the only girl studying law in your class at St. Hilda's, which certainly makes you another kind of star. Sir David delivered his attractive grin again. Not at all. Others came before me, Perveen said. She was trying to get a read on whether he was being sincerely warm or patronizing. Perveen, have you any time to join us for a short ride to the house? He asked. We're having a small tea to celebrate Alice's arrival. Sir David's invitation seemed to place him in the sincere camp. But as Perveen surveyed the car, she couldn't figure out where she'd fit. The scowling Mr. Martin would likely sit next to the driver, and she didn't see much room in the back where Alice was rejoining her parents. That is very kind, Perveen said. If it's really not an imposition. You must come, Alice said. All right, then. If you tell me your address, I'll hire a taxi to follow, Perveen said, knowing that a climb up Malabar Hill would be too difficult for a rickshaw. Not a chance, said Sir David. You shall come along with us. But Mr. Martin's with us, Lady Hobson Jones objected. Mr. Martin moved closer to Sir David, putting his back to Perveen. I wished to explain to your daughter about the social life of young people. Another time, Sir David said crisply. You've got paperwork to deliver for me at the Secretariat. Miss Mystery shall ride with us. Yes, Sir David, he said. Shall I call on Miss Hobson Jones later this afternoon? No, I'll see you tomorrow in the office. As the young man walked away despondently... Sir David gave Perveen and Alice each a wry look. These young ICS men could use etiquette training. I know just the school in Switzerland, Alice joked. I hope you shan't mind taking the seat next to the driver. With the three of us in the back, it's a bit cramped. Lady Hobson Jones was smiling rather nervously, as if she didn't want to give the impression she felt uncomfortable sitting close to Perveen. It's no problem, Perveen said with a smile. I shall enjoy being close to the little silver lady. The official name of the emblem is the Spirit of Ecstasy, Sir David said. She's a splendid piece of design, just like the car itself. My father's car is right behind us. The crossley piled up with my trunks. That's why we've got Georgie's rolls. The governor's driver, a sick in a khaki uniform, kept a stone face as if trying to ignore the indignity of both Alice's words and Perveen's proximity. But Perveen was determined to make the most of the special journey, so she waved at the crowd as they departed. It was like being an actress. Praveen was a single Indian woman sitting up front in the governor's car, an impossibility that would be discussed around many of Bombay's cooking fires, verandas, and kitchen floors that evening. Where are we exactly? Alice asked as the harbor receded. Kennedy Seaface. But this stretch of curving road along the water is informally called the Queen's Necklace, because of the way it looks when the street lights shine at night, Perveen said, savoring her chance to play the Bombay expert. Along the Chaupati beachside, you'll see every sort of person coming out to eat the breeze, as one says in Hindi. On the right, many mansion blocks and hotels are going up. My brother's just breaking ground on an apartment block to the right of that white building. For whom does your brother work? Sir David asked. Perveen turned her head to speak directly to Alice's father in the back seat. 
Mystery construction. My brother recently became executive officer. Sir David was still for a moment, and then laughed. Good God! I didn't realize you were one of those mysteries. Your family's built modern Bombay. In fact, I've got a proposal from Lord Tata on my desk regarding development of Back Bay, with Mystery as the proposed contractor. What a coincidence! Perveen felt awkward. She'd only wanted Alice's parents to know her brother wasn't a lowly underling working for the British. But now they probably believed she was an Indian currying favor, to use the dreadful cliché. Praveen returned her gaze to Kennedy's sea face. On the beach side, vendors were serving food and tea at Dabas, set up on the sand. A young Parsi man with curly black hair was standing at one of these outdoor snack shops, talking to the small Hindu cook. The Parsi had a familiar lanky frame and a hooked nose. The Parsi wore an English suit and was leaning slightly on a cane. Parveen put her hand to her mouth. It was Cyrus Sodawala. Or if it wasn't, it looked exactly like the man she'd been trying to forget for the last four years. Frantically, she reminded herself how many men in Bombay might have fair skin and curly black hair. Thousands of Armenians, Anglo-Indians, and Jews. And Cyrus didn't use a cane. The silver ghost was too fast. It sailed past the Daba. Although Praveen craned her head, in seconds, the man had shrunk into a tiny black speck. Praveen let out the breath she'd been holding. He was gone. And it was most fortunate that he hadn't seen the car. What did we miss, Praveen? Alice asked. You look as if you've just seen a demon. Nineteen sixteen. Chapter four. The last lesson. Bombay, August nineteen sixteen. Running late and praying not to be noticed, Praveen hurried into the government law school. A cart had blocked the entrance to Brute Street, where her father needed to be dropped. The delay had caused Praveen to reach Elphinstone College just after nine and she could only pray the professor hadn't yet taken attendance. Even though the surname Mystery fell in the middle of the alphabet, the lecturer had assigned Perveen a seat in the back row, ostensibly because she was a special student and not enrolled for a law degree. Today, she didn't mind the placement because it made her arrival less noticeable. But after the first few seconds in her seat, she felt something cold and terrible seeping through her sari, not again. The first time, someone had filled the groove in her wooden chair with water. On another occasion, her seat had been filled with black coffee. Thankfully, she'd noticed and not sat down. This time, she'd sat down without looking first. She would not know what the fluid was until class was over, and she'd reached the sanctuary of the college's ladies' lounge. This particular dampness was sticky. An ominous sign, as bad as the smirking faces of the students sitting nearby. During the first term, Camellia Mystery had been shocked when Perveen complained to her about the students' pranks. You must tell the professors. It's outrageous behavior. Perveen had explained the impossibility of this. The lecturers don't want me in class, so that won't help. And if the boys learn I told on them, they'll treat me worse. But life was worsening anyway. Two weeks ago, the results of examinations had been published in the Times of India, recognizing Perveen Mystery as the second-highest scoring student among the first-year candidates for bachelors in law. The Mystery family had celebrated, John baking her favorite Laganu custard, and Papa breaking open three bottles of Perrier Jouet. Neighbors had dropped in all afternoon and evening to share desserts and congratulations. But her male classmates weren't pleased. 
The next time she handed an essay up the row of students to be collected by the proctor, the lecturer never received it and gave her a zero. Another afternoon, a gentleman purporting to be from the school administration left a telephone message at her home about a surprise cancellation of the next day's law classes. Praveen was suspicious and went to check the classroom, reaching her seat just as tests were being handed out. Today's revenge was a sweet one, judging from the line of ants traveling up the chair. Barely able to absorb Professor Adhikar's words, Praveen stared straight ahead. In her mind, the words that he was writing on the board, something about one's right to legal process, were being replaced by the hateful words a boy had hissed in her ear the first week. You've no right to be here. You'll ruin everything for our batch. He'd called her a shrewish spoil sport, as if she were the one making life hell and not the wretched lot of them. Tamarin Chutney, Gulnaz said, wrinkling her nose at the silk sari she held six inches from her nose. Those pigs must have taken it from their hostel dining room. Are you sure it's tamarind? Perveen was standing in her blouse and petticoat in the college's ladies' lounge. This was the place where female students were supposed to retire between classes. At the moment, Gulnaz Banker and Hema Patel had her sorry between them and were valiantly attacking the stains with soap and water taken from the adjacent lavatory. Hema looked sympathetically at her. We keep saying... Why not read literature like we're doing? We've got four girls together in one class. The men would never dare act against one without fearing all of us would retaliate. I can't change my course of study. My father expects me to become the first female solicitor in Bombay. Gulnaz, who was a year ahead in school, but had a rosebud prettiness and tiny size that made her seem younger, spoke up softly. Pavine, you're the impetuous type. Why not thrash it out with them? You must dream of banging them all over their stupid heads the way you did to Esther Vacha in school. I was eight years old and she had thrown sand on my lunch. Pavine was annoyed that Gulnaz remembered this. I'm more mature now. I keep my eyes on my notebook as much as I can although that sometimes makes the professor think I'm not listening to him. Then the others laugh and... Oh, it's awful! Perveen felt an unbidden tear slide out. Poor girl! Gulnaz sounded alarmed. You mustn't cry. Your sari's almost as good as new. We'll just hang it near the window to dry. Perveen reached out for her sari. My class on Hindu law starts in twenty minutes. I can't stay waiting for it to dry. Mangoes will not ripen if you hurry them, Hema said. Sit down and take some deep breaths. Their caring was only making her feel panicked. If I don't go, I'll miss the test. Take it later, Gulnaz advised. Better not to shame yourself in public. Perveen took the sari out of their hands. And what reason will I give the professor for my absence? A spot on my clothes? He'll think I'm a typical silly girl. But the spot is wet. People might think... Gulnaz's voice dropped off. She was also a Parsi, brought up with strict standards of hygiene. Silk will dry faster in the sun outside than inside this humid hellhole. And I've got an idea about how to wear it. Perveen explained that if she draped her sari in the Hindu manner, with its pallu hanging over the back, the spot would be obscured. Aradna, a Hindu girl studying at one of the lounge tables, hurried over to help. Flanked by Gulnaz and Hema, Perveen went out into Elphinstone's courtyard. Look, Gulnaz pointed. Esther Vacha is sitting with a man. Perveen followed her friend's outraged stare to a wrought iron bench where her primary school nemesis was sitting and laughing. 
The young man with her was dressed like a Parsi and had thick black curls that tumbled perfectly over his forehead. Esther's companion had an attractive profile with a kind of hooked nose that made Perveen think of portraits of ancient Persian royalty. He's not a student here. Who could he be? Hema asked excitedly. Perveen had seen plenty of male students at the university, but none as handsome as this one. I've never seen him before, but he certainly looks like the dandy. I don't care. I die for my children to have curls like that, Gunnar said. You are far too marriage-minded, Perveen scolded as Hema grabbed each of them by one hand and proceeded toward the bench. Hello, Esther, Hema said. Perveen was asking, who is your special friend? Esther smiled smugly. Isn't he lovely? He's my cousin visiting from Calcutta, Mr. Cyrus Sodawala. Charmed, the young man said, bowing slightly. He glanced over the three of them and then settled his eyes on Perveen. Don't introductions go both ways? Miss Perveen Mystery is the first woman student at the government law school. Actually, she's a third cousin, Esther said with an artificial smile. Miss Gunnar's banker and Miss Hema Patel are both reading literature. From your name, I'm guessing you're a fizzy one, Hema joked to the young man, making Perveen wince. Cyrus Sodawala smiled displaying perfect white teeth. When my grandfather came from Persia, his first job was selling bottled drinks. The British census required him to give a surname, and that's what he got. Sodawala, the soda-selling man. Perveen noted that his accent was different. It must have been the influence of Calcutta. That's how my grandfather got his name, Gulnaz cooed. And now I'm saddled with the very boring surname of Banker. Miss Mystery, are you also Barsi? Cyrus asked, looking pointedly at the draping of Perveen Sari. While the others all had their heads covered and a swag of fabric across their torsos that tucked gracefully into their Sari's waistlines, she did not. Perveen was flustered. Yes, I'm just wearing my sari another way. Such a shame you lot are already nineteen years old, Esther teased. Cyrus has come for bride choosing, and his family won't look at a girl unless she's younger than eighteen. Is that because you're also very young, Mr. Sodawala? Perveen's question was sarcastic. Esther's cousin had five o'clock shadow blooming on his cheeks and neck. He gave Perveen a wounded look. I'm twenty-eight next month. Hehe, <laughs> that's old for a bridegroom, Hema cut in. I shan't accept anyone older than twenty-three. The only reason I've held off is our family business, but it's paid off. Soon the Sodawalas of Calcutta... We'll be bottling all the whiskey in Bengal and Orissa. Actually, I've got a sample. He patted a small lump in his jacket pocket. Gulnaz gasped. How naughty to be going about our college with a flask! Perveen wanted to laugh because Cyrus seemed so different from the pompous prigs in the law classes. Still, she didn't want to be part of a fawning flock, so she smiled briefly and said, I've no time for cocktails. Please enjoy your time in Bombay, and best of luck finding a wife. To walk off just like that is rather rude, Hema snapped once the three were on their way. I've got a test in Hindu law, Perveen said. But you're walking away from the law classrooms, Gunnars pointed out. Aren't they on the far side? Damnation! Sorry, I must dash! 
in her haste to get away from Cyrus and Esther, Praveen had passed the place she needed to go. Stepping inside the building, she paused in the dimness and looked up the stairwell. Not a student was in sight, which meant she'd arrived late for a second time in the same day. Hurrying upstairs, she felt the edge of her sari slip off her shoulder and into the crook of her arm. As she draped the palu back in place, she realized the folds around her hips were loose. Just outside the classroom door, Praveen set down her heavy satchel to adjust her sari's unfamiliar folds. What she really needed was to strip the whole thing off and start fresh, but she was too far from the ladies' lounge. As she concentrated on pinching new pleats at her waist, she heard Mr. Joshi saying something about the test. Praveen gave up on her costume and opened the door, the creak of it causing a number of students to turn. All of them were from her earlier class. Raised eyebrows, smirks, snickers, and worst of all, the lecturer's reprimand. How good of you to join us, Miss Mystery. Mr. Joshi's voice dripped sarcasm. Praveen mumbled an apology and kept her gaze low as she hurried to her place. This was a different room than before, and her seat was clean. A mimeographed paper with six questions rested on the desk. The young men around her were filling their fountain pens and starting in on the exam as Mr. Joshi came down the aisle to address her. Coming in so late... I'm not sure you're entitled to take this test. Entitled was a word that grated on her. Because she was Jamshade G. Mystery's daughter, she was supposedly entitled to read law, even though the law school wasn't yet giving women degrees. Everyone's working and you are not. Did you neglect to bring a pen? Without waiting for her answer, Mr. Joshi said, I don't suppose anyone's got a spare pen? There's no need, sir. Praveen's pen and some pencils were nestled in an embroidered silk pouch she carried inside her satchel. Reaching down, she hefted the heavy bag up onto the surface of her desk. Retrieving the pouch, she was surprised to find the pen missing. But the outside of her satchel showed a spreading black patch. Obviously, her pen had fallen out and was leaking. If she removed it, she'd just make a mess, and Mr. Joshi didn't allow exams to be written in pencil. As Mr. Joshi went back to the front of the room, Praveen sat in misery, staring at the paper she could not mark. Forty minutes later, the paper was no longer blank. It was wet with a sprinkle of tears that had fallen fast and hard. As the students to her left began passing their completed tests toward the aisle, she didn't bother putting it in the stack. She stayed in place, ignoring the irritated sounds of the men who had to brush past her to leave the classroom. Finally, she was all alone in the room. That was what she had been waiting for, because she didn't want anyone watching her collect her things. What are you doing? Mr. Joshi called out suddenly, startling her. Sorry? She looked up, taken aback to see the lecturer hadn't departed. You just put an examination in your bag. Yes, I saw you do it. Perveen pulled out the damp, slightly crumpled paper. Here it is. I had some trouble with my pen, so I couldn't write anything. But why did you put it in your bag? She answered honestly. I was embarrassed to turn it in. The others would see. His eyes narrowed. Stealing an examination is a violation of the honor code. I shall have to report it. Whispering from behind her informed her that the hall had not completely emptied, Sorry, but I was not intending to do anything with the test. As I said... If you were prepared to take an examination, you could have had a pen. You refused one. Mr. Joshi's voice rose. What game are you playing today? Or have you been playing games all along? Steadying herself, she said, It's not a game, sir. 
just a mistake. The lecturer drew himself up. His face was flushed. I said to the dean that allowing a female in the law school would be a mistake. I will repeat this truth when I write the notice of your honor code violation. Perveen's whole body felt tight. An honor code violation? I did nothing. You intentionally stole a test that I'm sure you would have filled out at home, perhaps with your father's help. Now she was furious. I won't answer to any charges that are unjustified. He cocked his head to one side and studied her with a cold smile. It seems you believe your status is exalted enough to hold you above university law. Why is that, Miss Mystery? Rising to her feet, she spoke in a trembling voice. I'm not answering to any such charges, because I will have resigned. After the words had left her lips, she couldn't believe it. What had she done? The proper behavior would have been to continue apologizing. But Mr. Joshi's formidable expression had told her what was coming. He would have enlisted Mr. Adhakar and the other law faculty to ensure she was convicted. Mr. Joshi looked taken aback. After a moment, he said, With resignation, there is also a formal process. But first, there is my outstanding charge. My statement shall be used by the administration to consider whether to convene a hearing. Have you a brain, or is it sawdust? The offensive slur flew out before she could stop herself. I've quit! Going down the staircase, she felt as if she were afloat. What was the expression? Yes, a dying man clutches at sea foam. Like that man, she was moving in a soft, cool cloud that carried her away from the outrage gesticulating Mr. Joshi. Although the sea foam was enough to bring her safety, she was still sure to drown. Emerging from the building, Praveen headed for a dustbin. Discreetly pulling her handkerchief out of the edge of her blouse, she covered her hand with it and fished out of her satchel the leaking Mother of Pearl Parker pen her mother had given Perveen to celebrate her entrance into law school. It was useless. But then she hesitated. To throw it out would be to discard her mother's generosity and hopes. She wrapped it doubly tight in the handkerchief and returned it to the bag. Miss Mystery, is that you? A pleasant male voice inquired. Startled, she turned around and saw that Esther's cousin was lounging on the same bench as before near the fountain. Hello again. Cyrus Sodawala raised a hand in greeting. Esther abandoned me in favor of Chaucer. Holding her satchel protectively against her drooping sari, Praveen nodded at him. Came Cho. Switching to Gujarati, he said, Sit down. You've the face of one who's drunk cheap oil. Praveen realized that she did feel faint. She lowered herself onto the bench, being careful to leave several feet of space between them. I don't need your whiskey, she said in a warning tone. Cyrus laughed shortly. Esther already made it clear that was a poor joke. I'm sorry. Praveen's faintness was slowly subsiding. You're forgiven. You still look like death, Cyrus said, his expression serious. I'll be fine after a cup of tea. You also need something to eat. Brightening, he added, Esther's parents showed me a very good bakery a few streets from here. It's called Gyazdani's. Perveen was impressed that this visitor to Bombay had heard of her favorite bakery cafe in the city. But she also knew a decent young woman should not walk with a man unchaperoned. There's no reason for me to leave campus, Mr. Sodawala. I can have a cup of tea in the ladies' lounge. 
but I can't go inside there. And the truth is, I've missed a meal. The little boy way his mouth turned down was endearing, and she'd rather leave the campus quickly after what had just happened. Didn't the fact that her family knew the owner of Yazdani's make going there a bit like having a chaperone? Slowly, she said, That bakery is close to my family's office. I could stop with you on my way there. Perveen and Cyrus caught the sweet smell from half a block away. Cyrus sighed. Cardamom buns are my favorite. What kind of cardamom buns? Perveen asked. Methi papri. Is there another type? He said teasingly. Perveen was amused at how little he knew. It might be mawa cakes we're smelling, or dahitan, which have cardamom and saffron. Let's find out. The scent was making Perveen feel stronger. A jolt of sugar and spice would strengthen her for everything yet to come. Inside the black-and-white tiled cafe, Cyrus looked around with pleasure and inhaled deeply. Despite the odd hour, more than half of the tables were filled with a mix of Hindus, Parsis, and Muslims wearing traditional and European dress. Praveen spied only one of her father's colleagues who might recognize her, but he appeared consumed with a business conversation. Pleased by Cyrus's enthusiasm, she said, I recommend the chicken berry pulao or kid ghost for a late lunch. Feroz Yazdani had been following their exchange from his perch by the cash box. Coming over to the table, he said, I will bring those dishes and a bit more. We will discuss pudding and cakes later. Bavin John, which cousin is this? The mysteries were an old Bombay family, so the cafe owner's assumption was natural. But one of the tenets of her upbringing was honesty. She hesitated, trying to think of what to say. I'm the hungry one from Calcutta, Cyrus said with a big grin before Perveen could come up with a rejoinder. Hungry is what we like, although you will not remain that way for long. Feroz said, beaming. After Feroz went off, and the two of them had gone to the sink in the corner to wash their hands, Praveen addressed Cyrus in a whisper. Why did you lie? He winked. Esther is your third cousin, isn't she? That gives us some relationship. My family and Esther's aren't so closely related. We don't gather for holidays and weddings. She wasn't going to explain their long-time rivalry. I had to say it. The Bawa would have tossed me out if he thought I was a masher. Cyrus leaned across the table covered with red-checked oilcloth. So, what happened at the university that set your head on fire? Reflexively, Praveen's hand went to her temple. Her long, wavy hair was, in fact, slightly disassembled from the braided coronet that her ayah, Jaya, had made hours earlier. Why should I tell a stranger anything of my life? It's because I'm strange that you can tell me. I don't care about the same things that Bombay people do. Praveen should have stayed silent, but she was aware that ever since they'd met... Cyrus had been watching her and listening to her. She sensed that he would be interested, and maybe even sympathetic. In a low voice, she said, Swear that you won't tell anyone, not your cousin, not anyone. He put his hands together in a prayerful position. The familiarity of it made her smile and helped get the next words out of her mouth. I quit the law school half an hour ago. Though I'm a special student, so I'm not sure if it really counts. His thick eyebrows rose, and he looked almost admiring. Congratulations. 
What the hell are you saying? I don't know how I'll tell my parents. You could say you're saving them a pretty penny. Perveen shut her eyes, remembering the past. They were so proud when I was admitted to the law school. The only institution that would have pleased them more would have been a college in England. But I didn't want to go so far. Cyrus nodded sagely. I wouldn't go to Britain for all the whiskey in London. And colleges and universities are such a waste. Everything I needed to learn for business, I learned on the street side of Presidency College's fence. Perveen could not imagine one of the young men in her classes ever saying such a thing. She recalled her classmates' self-importance, their comparisons of private high schools and class standings. They would not hang about with flasks of whiskey. They would not talk sincerely with a woman. Feroz Yazdani was approaching with the tea and their dishes. After he'd spooned out food for the two of them, Cyrus tucked into it with enthusiasm. After half his plate was cleared, he paused. Such light rice, sweet and spicy all at once, and the mutton is soft and spiced with something I can't recognize. I suppose it's Bombay masala. This is the best food outside of home, Perveen said. She wasn't hungry, but she managed to get some rice and meat into her mouth. Why did you decide to go for law? Was it even your choice? Cyrus asked. For years, Praveen had hung at her father's side at supper, listening to his courtroom dramas. She'd been thrilled by all of it. Actually, my father encouraged me. Cyrus finished a mouthful and spoke. He's a lawyer, then? Yes. In fact, he's at the high court today. My father's plan was for me to study at the government law school, because the law college is bound to grant degrees to women eventually. I'd have my coursework done ahead of time once the bar opens to us. Cyrus leaned forward, resting his elbows on the table. What do you make of your law classes? Are they quite interesting? At this point... It's not supposed to be interesting, Perveen said dryly. But that's not why I'm dropping out. My classmates were the hardest part. Cyrus rolled his eyes. Tell me. Perveen told him about the sticky business in the chair that morning, the lost essay from a previous month, the many attempts to keep her from handing in work and taking tests. As she told her stories... His handsome face moved from compassion to anger. Parsi boys behaved like this to you? He said at the end. Parsis and Hindus and Christians. Not every boy in the room is an active player, but at least two-thirds are following with amusement. He shook his head. And what has your father done? I haven't told Papa because I fear his reaction... He's a big man in the legal community. He might try to fix things, and then it would be worse. But the fellows who are bothering you are absolute bastards. Cyrus wiped a napkin across his mouth and tossed it beside his plate. And they would be the ones you'd have to work with in the courts later on. Yes, most of them will practice here. Perveen hadn't thought about this detail. They won't speak to you, although they might very well mock you when speaking to others. His voice was heavy with anger. Perveen realized she'd confessed too much, not because he'd tell anyone, but because he was making her think hard thoughts. I'm not sure I should have told you. I've ruined our tea. Perveen, I... Cyrus stopped, and his fair skin reddened. Sorry, I should call you Miss Mystery. Not if we're cousins, she said archly. Cyrus cocked a fist at her and laughed. We're both of us in the fight for our lives, aren't we? What's your fight? Now she was curious. Ensuring the rest of my life isn't dreadful. 
At her uncomprehending look, he added, I'm talking about the heartless marriage arrangements driven by parents. So you don't wish to marry? As Praveen said the words, she hoped her emotions wouldn't betray her. She'd been feeling regretful that she'd have only this one meeting with Cyrus, who would very likely be engaged within days. I want to be with a woman who suits my taste, not theirs. He looked intently at her. Can you believe there are just sixteen acceptable Bombay girls that my family was able to arrange meetings with? I've got to agree to one of them and hope she'll bear two sons or more and keep everyone happy for the next half century. Perveen giggled. What is it? He sounded irritated. I thought there would be a thousand Parsi girls on your interview list. There are so many of us here. Not of the proper age, complexion, family. And then we have to think of the proper horoscope he added with a grimace. Perveen looked across the table at the young man who felt himself in a predicament, but had achieved the work of his dreams and surely would be matched with a satisfactory woman. Don't feel sorry for yourself. My parents will arrange my marriage in a few years. It's part of life. Feroz Yazdani appeared to coax them to sample the cafe's baked goods, Cyrus tried a sticky, golden dahitan. Perveen asked for the simpler baked mawa cake. Feroz added a complimentary date and almond pastry. Between the sweetness of sugar and the heat of tea, Perveen was beginning to feel renewed. After Cyrus had forked up the last crumb, he pulled out a gold pocket watch. Damnation! I was supposed to be at the Dodge Mahal Palace twenty minutes ago. I'll call for the bill. But Feroz wouldn't give it to him. When Cyrus protested, Feroz said warmly, The mysteries always pay their bill monthly. Surely they will want to cover the cost of a relative's meal. Perveen glanced at Feroz, who looked almost stern. She realized his putting the meal on her family's tab was a way that he could remain her father's ally. She might even have to explain if her father asked who had eaten so much with her that the bill was one rupee three annas. Sighing, she said, It's true. We never use money here. Let's go outside and I'll introduce you to Ramchandra. Grandfather likes him so much he gifted him a cycle rickshaw from Hong Kong. Ramchandra is probably the only cycle rickshaw driver in all of Bombay. Cycle rickshaws are everywhere in Calcutta, Cyrus said, walking around the restaurant. Then he said firmly, I must see you to home. You don't, Perveen gestured toward Mystery House. I'm just going across there. For a long moment, Cyrus gazed at the vast Gothic stone mansion. That big place? My grandfather built it in 1875. He's still there, staying in some rooms on the first floor, now that his legs are weak. Not at home with you? Cyrus sounded confused. We'd like him to stay with us, but he won't leave. He vowed he will enjoy the house he built until the angels call him to their home. But it looks like a fortress. Perveen felt the familiar mix of pride and embarrassment over her family's ancestral home. I suppose so. But it was really built as a kind of exhibition piece. What do you mean? My grandfather wished to show all of Bombay the artistry and quality he could offer. He hired James Fuller to draw the plans. He's the English architect who built the High Court, Perveen added. All the furniture is imported from Hong Kong or crafted by graduates of Sir Gigi Boy's School of Art. It's a bit much to live in, but it's nice to use as a law office. My father's practice is on the first floor. 
At last, a look of understanding passed over his face. Your father and grandfather are together every day. That's very good. I think so. And while my grandfather might seem like a show-off, he's still got a laborer's head. I've seen him glance at a perfect-looking pillar and know without even touching it if the wood inside is rotten. He sounds like an intelligent man, Cyrus said approvingly. Will you show me more of Bombay tomorrow? Perveen looked at him incredulously. How can you sightsee when you've got all the bridal meetings stacked up? My mother is a late sleeper, so my mornings are free. You'll ruin your chances, and I ruin my reputation. But inside, she couldn't help feeling regretful that the only young man who'd ever asked her opinion of anything was passing so swiftly through her world. Perhaps Esther or one of your friends could come with us? He suggested casually. But it's a Wednesday. We... I mean, they... Must attend classes. Then suggest what I should do. I'd like to get a full view of the Arabian Sea. We have a big port in Calcutta, but it's crowded with ships and buildings. We've no swimming beaches. Perveen thought of Land's End. It offered breathtaking views of the sea. However, it was north of the city and probably too far for him to find on his own. Chaupati Beach is easy enough. Any rickshawala will know the way. All right, I'll go. But what will you do starting tomorrow, now that you're not studying? Cyrus's warm, hazel eyes were fixed on her. Perveen considered the question. She couldn't stay home with a feigned illness for more than a day or two. Yet she didn't feel ready to say she'd quit. Her father would go straight to the dean and send her back to classes. No. For the time being, it was wise to behave as if she were still studying and use the time to organize a plan. But we must meet again, Cyrus said. Perveen hesitated. I'm in enough trouble. But if you want to say hello, I'll be inside the Sassoon Library which is just next to Elephantstone. I shall ride into town every morning with my father, just like always. His smile was glorious. I shall bring my own book, and I promise not to ruin your reputation. Watching Cyrus Sodawala leave the cafe and head toward the rickshaw stand, Perveen felt slightly dazed. She'd started out the morning hating all young men, then she'd become so angry with her law professor that she'd quit school. Finally, she'd gone to eat rice with a man she didn't know. But Cyrus Sodawala's perspective had lifted her mood and helped her understand what was needed to be true to herself. Cyrus was really something. She had never met anyone who was both handsome and frank-talking. After their heartfelt conversation... She doubted any arranged marriage candidates could hold a candle to him. Perveen reminded herself of Esther's words. Cyrus Sodawala was in Bombay to look exclusively for Parsi women under the age of eighteen. He couldn't have eyes for anyone who wasn't on his parents' list. Chapter 5 Land's End Bombay, August 1916 Sitting in the ladies' car on the western line, Perveen ruminated on the various rules she was breaking. She was riding a train alone, which she had never done before. She'd only ever ridden one in the company of chaperoning relatives or teachers. But this was hardly anything compared to her misdeeds of the past week. She'd met Cyrus Sodawala in the Sassoon Library Garden three times. 
Then he had managed to have Esther Vacha invite her to join a chaperoned group of young people for a cinema matinee. Somehow Cyrus had wound up seated next to her at the show. The whole time she felt energy radiating out from his arm lying on the rest. He didn't touch her, but she could not stop thinking about what that might feel like. Today's was the boldest rebellion. Cyrus had repeated his desire to go to the beach before his family left Bombay. She hadn't asked him whether anyone else would come. She sensed that he wished to be alone with her, to tell her the outcome of his marital interviews. Hearing about such dismal news at a place called Land's End seemed fitting. Stepping out of the darkness of Bandra Station, Praveen saw Cyrus waiting. He was holding his feta in one hand and had unbuttoned the neck of his jacket, giving him a comfortable look. He seemed a part of Bombay now. The crowds moved around him, not giving a second glance to the confident young businessman. Finally, he said happily as he greeted her. I've been worrying for the last half hour about why it would take so long for you to travel one stop from Dadar to here. Sorry, I left from Churchgate Station, not Dadar. She was still going to Elphinstone every morning, keeping her parents clueless. I've been here since 9.30, but that's given me time to find a suitable tonga. The driver said the best views are at the Bandra bandstand. What do you think? Let's go. Parveen made small talk about Bandra's history in the tonga, feeling nervous the driver might deduce that they weren't married, neither scold them nor refuse to drive them any farther. She was relieved that Cyrus did not say anything personal. Instead, he brought up the news of the Sotawala's new contract to send bottled raspberry sodas to a restaurant in Bombay. It's very surprising, because there are plenty of soda factories in Bombay, he said, but we've got the better price. Even with the cost of transportation added? They'll have that cost split up in many small parts when they are billed, he said with a wink. In any case, the contract's signed. Might you stay in Bombay to expand the business? Not a chance. I've got to take over the operation in Calcutta when my father retires, which will very likely be in the next ten years. Won't you tell me about your family? It was a question she loved to ask. She knew all about the Yazdani's dreams for young Lily, Gulnaz's mother's health problems, and Hema's competitive relationship with a perfect older sister. There's Niveed, my elder brother. He's well married and settled in Bihar, with a son and a daughter already. How nice! But your mother must miss her grandchildren. She does miss them, he said, smiling at the children playing alongside the road. Niveid had to leave when we bought a bottling plant in Bihar. My father sent him there to set up the business. He was the only one my father trusted to go. I was too young and about to start at Presidency College. Then you are the only two children? Praveen was intrigued by the similarities between her life and Cyrus's. Cyrus looked straight ahead as he spoke. I had a younger sister, Azara, but she died at fourteen. It was the worst thing that ever happened to our family. It was another reason I didn't marry at the typical age. What happened to her? At her question, Cyrus stiffened, making her realize she was intruding on too much pain. Cholera, he muttered. It was during monsoon. It's common to fall sick when streets flood and filth is floating everywhere. I'm so sorry. I can only imagine what it's like to lose a sibling, and so terribly young. Without realizing it, Perveen had put her hand atop Cyrus's tight fist. He looked at her gratefully, relaxing his fingers so they could weave into hers. Perveen felt lightheaded 
exultant yet terrified of this act committed so daringly in public. The Tonga driver had his back to them, so he wouldn't suspect. But when she glanced at the cart driver on their right, he glowered and curled his lip as if he considered her a harlot. Instead of averting her eyes, as she would have in the law classroom, she glared at the driver until he looked away. We're all right now, but very careful about cleanliness, especially during rainy season, Cyrus said soberly. So many times I've tried to convince my parents to move somewhere less congested, but they would never move from Saklat Place because of the fire temple being close by. Are your parents quite observant? He nodded. After losing Azara, they found great comfort in the old prayers. Azara is such a lovely name. I don't know anyone called that. It's from Persian and means red. Just like the color of those roses along the roadside. Bandra is quite beautiful. He sounded as if he was trying to divert her from the sad topic. The Tonga had been slowly, steadily climbing up Hill Road, passing pastel-painted, tiled-roof bungalows built in the Portuguese fashion. After they passed St. Andrew's Church, the sea spread out before them. What a picture it made! The vast, shimmering stretch of blue edged by sharp black rocks. Seagulls wheeled overhead as if dancing on the winds. Would you ask the driver to stop here? Praveen suggested, prudently releasing his hand from hers. We're very near the bandstand, where the best view is. He laughed. Fair lady, your wish is my command. As Cyrus paid the bill, Praveen strained to hear the music from the bandstand. Happily, she said, It sounds like a military band. Let's see how many players there are. I don't know if we should. They're always looking for men to join up, Cyrus said with a laugh as they walked in step with the music. Have you thought about enlisting? Pavine asked. Cyrus snorted. Even if I were demented enough, my father wouldn't allow it. There's no Parsi regiment. Or perhaps he'd rather not lose his son. I've seen enough of your bandstand, Cyrus said. Let's get our feet wet in the sea. I've been here with my family, but we've never walked down to the water, Praveen said, looking warily at the steep, rocky landscape. Straight from here, it looks too difficult. But I've heard about people walking down through the watchtower ruins. When they reached the blackened arch in a fragment of broken wall, they found they could get down close to the water by traversing steep, uneven land punctuated by rocks. Praveen was wearing sandals, so she had a more precarious journey than Cyrus, who was wearing sturdy laced brogues. At the edges of the water, both of them took off their shoes and held them, letting the cool seawater creep up past their ankles. A light current swirled, and she realized that if she kept going deeper, the water could probably pull her into its luscious, cool embrace. What are you thinking? Cyrus asked. A dying man clutches at sea foam, she said. Do you know that saying? Shaking his head, he said, I don't. It means a desperate man clutches at any straw. I never learned to swim, given the hazardous nature of Calcutta's Hooghly River. He turned to smile at her. Make me stop talking about what we can't do. We must enjoy this day. Looking into Cyrus's eyes, Praveen felt as if she were sinking into something deeper than water. His words were true. Although he would be gone in three days' time, she would always have the memory of their secret excursion. 
They walked about a mile along the sea's edge, investigating the tiny crabs crawling around the rocks and naming the storks, egrets, and pigeons. All the birds hunting for a meal reminded Perveen it was after lunchtime, and she thought of saying something to Cyrus about going back up to buy a bel puri snack before returning to Bandra Station. She wasn't especially hungry, but she was nervous being so far from the city, and she didn't want to cause complications for Cyrus, who surely would need to be back in South Bombay by mid-afternoon, as he usually did. It was 2.30, but Cyrus didn't seem ready to leave. Perveen thought this might be an indication that his parents had settled on a bride. The strong breeze ruffled Cyrus's curly black hair. Privately, she admired this, as well as his noble profile. Cyrus, the ancient Persian king, had looked like this in the paintings she'd seen. Let's sit down, Cyrus suggested. Look, that's a nice place. The wide, flat rock was behind an outcropping of higher stone that shielded them from view of everyone at the bandstand, as well as the few fishermen with nets on the sand. Sitting down, Perveen felt the warmth of the stone underneath her, all along her thighs in that private place that sometimes pulsed when she thought about Cyrus at night. He gave a long, relaxed sigh. Perveen... Thank you for bringing me. I've always wanted to face the Arabian Sea. This endless blue was what my grandfather saw when he was coming to India. I wanted to see it for myself. I wish I knew my family's migration story as well as you know yours, Perveen said wistfully. Nobody knows exactly when we came, but it might have been five to seven hundred years ago. And then, in the 17th century, the British called on Parsis to leave Gujarat to travel here and build up an old ruined Portuguese fort into a modern walled city. Cyrus shifted closer, so the sides of their bodies were touching. Why did your father shift away from building to law? The feeling was electric. Perveen spoke rapidly, trying to seem unaffected, my father was the youngest of three sons, and the other two had joined Mystery Construction already. He pointed out that a construction company needed legal protection, and if he became a solicitor, he could provide it for them free of charge. Because my grandfather saw this as a way to show status, he sent Papa to Oxford for his studies. Fortunately, he got a top-notch education. Papa thought Rustam might follow his pattern— but he was a chip off the old block and went into mystery construction. Cyrus snorted. So your brother's defection forced you to continue your father's business. I hated law school, she said with a shudder. However, working as a solicitor would be thrilling. I'll admit to that. I suppose so, he said with a shrug. But if women lawyers can't yet appear in court, I don't see the point of your studying law. That's not exactly true. Solicitors don't have to argue in court, and most legal business is routine. Contracts and wills. My father expects me to help him straight after finishing the law course, she added, feeling the familiar guilt weigh on her. Sounding sympathetic, he said, my parents sent me to college to study what was most important to them, commerce. But the teachers at Presidency were fools. Everything I know about business I learned on the outside. And look at how well things are going now. My father's never been prouder. That's grand, Perveen sighed, leaning forward to put her chin in her hands. I wish law worked like business. He looked keenly at her. Our ancestors weren't supposed to leave Persia, but they did. They took a chance on a better future. As he spoke, his arm crept up and gently cradled her back. Perveen whipped her head around, looking to see if the fishermen had noticed or if anyone else was coming down along the rocks. 
They were still alone. I want to ask you something. Cyrus's voice was quiet, so she had to strain toward him to hear. What? she asked breathlessly. If you are able to give up law, I'll give up something too. Her eyes widened. What is it? I want to tell my parents I won't marry the stupid girl they chose for me two days ago. I am so lonely. I will be only lonelier if forced to be with someone I don't love. Perveen put a hand to his lips. Don't say such things. If a marriage is set, it must go forward. And please know that I never meant to divert you from that purpose. It would be wrong. My darling. He kissed her hand. Pulling it away, she said, You mustn't call me by endearments. She did not want memories of him promising her the moon to haunt the rest of her life. Better to cut things short. Don't fight it, Perveen. Just think how your life is opening, as wide as the sea, he said, taking up her hand again. Now that you've left law school, you are free to be with me. She let him hold her hand, but she would not look at him. I'm not... You're going more than a thousand miles away. Stop talking for just one moment. Cyrus's voice rose. I'm telling you clean that I want you to be my bride. He had proposed. She was overwhelmed with happiness that was quickly followed by pain. Turning to look at him, she said, But your marriage, your marriage is already... They chose, but I haven't agreed. Now they are pressing me to explain why. Cyrus gazed deep into her eyes. I haven't said anything about how we've been meeting, but I told them that Esther introduced me to a friend of hers at college, who's better than all the other girls. His words gave her an idea. If he could stay a few weeks longer in Bombay... They could become acquainted under proper chaperonage. Hesitantly, she said, Perhaps my parents would consider a long engagement. But I must earn some kind of degree first. I'm supposed to be an example for the rest of the community. My parents won't wait, and yours won't think I'm good enough. They would rather match you with Bombay old money, a data or a ready money. Cyrus picked up a stone and threw it toward the sea. Perveen watched the stone bounce off another rock. Sadly, she said, I don't know whom they'll suggest, but having met you, I don't know how I can marry another man and be happy. Perveen, do you realize what's happened? We chanced to meet and fall in love. Cyrus spoke breathlessly. Our parents will be surprised that we found each other without their guidance, but we can tell them that God did the arranging. Perveen nodded, thinking they had many similarities. Cyrus was full of energy and had an impetuous nature. He looked at things in a fresh way and took risks. He was the match fated for her. She almost felt that he was a Yazata, an angel sent to bring her happiness. And now it would end. Tell me, am I wrong to have been so bold? Perveen felt tears starting at the corners of her eyes. No, I am glad for these days we've had. I won't ever forget them. Cyrus took Perveen's face in his hands and leaned in until their lips touched. She should have pushed him away, but she felt riveted by expectation. Finally, the thing she dreamed about was happening. She might miss him the rest of her life, but she would have this moment. Cyrus's lips were smooth, warm, and insistent. He kissed her until she understood that her mouth could part, and then she could taste him, his lips, his tongue, and a delicate inward essence that tasted of fennel and alcohol. 
her excitement rising, Praveen kissed him back. She could not get enough. The rock was hot as he pressed her down on it, covering her with his own body. His kisses moved from her mouth to her neck, and she felt something blooming. Was this love? Yes, she decided. True romantic love must be an overpowering desire to meld two essences into one. Cyrus's hands slipped underneath both her blouse and the gossamer white lace sudre. This hidden stretch of her body was prickling with sensations. He touched her breast, and she gasped from the pleasure of it. While reading a novel, she'd once come across the phrase, Wanton Woman. It had sounded awful. She had traveled to Bandra, fearful that Cyrus might take liberties. Now she reveled in them. She was taking her own liberties with him. Was this liberation? Abruptly, Cyrus lifted himself, and she felt desolate. Wrapping her arms around herself, she came up to a sitting position. I'm so sorry, he panted. I shouldn't have done such things to a girl like you before marriage. But I want every bit of you so much. And now we know that we are meant for each other. Our marriage will be blessed with this passion. Perveen was trembling. She wanted him to crush up against her again, to never stop touching her. I've fallen for you, Perveen, Cyrus said, stroking her hair away from her face. Now I know what love is. Perveen's breathing slowed. The excitement she'd felt was transforming into serenity. A person had only one soulmate. Who was she to disregard this truth? Looking at him, she whispered, It's been fast, but I think I fell in love, too. Please accept my proposal. I'll throw myself into the sea if you don't. Praveen stared at the Arabian Sea, Cyrus was daring her to follow her heart, to venture on her own journey, just as their ancestors had, risking all for a golden dream. She turned back to Cyrus and put her hands in his. Yes, I would like to marry you. I don't know that our parents will ever agree, but it's my heartfelt wish. My family will adore you, Cyrus said, "'stroking away the hair that had fallen on her face. "'Kissing her brow, he said, "'My mother has been missing having a daughter so much. "'Once she meets you, she'll not want to let you go.' "'As he pulled her close again for a dizzying kiss, "'the crash of waves that followed sounded like applause.' Nineteen twenty one. Chapter six. Houses of Power. Bombay, February nineteen twenty one. People were clapping. Praveen jerked herself out of her memories. A pair of well dressed Indian guards along the road were bowing and applauding the governor's car as it passed. What sycophants! But then again, she was riding in the car and could hardly cast a stone. Father, I dare say they think you're Georgie, crowed Alice. I suppose that with a solar topee shielding us, we all look the same, Sir David said. Who knows, darling? Lady Hobson Jones laughed lightly. You may very well be the next governor of the presidency. Would you really like that? Alice sounded shocked. There was a long pause. I'll do whatever the government wants, Sir David said, but I hardly expect it. From the measured sound of his words, it seemed that rising to that post was certainly something he wished for. It felt almost treacherous to be in the car with such a man, because Perveen had been to gatherings with Indians seeking self-rule. 
In Oxford and London, she and Alice had attended a few such lectures together. Eventually, the car pulled up at a very tall gate that was overshadowed by a giant vanilla-colored bungalow. Four guards rushed forward, a pair saluting the car, while the other two opened the gate. This seems very secure, Perveen said, thinking of the contrast with the gate at her house that was guarded by a fellow who sometimes fell asleep at his post. The presidency has provided us with more than enough help, Sir David said. We've leased it ever since it was built last year, Lady Hobson Jones told Perveen. Being the first family in the place means no breadcrumbs in drawers or stains in the bath. I absolutely adore it. We wanted a home big enough for Alice to knock around in. Actually, it reminds me of St. John's Wood. Alice said flatly. Why do you say that? Lady Hobson Jones sounded taken aback. It's so Neo-Georgian, not like our old home in Madras. That was a real Indian bungalow. The India Alice was referring to was from fifteen years past, an era when Alice's father had been less important than now. Perveen was almost sorry for Lady Hobson Jones, who seemed flattened by Alice's reaction. In a sense, Neo-Georgian architecture fits Bombay, Perveen said. Bombay emerged from Fort George. This bungalow is new, but its style is a testament to endurance. Here, here, said Lady Hobson Jones, giving Perveen a faint smile. Realizing that she'd scored a point with Alice's difficult mother, Perveen opened her own car door and stepped down from the running board. Sir David went straight inside, while Lady Hobson Jones fussed with her cloche, which the wind had put askew. Perveen followed Alice, who rushed into the garden to gaze at a hedge of orange and pink hibiscus flowers. Perveen raised her eyebrows in the universal, are you all right, expression. Alice rolled her eyes, and then Perveen understood that Alice was embarrassed by the car and the house and the ambitious parents. We can still find the real India. It has so many different kinds of people and customs. You'll never be bored, Perveen said. I want you to come to my home for a real Parsi supper as soon as possible. Alice's eyes shone. Don't leave out the spices. Sweet and spicy is the key. I have brought some bossy sweets for you today. Perveen brandished the box. Yazdani, Alice said, reading it. Is that a type of sweets? It's the cafe's name. Alice, her mother shouted from the distance. Come meet the staff. An impressive line of servants had emerged through the portico and stood at attention. Perveen counted eight servants wearing uniforms and four dusty, ragged men and boys who were likely gardeners. Alice was asking names, and the staff's answers came rapidly and in a variety of accents. Alice had a strong memory. Perveen thought her friend would be able to recall most of them. Alice's mother didn't ask her daughter's opinion of the home's interior, perhaps because she couldn't bear further criticism. Praveen was surprised that the furnishings were simple modern pieces, low settees and chairs, covered in creamy, soft colors, punctuated by the occasional tall mirrors or paintings of old Englishmen. Altogether, the effect was an interesting harmony. Gwendolyn Hobson Jones led the girls straight up a flight of mahogany stairs that curved gently as they rose. Upstairs, closed doors flanked both sides of a long hallway. She opened the door to the one in the very center. Presenting your new bedroom, Alice. Rather a change from college digs. Alice's vast bedroom was papered in pale pink and fitted out with fashionable rattan furniture. But the stunning thing was that the room was the shape of a half-moon. 
Through five tall bay windows, Praveen was dazzled by a view all the way down to the pale blue water sparkling with pinpoints of light. What a view, Alice said after a pause. But it's so large. I don't need so much space for myself. And I'm not exactly the pink type. You deserve it, her mother said. You've got the sea on one side, and in the other direction are the residences of Malabar Hill. Alice sighed, moving from one window to the next. If I had opera glasses, I could see the people walking on the paths below. Paveen, do you still have yours? Yes, I used them today. Praveen wondered whether there would be a chance to tell Alice her worries. But should she? Her friend had just arrived and was surely exhausted. Mummy, do you know who lives next door? Alice was grimacing at a giant bungalow that could have been a twin to the Hobson Jones's place. It was also so close to their bungalow that there was little more than a hibiscus hedge between the properties. Edward Lipstein, general manager of White Star Line's India shipping operations. Lady Hobson Jones was standing so close behind them that Praveen could smell her floral perfume. He has two unmarried sons. The younger boy is reading economics at Cambridge, and the elder is here working inside the company. You must meet him. He's a friend of Mr. Martin's. Ignoring the bait, Alice asked, Who lives in the smaller bungalow down the hill? It looks more Indian than the other bungalows. Before the car had turned onto Mount Pleasant Road, a long stucco wall had caught Perveen's notice because of the sharp glass shards embedded along its top. Now she saw this wall surrounded a sprawling Indo-Saracenic bungalow, with gardens on its north and south sides, and a central garden courtyard with a long rectangular pool. That low, cream-colored house that's going to ruin. Lady Hobson Jones sounded distracted. I heard it belongs to a Muslim Nawab. There are so many royals around here. He died in December, but the property is still occupied, I assume by his wives and children. Lady Hobson Jones, do you know the name of that street? Perveen asked. An odd feeling had sprung up in her at the mention of the unseen women and children. Seaview Road, Lady Hobson Jones said. Although that bungalow really doesn't have a sea view because of the other houses. Please don't tell me they also have eligible sons, Alice drawled. Don't be silly, chided her mother. I think the children are quite young, from the shrieks and cries I hear every day. But I don't know the family. Muslims keep to themselves. Isn't that true, Perveen? It depends on the family, Perveen said, feeling certain that this must be the Farid bungalow. Some Muslim females live in Burda, but not the girls I went to school with. Last month, Lady Lloyd arranged the most beautiful Perda party, Lady Hobson Jones said as she fussed with the curtains. The passageway in Government House was shielded to allow for privacy, and the room had only lady servants in attendance. Lady Lloyd did so much to make it perfect, but only two ladies out of the twenty invited came. That must have been quite a disappointment, Perveen commented. I suppose it's to be expected. I wouldn't like such a secluded life, but I suppose these ladies have eunuchs to keep them company. Lady Hobson Jones's lips stretched into a knowing smile. Perveen longed to take her handkerchief and wipe off both Lady Hobson Jones's smirk and her coral lipstick. Instead, she murmured, Eunuchs are mostly found in palaces. Alice lingered at the window. 
I quite like the place. It reminds me of a miniature ivory palace. You're too far to see the patches of mildew on the walls. The stucco's peeling, and the glass spikes along the top are so primitive. Lady Hobson Jones shuddered. I'll leave you to look at the eyesore. I'm going downstairs to see about tea. By the way, I've brought sweets. They might be nice with the tea. Praveen offered the box that she'd been holding for the last hour. How considerate. Lady Hobson Jones smiled uncertainly as she took the box. As her mother's heels clicked down the marble stairs, Alice turned to Praveen. I'm awfully sorry. I hadn't seen her in three years, and she's become worse. Praveen decided to be magnanimous. Well, not many British people would invite an Indian up to their veranda, let alone into a family bedroom. Alice pressed her lips together. Do you realize what they're giving me this excessive bedroom means? They want you to be happy and relaxed. She shook her head violently. My parents expect me to live with them for the long term. I thought I was coming on holiday with a return ticket for April. But they just bought me one-way passage. Why is staying in Bombay so dreadful? You told me you wanted to come. Parveen was perplexed. I want to be here. Alice's words were measured. But I also know they want me under their thumb because they didn't approve of my London activities. Parveen exhaled, thinking of Alice's many controversial causes. The communist meetings? or the marches for women's suffrage. It's worse. Lowering her voice, Alice said, Father wrote a letter to say someone had seen me at the Fitzroy Tavern. He was concerned. My father would also take issue with my drinking at a public house. Never mind that Barsi ladies can tipple to their heart's content at parties and weddings. Alice walked to the bank of windows that faced the sea. Looking out, she said, It's more a matter of the Fitzroy Tavern being known for queers. Oh, dear. It had been a long time since they'd spoken about Alice's clandestine social life. Alice spoke, her voice still low but vibrating with anger. After that nightmare at Cheltenham, I was only allowed out of the sanatorium and into Oxford because I pretended I was cured. But now that lies come home to roost. I'm twenty-three and still unmarried, so they've brought me here to change things. Perveen went to Alice and put a gentle hand on her rigid back. It's nineteen twenty-one. Your parents can't force you into marriage. But they can heckle me endlessly. My mother didn't think twice about setting me up with a chinless wonder like Mr. Martin. And now she's dangling the wealthy neighbor. Can you imagine being called Alice Lipstye? It sounds like a dermatological condition. As Alice ranted, her body swayed slightly. Perveen grabbed her friend's elbow. Are you all right? Let's sit down. It feels like I'm still on the ship. Praveen settled down next to Alice on the pink chenille bedspread covering the four-poster. Interesting, isn't it, that neither you nor I can marry? Alice said. Look at the two of us in the mirror over there. A perfect image of young spinsters. It's one of the things that links us. Praveen wasn't exactly a spinster, but there was no reason to hammer the point when Alice was melancholic. But you got through it. You work hard and are rewarded with money and society's appreciation, while I've had to give up my teaching in London and go on idle. You can work again, Alice, Praveen protested. 
This country needs skilled mathematics lecturers. So many high schools and colleges here would be delighted to have someone from Oxford. My mother worried all the while I was studying that I'd become a blue stocking. Alice grumbled. Of course I've done just that. I'm even wearing blue. Perveen regarded herself and Alice in the round mirror on the modish dressing table across from them. With them seated side by side, the top of Perveen's wavy black pompadour hairstyle came to just above Alice's shoulder. Because of their nine-inch difference in height, they'd always looked comical together. But now Perveen's large hazel eyes looked more tired than Mary. Perhaps it came from legal reading, or the shock she'd experienced that day. Perveen decided her face made her appear a touch older than twenty-three. Fine for working with clients, but injuring to her vanity. Alice also looked changed. Her aquamarine cotton frock was heavily creased and stained, as if she'd worn it more than once without laundering. The dishevelment could have been due to traveling, or Alice's discomfort with a warm climate. What was more concerning to Perveen was that Alice's round, sunburned face showed a tension that hadn't existed when they'd said goodbye a year ago in England. Not in Alice's clear blue eyes, but around her mouth, which was unsmiling. What is it? Alice asked, catching sight of the covert inspection. Blue suits you, Perveen said hurriedly. Just as their intense college friendship had suited Perveen, a vulnerable young woman trying to forget her past. Alice had made England tolerable, and it also made it easier to stop thinking of the threat of Cyrus. But one evening, a drunk fresher had lobbed a bottle across the quadrangle when they were passing Balliol College. Perveen had screamed and run off into the dark. Alice had followed and uncovered the truth about why the sound of breaking bottles had sent Perveen back into the past. Perveen had been grateful that Alice didn't pity or judge her. She'd helped set her back on her feet, thinking about something other than a wall of glistening bottles falling. Perveen caught herself with a shudder. Tell me, something's wrong, Alice demanded. Perveen longed to tell her about the possible reappearance of Cyrus. However, her thoughts about Alice's likely exhaustion deterred her, as did the knowledge that the inquisitive Gwendolyn Hobson Jones could walk through the door at any moment. If the woman sensed any trouble in Perveen's life, she might think it too dangerous for Alice to spend time with her. She said, Just feeling a chill. Chapter 7 A Bird Takes Wing Bombay, February 1921 After indulging with Alice and her parents in a rabbit-sized tea, a small plate of sandwiches, plain sponge cake, and papaya slices, Perveen made her apologies and said she needed to start for home. You should have put out more of Perveen's dietan. Alice said to her mother. They were the best part. Sweets in moderation. You look as if you've consumed plenty since I last saw you. Lady Hobson Jones sniped. I'll never be thin like you. Why keep pushing? Alice retorted. Miss Mystery, wouldn't you like another ride in the Silver Ghost? Interrupted Sir David. Sir Jeet can take you home. That's very generous of you, sir, but the other Parsi colony is out of the way. May I come along? Alice said. A colony of Parsis sounds fascinating. Lady Hobson Jones shook her head. Darling, you've been at sea for two weeks. How can you meet Perveen's family without having a proper bath? I'm free tomorrow after work. Perveen said. Could you come to my house for tea? 
Mr. Martin is taking Alice to a welcome party. Alice's mother swiftly rejoined. However, you could certainly make a date for the future. Ring me. We have a telephone set at home and also in the office. That's where I am most days from eight to six. Praveen opened her purse and extracted her card case. She handed Alice a card, which her parents studied in turn. Is this your father's business card? Sir David asked with raised brows. It's mine. I use my initials only for business. B.J. Mystery. It's easier to attract new clients if they don't know my gender. So you're actually working as a solicitor? He looked from the engraved card to her face with surprise. Father, we talked about it in the car already, Alice said. There's a difference between training in the law and practicing it. I haven't seen any women lawyers in British or Indian courts, Sir David told Alice. Working as a solicitor doesn't require going to court, Praveen said. I do the discovery work on court cases and write contracts for our clientele. My father appears in court, and we hire barristers to present our cases. My goodness, Lady Hobson Jones said, pouring a glass of sherry. I find your set quite inspiring. Alice sprang on the comment. Mother, I'm glad to hear you believe in women working. Apparently, there are plenty of teaching opportunities on Bombay. But you worked so hard at that dirty grammar school in North London. Don't you want a small holiday? Praveen sensed that a storm was brewing. Placing her silver fork across her empty cake plate, she said, Sir David and Lady Hobson Jones, please excuse me. It shall be dark soon, so I'll just walk down the hill to the rickshaw stand. As I said, you must ride in the Silver Ghost, Sir David huffed. I review crime reports. Over the last year, a number of women travelling in cars and rickshaws have vanished. Who was she to turn down what she needed? Praveen smiled and said, That's most kind. However, I have a quick stop to make to see a client in the vicinity. Would your driver mind terribly? The Silver Ghost departed the Hobson Jones's bungalow gate and reached the entrance to 22 Sea View within two minutes. This time, Praveen waited for the Hobson Jones's driver to open her door and signify authority to whoever might be watching. Praveen approached the gate, a fresh business card already in hand. A broad-shouldered Durwan, wearing a worn green uniform, hastened past her toward the Rolls' other side. There's no one else, Praveen called, after realizing the guard assumed such a grand car would contain a man. He returned with a disappointed air. When Praveen told him she was there to speak to the Farid wives, his head shook vigorously, as did his fez's limp tassel. The Begums are in mourning, not seeing anyone. I received word from Mukri Saab that they requested consultation. This was stretching the truth just a little bit. The man stood in silence, as straight and thick and unrelenting as the columns on either side of the property gate. Praveen decided to wait out the Durwan. She knew that the silver ghost had drawn the attention of the watchmen guarding other nearby houses. If she remained in place, these men would notice the rudeness of the Farid's employee toward a woman who might have been sent by the governor. Looking regretful, the watchman opened the gate and kept his head down, as if not wishing to see her go through. Praveen thanked him and moved confidently ahead on the stone path, passing a small family of peacocks who seemed to look after her with suspicion. The grass was high and uneven, as if a gardener hadn't cut it over the last month. Standing in front of the house, she noticed the stucco was deteriorating, 
and greenish mildew had bloomed in places. Gwendolyn Hobson Jones was correct in her assumption the house wasn't properly kept up. The door creaked open on its heavy, rusted hinges. A young boy stood before Praveen, wearing just a shabby vest and pantaloons. She couldn't help noticing the giant black birthmark obscuring most of one of his cheeks, the kind of mark that many still believed was a devil's curse. Perveen smiled encouragingly at the bearer, who couldn't have been more than ten years old. I'm Perveen Mystery, the family solicitor. I've come to see Mukri Saab. Will you please give him my card? Yes, Mem Saab. The child took what she gave him and padded silently out of the reception room. Removing her kidskin sandals, Praveen brought them to a carved camphor wood shelf where she saw some men's European shoes and some Indian chapels. She wondered if there were no feminine sandals because the family's women didn't go out. Perhaps they even had their own door leading to a zanana, a section of the house meant for wives and small children. Praveen gazed around, taking the measure of the beautiful old bungalow. The diamond patterns of the blue and orange floor tiles were replayed in marble lintels that ran along the tops of the high walls, which had been painted a soft cerulean. The reception room had grand columns with inset panels depicting twisting vines and flowers made from semi-precious stones, she guessed the house was built in the 1880s, just a little bit later than Mystery House. Perveen settled herself on a low divan and leaned back against a bolster. It was elegant indeed, although the velvet was almost worn through. She straightened when she heard the slap of slippers on tiles. A well-built man in his mid-twenties, wearing a silk kurta pajama, was proceeding from the passage toward her. Perveen performed the adab greeting gesture Mustafa had taught her, touching her fingers lightly to her heart and then her forehead. The man didn't reciprocate. Are you from Mystery Law? he demanded. Noticing the rudeness, she countered. Are you, Mr. Mukri? Yes. Why didn't Mystery Saab come himself? His voice was heavy with irritation. Perveen's back went up. He sent me. I am PJ Mystery, the firm's other solicitor. His frown drew down the curled, waxed corners of his mustache. I don't want a change in representation. She sensed a subtle threat behind his words. There is no change. We are a family firm working together to serve you best. My father dispatched me because, as a female, I can address the Begums directly. I'd very much like to speak with them about the letter. Mr. Mukri waved his hand as if shooing away an insect. There is no need for conversation. I have sent your father a letter with their signatures. That has always been enough. Her father hadn't done a thorough enough job. That was why she'd taken over. But she could hardly tell this man that. We have carefully reviewed the document, but there are some issues about the Mahar. They all wish to put their Mahar in the Wakf, he said flatly. Truly, what they receive isn't much. One thousand and one rupees a year. This renowned Wakf... The Farid Family Foundation needs every bit of revenue. Funds are especially needed, because the Waqf shall now support a boy's madrasa. Oh, that's a change. Praveen was startled. It was Farid Saab's dying wish. She had never seen any mention of a religious school for boys in Mr. Farid's papers. She'd have to ask the widows about this dying wish. However, Mr. Mukri controlled access to them. She needed to proceed carefully. Saab, you are taking care of the estate very well. But there are clear rules guarding the contracts already written for the Lady's Mahar and the settlement of the estate. We must be careful to operate within the strictures of Mohammedan law. 
Yes. Mr. Mukri seated himself in the chair farthest away, as if establishing a boundary. First, one must pay funeral expenses and the remaining doctor's bills. All that has been covered. Thank you for paying those bills. Parveen's smile stretched thin, because it had taken forever for him to forward evidence of those payments. She took out her notebook and her old Parker pen from her briefcase. The next responsibility is to make sure all other debts are cleared. Have you had time to read the letters I've sent asking for the names of various creditors? I have seen them. But do not worry. Those bills are paid. Farid Saab appointed me because he knew I would take care of such matters. Praveen scrutinized him. She saw shrewd eyes set in a once handsome face, puffed from too much food. His relaxed clothing almost gave the impression he was living inside this household. Obviously, this was a luxurious world he didn't want to lose. I agree with you, Saab. However, it would be best if the merchants who regularly supply the household, tailors, grocers, builders, and the like, could provide evidence of paid accounts. I can gather this information if I only have the names. Yes, yes, he said, twisting the ends of his mustache as if he was nervous. I am doing it. But we need to fix the situation with the widow's donations to the wakf. You included a letter signed by all three Begums, Perveen acknowledged. However, any judge considering the matter will certainly question whether anyone witnessed each woman signing her own name. His eyes narrowed. You have a paper showing that they certainly signed their names. Perveen's pulse began to race because she intended to challenge him. A judge would not believe this without anyone witnessing their signatures. But they are forbidden to be in the same room as men. It is Idat, the mourning period for widows, which lasts four months and ten days. Here was her opening. Of course you would not wish to violate religious custom. This is the reason I have come. It is quite simple for me to meet with each woman individually. If she states to me her wish to donate her mahar, I will then draft a special contract for her saying this. Must all this extra truly be done? We plan for the madrasa to open this July. Builders need to be paid, and we require money for books, and the teachers must have their salaries. Unfortunately, it cannot be avoided. And because this is the first I've heard of the madrasa... Can you tell me its name and address? As Praveen wrote notes on her pad, she saw Mr. Mukri's face tighten. It shall be called the Farid Institution. It's in the neighborhood where most Muslims stay. I see, Praveen answered, having realized he was building a wall against her as sharp as the glass-topped one outside the bungalow. How fast can you get the money for the school? Mukri asked. What she was going to say wouldn't please him, but it was the truth. Changing established agreements means we must file for approval in several different courts. Given the slowness of bureaucracy, I'm afraid we are speaking of at least three months. Grimacing, he said. We are coming close to the hour of evening prayer so you cannot see the women tonight. You may call on them tomorrow. Praveen didn't mind the delay. It would give her a chance to gather the Maher documents to bring to the women and do a little more research at the office. Smiling gratefully, she asked, Mukri Saab, what is the best time tomorrow? I'll be at the mill for most of the day, but you may come to see the women any time before four o'clock. Late afternoon prayers. I'll come at two, and thank you very much for speaking with me today. Let me assure you, our interest is serving the Honorable Mr. Farid in the manner he wished. Rising from his chair, he pointed a finger at her. I expect your best effort on this.
or I will surely report you to your father. Mr. Mukri did not stay to see her out the door. This was another rudeness. Feeling irritated, Praveen bent to take her sandals from the shelf where she'd placed them. As she looked down toward it, she noticed something. The wall behind it was a jolly made of marble with many geometric perforations. Through these small teardrop spaces, she saw a dark shape. As she stared, the dark shape moved to one side and slipped away. The presence of jolly walls and windows allowed a household's women to observe the action from which they were excluded. It was an intentional part of Muslim architecture, a way of including those who sat behind the screens. Praveen couldn't tell if the shape had been a lady, child, or servant. All she could guess was the individual hadn't wanted to be seen. It was barely a half hour to Dadar Parsi colony, but the journey seemed to take forever. Praveen was anxious to talk things over with her father. She hoped she hadn't given Mr. Mukri the impression that she'd influenced the women to make changes he didn't want. Having observed his dictatorial nature, though, she felt emphatic that the women needed to know about all their rights. My house is the large yellow one on the right with two doors, Praveen said to Sirjeet when he turned into Dinshaw Master Road. As the driver halted before the mystery's two-year-old stucco duplex, the neighbor boys who'd been playing in the park nearby laid down their cricket bats and rushed over to caress the car. Don't touch. Can't you idiots see it's the governor's car? Sirjeet barked at them. What has Perveen done? Eaten him up? A boy shot back. Amid peals of laughter, the boys kept circling the car. Perveen wished Sirjeet hadn't been so specific. Get going before I turn your faces to cauliflower mash. Perveen looked up to see Rustam. Her older brother and Gulnaz were leaning over the curly wrought iron railings of the second story balcony that ran along their bedroom and parlor. Both of them wore dressing gowns, and Gulnaz's long, lustrous hair was not only loose, but also uncovered. Perveen felt a flash of irritation. Napping at six o'clock on a Monday, it was as if the two of them were still newlyweds and not married two years. What's this about, Perveen? Rustam called out. My friend sent me home in a borrowed car. If you were decent, you could come down and have a look. Now the car had attracted a few young men. Perveen saw Rahan Mehta and a couple of non-Parsi companions, all of whom were wearing Congress Party caps. Her father sarcastically called them the Freedom Brigade. What's this? Why are you riding in a car with government seals on the door? It must belong to someone very high up, Rahan accused. Sir David Hobson Jones is the governor's special counselor, Sir Jeet answered with obvious pride. Governor Lloyd has given his car for his use. An official government car, Rahan said, staring Praveen up and down. You must be really close to Georgie. Eat sugar, Perveen retorted, thinking that the ride, which had started out like a dream, was turning into an embarrassment. Sajit, thank you. Please tell them how much I appreciated your service. After Sajit drove away, Rahan continued his slurs. English lover. It's no surprise that your family's building that ludicrous royal gate. He was referring to the involvement of mystery construction in the gateway of India construction at Apollo Bandar. Perveen glanced up, and even at a distance could see her brother's face reddening. She shook her head at him. She was on the ground and fully dressed. She'd take care of it. Perveen marched up to Rahan and his friends until they were inches apart. I'd be pleased to speak to your group about the activism of Indians throughout Europe. 
including Madame Bikaji Kama, who was jailed after speaking about Indian independence to India's overseas soldiers. The young man murmured uncertainly. Madame Kama's speaking cost her greatly. She is not allowed to come back to India, Praveen said, looking them over with contempt. You should think about her example, and whether freedom might be won not by insults, but rather by mixing with people outside one's community. You caused quite a stir tonight, Rustam said, as the mysteries all sat down to dinner that evening in the parents' dining room. I didn't mean to. Alice's father insisted I ride in that car. Rustam, I thought you might have liked to inspect it. She paused a beat. But you weren't properly dressed. Your tongue is like scissors right after the sharpening. Rustam gave her a killing look. Why does your friend's father have use of Governor Lloyd's car? Jamshedji asked as he buttered a puri. Sir David Hobson Jones works for the governor. They took me in the car from the pier to their bungalow in Malabar Hill, and of course they wanted to ensure my safe return. Rustam hooted. Sir David Hobson Jones is the governor's special counsellor overseeing the development of Back Bay. I heard something along those lines. Favouring her brother with a smile, Praveen added, He knows of mystery construction. As well he should, Camellia opined. Tell us all about Alice's home. Praveen rolled her eyes. It's one of those monstrous places Grandfather Mystery used to say would be the death of Malabar Hill. But it was interesting inside, with very modern furniture. How clever of you to make friends with Sir Hobson Jones's daughter, Gulnaz said enthusiastically. Sir David, Rustam said, patting Gulnaz's hand. Just like our governor must be called Sir George, in the event one needs to address him. And now, thanks to Bavin, we might very well have invitations to the Secretariat. Laughter rippled around the table, and Bravine had to hit her glass with a fork to get back their attention. Enough! I've known Alice for almost four years, and I would never use her for gain. Our friendship stands apart from family politics, business, and everything else. But we are talking about family interest, Gulna said. That is entirely different. Your friend should be our friend, shouldn't she? Praveen and Gulnaz's casual relationship had changed now that they were sisters-in-law. It was loving, but not entirely comfortable. Carefully, Praveen said, There is a misconception that Barsis support the British unconditionally. We have to do better. If that's your aim, how do you explain lounging in the governor's car? Rustam demanded. I really had no choice in the matter, but I thought you'd like seeing the car, not rip me up about it. Oh, dear. Golnaz's anxious gaze turned from one sibling to the other. I didn't wish to cause an argument. There's no argument here, darling, Camellia said. It is only brother-sister blustering. Jamshedji looked down the table and spoke in a mock scolding tone. I think it's extraordinary that nobody asked a question about my day. It just happens I won a very big case. Oh, Jamshedji Papa, do tell everything, Gulnaz said, going into sycophantic daughter-in-law mode. Jamshedji reminded everyone of the case's particulars and then went into full reportage. And Judge said, followed by, I'd coached my barrister to respond. And then the boy Jayanth took the stand. As everyone else listened raptly, 
Praveen saw no place in her father's golden evening to tell him her worries that Cyrus Sodawala and an associate might be in town. Besides, if he became nervous, he might not let her go out to the Farid bungalow the next day. And she had to speak to those women. After dinner, Praveen climbed the stairs to her room. In her hands, she held a small tin bowl containing half a banana and some leftover cooked cauliflower. After slipping into her nightgown, she opened the French doors to her own balcony overlooking the quiet green garden. Inside her brass cage, Lillian was sleeping with head under wing, but came quickly awake. Ahoy there, matey, Lillian squawked, hopping off her perch. Ahoy there, Lillian, Praveen answered, smiling at the Alexandrian parrot. God save the queen, cackled Lillian, catching sight of the bowl of food. Praveen's late grandfather had been Lillian's first owner, and he'd taught his bird the toast during Victoria's reign. The bird had been unwilling to change her allegiance to Edward VII or George V, no matter how hard Grandfather Mystery had tried to get her to do so. Praveen had taught Lillian to recite one line from Vande Mataram, the freedom poem, but she only chirped a random Mataram after a particularly tasty treat. Praveen opened the cage door. The bird exited in a gorgeous rush of pale green feathers. She made some fast flapping circles over the garden before returning to the arm of the lounge chair where Praveen had placed her supper bowl. Lillian ate delicately and then began a series of brief forays into the garden where she screamed at the other birds as if they had no right to the territory. Sometimes Lillian stayed outside for hours sipping water from the bird bath and monitoring the garden for avian intruders. But when mosquitoes descended, Praveen would leave the balcony to read in her bedroom in the comfort of a netted bed. Losing Lillian wasn't a worry. She was part of the mystery family, and like a prodigal daughter, she always returned. Chapter 8 Fine Print Bombay, February 1921 The principles of Mohammedan law had been written in English, which should have made understanding it easy. But the more closely Praveen read the book, the more it seemed like a minefield. Muslim marital law stated that a widow's claim for dower was a debt chargeable against a husband's estate— it had to be paid out before legacies and inheritance distribution. But the word claim bothered her. One might interpret that to mean that if a widow wished not to take her maher, the inheritance distribution and legacy donations could go forward without making any subtractions. Probably this was what Mr. Mukri believed. Praveen rubbed her eyes. Two hours of reading a legal treatise was exhausting. She wanted to ask her father about the issue, but he had gone to Kemp's Corner to see a client. She wrote down the question in her notebook and shifted to another pressing job, writing out a Hindustani translation of Mr. Mukri's letter, which had been written in English. She finished at twelve and went across the street to see a notary public at another firm to have the translation certified. Stepping into the busy atmosphere of Bruce Street, reminded her of the stranger she'd recently seen, and Cyrus. She inspected the fronts of every business, including Yazdani's on the corner, before going back upstairs to read more Muslim law. At a quarter to one, Mustafa announced that Jayanth had arrived to see her. Glad for the distraction, she hurried down. Jayanth pressed his hands together in a namaste greeting at the sight of her, he looked so much better than when he'd been in the Bombay jail. He was bathed and freshly dressed in a clean lungi and vest. His back was straight, and his face seemed fuller. It was as if all his heavy anxiety had lifted. Good morning to you, Jayanth, Praveen said. I'm very sorry for not being in the audience yesterday and seeing your grand victory. I missed you, too. I came to give thanks. 
From behind his back, he brought out a small, tender-looking green parcel. My mother made you sweet coconut rice. It's a Koli specialty. Kolis were a local population, many of whom worked the water. Praveen thought it was ironic. Koli sounded a lot like coolie, the Anglo-Indian word for Indian loaders, which was Jayanth's trade down at Ballard Pier. It was punishing work. Most men were finished by the age of forty due to injuries. Coconut rice, my favorite, she said, taking the banana leaf wrapped delicacy into her hands. How did you know I get hungry around this time every afternoon? This is much nicer than biscuits. But tell me, why are you here at this time? Have you been able to start work? Since five o'clock today. Old Ravi's face was sour as tamarind, but he let me in. And my friends are grateful that we all will have a daily break now. I used this break to come to see you. I know it was your hard work that won the case. I can't take responsibility, she demurred. My father was the one who spoke so convincingly to the judge. Using the things you wrote down, Jayant said emphatically. I may have no money, but whatever you need at the docks, I can get. Tell me if you need to know about any particular person or company or ship. Also, if you wish for goods at a special bargain. Hastily, she said, that is so kind. Our accounting for your case is closed. The last thing she needed was for him to be arrested for stealing. After Jayanth departed, Praveen took the package of coconut rice to her desk it was vulgar to eat and work, but she had so little time. She'd just finished the last morsel when she heard her father coming in downstairs. Quickly, she threw away the banana leaf and wiped her desk blotter clean with a handkerchief. Goodness, Papa, you look warm, she said, noticing the sheen of sweat on her father's bald spot. I asked Arman to drop me at the Ripon Club for a spell, and I walked from there. Spring must be coming early this year. Sit, and I'll bring you water. Perveen tipped cool water from the silver pitcher on the stand into a fresh tumbler and added a sprig from the mint plant by the window. Mustafa should be doing this, not you, he said, as he settled into his chair with a soft groan. Today I asked Mustafa to go out and buy something for me. She'd wanted Mustafa to ask around the street about whether a Bengali stranger or any curly-haired Parsi had been seen that day. He is always happy to go out, her father said, taking a long, pleasurable drink. Somehow the heat doesn't bother him, despite his age. He always says heat gives strength. Perveen picked up the principles of Mohammedan law. May I ask you about Section 184, Nature of Widow's Claim for Dower? Go on, he said, taking another draft of water. Perveen asked whether deferred dower always needed to be paid at the time of a marriage's dissolution through death or divorce. Could such a payout be overlooked if a wife wishes not to take the gift? At the time of marriage, this community tends to demand the prompt dower, but later on there is no requirement of prepossession. Jamshedji answered easily. However, the judge would be happier if the solicitor could testify that the women have received what is due. Then they can donate it. It makes the situation clean. Some of the Maher should be on hand, I'm almost certain Sakina Begum would have possession of her jewellery and Mumtaz her musical instruments, but I'll ask each of them. Praveen picked up the Farid folder and flipped through it again. Proving Razia Begum's possession of the four acres would be harder, because amongst all these papers, I haven't seen a deed for land in her name. Is it filed elsewhere? No. Jamshedji said, setting his glass down. 
After the wedding, I asked Farid Saab if he wished me to put through the ownership change in court. He declined. I didn't press him because a solicitor isn't required to make such a change. Such a filing could be done at any time, given the commitment made by the Maher contract. Praveen was annoyed by her father's decision to be so passive. I hope the deed can still be switched into Razia Begum's name. Her husband's intent to transfer it to her is stated in the contract. We can do the work, or it could be executed by Mr. Mukri. Perveen was fairly confident he'd have no interest in doing that, unless the land gift was going toward the wakf. But what would that mean? Land wouldn't enrich the wakf unless the land is sold. And how could Razia Begum sell it now that the mills are on it? Jamshedji sat still for a moment and then shook his head. The fabric mills could stay, but the land underneath could become part of a family trust, and that trust could be paid rent by the company. But it involves more legal work than you are experienced enough to do. When I gave you this yesterday, I didn't know this was an issue. Who knows? Razia Begum might not wish to give up those acres once I've explained everything. Jamshedji held up a cautionary finger. Remember, Razia Begum is the one we think had the genuine signature on the relinquishment letter. She may be all for giving them up to the wakf. I suppose so, Praveen said, feeling doubtful. Now, what about lunch? Now that my throat isn't so dry, I hear my stomach's call. I wish I could eat with you, but I must be at the Farid bungalow by two. May I use the car? She looked at him entreatingly. Certainly. It's too far for a horse to pull a donga from here all the way up Malabar Hill. And I've just realized the other reason you won't eat lunch with me. He added in a sly tone. She was confounded. Why? He pointed to the iron waste basket that was now circled by a few flies. It is a lowly habit to take anything more than tea and biscuits in the office. Your grandfather would weep. The ride from Fort to Malabar Hill took less than a half hour. Still, Praveen was sweating when she arrived. It wasn't just the warm February day. She was nervous about explaining things to the widows correctly, and also because she intended to learn what they thought of Faisal Mukri. If he was as unpleasant and controlling with them as he'd tried to be with her, she imagined they would be an anxious group. At 22 Sea View, the same belligerent Durwan was on guard. When he looked into the Daimler and saw Perveen, his face reddened. He jabbed a finger at Arman and barked that he was in the wrong place. Memsab? Arman turned to look questioningly at Perveen. Perveen spoke to the guard in a controlled tone. Actually, you admitted me here yesterday. I'm the family lawyer and was given permission to return by Mukri Saab. Yes, yes, the Dirwan said shortly. But to see the wives, you must go to the Zanana entrance. That is the second gate. I opened it already. Now she felt foolish. Armand drove a few more feet and turned into the second gate. The brick driveway led to the house's north side, which had a long, copper-roofed port cocher at the door. She imagined that this extra structure offered privacy to women getting in and out of carriages or cars. Praveen stepped out and surveyed the garden. This side of the property was thick with tall trees. Weeds had grown high on the neglected lawn, although a border of rose bushes had been tended and looked healthy. When Praveen rapped at the door, she was met with silence. She called out a greeting through the holes of the marble jolly window, and a minute or so later, a small girl in a worn cotton salwar kameez opened the door. 
Adab, Praveen said, noting the girl appeared to be the same age as the boy she'd seen the day before. My name is Praveen Mistry. I've come to see the Begums. They know about you. Please come inside. The girl kept her head down, as if Praveen's presence made her shy. Yesterday, a boy answered the door on the main side of the house, Praveen said as she stepped out of her sandals. My twin brother, Zaid, a good boy, the girl added, turning to look at Praveen. The similarity in the small, heart-shaped faces was apparent, although the girl didn't have the birthmark. Zaid was most helpful to me. What is your name, my dear? And are your parents working here? Child servants were a fact of life in the city, but Praveen felt concerned for ones who'd come alone from the villages to work in big houses. My name is Fatima. Our father is the house's Darwan. He is called Mohsen. Our mother, may Allah keep her, went to paradise when we were born. We were too much for her. I'm very sorry. Praveen wanted to say more, but the young maid interrupted her. Mimsab, kindly wait here. I'll fetch them. As Fatima hurried up the staircase, Praveen toured the reception room, which was approximately the same size as the room where she'd met Mr. Mukri. This room's decor was different, with a floor of aged gray and white marble tiles covered in areas by ornate Agra rugs. She smelled the delicious scent of roses in a vase on a central table. Seeing an opening off to the room's west side, Praveen went a few steps and found herself in a small room about eight feet square that was dominated by a six-foot-high ceramic-tiled niche. The niche was fitted out with hundreds of tiny mosaic tiles that formed pictures of flowers and curving arabesques in shades of blue and violet with touches of yellow. Gazing into it, she was overcome by a sense of an old, elegant culture that seemed somehow familiar. Zoroastrians had ruled Persia before the Arab conquest in the middle of the 7th century, and a shared aesthetic came through in the ornate floral tiles. A soft swishing sound made her quickly turn. Do you wish to pray? A thin girl who looked about twelve was regarding Perveen with curiosity. The girl's salwar kameez didn't fit well, but it was of a fine embroidered silk that made it clear she wasn't another servant. Amina! A petite woman with luxuriant black hair coiled into a top knot rushed up behind the girl. Don't say such things. The lady is not Muslim. Praveen was embarrassed to be caught wandering. She made a quick adab gesture to the woman, who had long-lashed, beautiful eyes and an unearthly fair complexion that was evidence of life lived indoors. The lady, who appeared close to Praveen's age, was dressed in a borderless black sari, which should have been grim, but was elegant due to its silk chiffon. Feeling flustered, she said, I didn't know this was a holy place. I'm sorry. No need for apology, the lady said in a markedly sweeter tone. The mehrab is our central point for worship. You are Miss Mystery, aren't you? I am Sakina. Her courteous response eased Praveen's tension. Adab, Sakina Begum. My name is Praveen. I'd like to offer a very belated condolence on the passing of your husband. My father said he was such an honorable man, always treating everyone kindly. Sakina nodded soberly. Your condolence is gratefully received, and it is not late at all, for we are observing the morning period. As she spoke, two other women in black arrived, their beaded slippers making light sounds on the marble. May I introduce Razia and Mumtaz? 
We will do whatever you wish. Perveen repeated her adab gesture, and both ladies reciprocated. A tall, slender woman with gray streaks running through black hair pulled into a tight bun must have been Razia. Although the papers at the office revealed her to be thirty, Perveen thought she looked slightly older due to long frown lines running between her nose and mouth. Muntaz, the third wife, was quite brown, natural for someone who'd not been sheltered her whole life. She was not as alluring as Perveen had expected. Her hair was scraped into a messy braid, and her face was puffy and tired-looking. Another difference between her and the other wives was her dress. All the wives wore borderless black saris, but while Sakina wore silk chiffon and Razia tussa silk, Mumtaz wore a baggy sari of cheaply dyed black cotton, a fabric more likely to be worn by a poor woman than a rich one. Thank you for coming. I am Razia, the mother of Amina, who was the first of us to greet you. The senior wife's voice was lower pitched than Sakina's and had a reassuring gravity. She has been very excited about your arrival since Mukri Saab alerted us yesterday evening. Perveen was distracted by the sound of small feet running. Within seconds, two young girls in white lace-edged frocks had appeared. It's time for playing music with Mumtaz Khala, the older of the girls sang out. She looked about six years old and was likely Sakina's firstborn daughter. Nasreen, you are interrupting Perveen Bibi, who is our guest, Sakina said, tapping Nasreen on the head. And Mumtaz Khala cannot play music with you and Shireen today. She is busy. Five-year-old Shireen hopped up and down. Who is our guest? Where does she come from? None of you girls should be downstairs. This is time for grown-up stalking. Go to Aya. Razia's tone was reproving. Perveen sensed the widows were anxious about her presence, and this feeling would pass to the children. There was no need for it. Smiling at the children, she said, Might we all say hello to each other? The judge will ask whether I've seen the children, and if they are in good health and spirits. All right, then, Razia said with a nod. You girls are lucky to have this chance. She crouched to get on eye level with the two younger girls. I am Perveen. Call me Auntie or Hala if you like. I live in Dadar Parsi colony, and I work with my father in an area called Fort. We are lawyers, which means we help people keep what belongs to them. We promised your father we would watch over your family to make sure you were fine. After Perveen spoke the word father, Amina rushed forward and put a protective hand on each of the other daughters. Don't say that. I'm sorry. Perveen felt alarmed. Abba is still watching us, Amina said reprovingly. From heaven. Parsis and Muslims both believed in heaven and hell. This was a major difference from Hindus who believed in reincarnation. You must miss him very much. Amina nodded. I do. He talked to me every day, even when he was sick. Shireen and Nasreen don't remember him so well, because they didn't go in the sick room. Abba is happier in heaven, Ami says. Nasreen reached out a finger to eagerly stroke the border of Perveen's sari. Your sari is very pretty, not black like theirs. For a moment, Perveen was confused, but then she remembered Ami was the Urdu word for mother. I don't think they will always wear black, but it is the custom now. We mourn for four months and ten days, Razia said flatly. After that, we dress as we like, but there really is no reason for festivity. Perveen had the sense Razia was heavily grieving her husband. Perhaps she felt the burden of the whole household upon her, in addition to the emotional loss. 
Mumtaz and Sakina both looked somber. It made Praveen wonder about how Omar Farid's relationship with each woman had been, whether he had shown a different side of himself to each one, or if he had loved one more intensely than the others. Why have you arranged your sari so strangely? Shireen chirped, interrupting Praveen's thoughts. It's not correct. Shireen! Sakina reprimanded her with a soft laugh. Please excuse my daughter's rudeness. It's a good question, Praveen said. I am Parsi, and it is our custom to wear saris this way. May I please? said Nasreen, stretching out her fingers to touch the embroidery. Of course. Praveen stood like a mannequin, feeling the way she had when the women in her family had rushed around draping her sari for her wedding. What is a bossy? asked Amina in slow, studied English. A Zoroastrian born in India. Seeing Amina's small brows drawn together in a questioning way, Praveen elaborated, We worship God, but we call him Ahura Mazda rather than Allah. My people came on boats from Persia a very long time ago. Other Persian Zoroastrians have come in the last hundred years. They call themselves Iranis, because that is the country's name in Persian. Ah, it is like British calling us Mohammedans. We are Muslims. Amina's gaze was bright. My ancestors came from Arabia, also on very long boats. Amina, are you studying English? Praveen was surprised, both by the girl's swift logic and the fact that she kept answering Praveen's Hindi words in English. We were learning until our English governess went. May I properly say to you, good afternoon, Miss Mystery? Amina put out a slender hand for Praveen to shake. I am very pleased to meet you, Praveen said, shaking Amina's hand and thinking that all three girls had a sparkling energy. She turned to Shireen and Nasreen and spoke in Hindi. The only one missing is your brother. I'd like to meet him, too. He is napping upstairs. Now that all have been acquainted, shall we sit down? Sakina suggested with the air of a comfortable hostess. Fatima, go to Iqbal and ask him to make a pitcher of Faluda. The young maid nodded and hurried out the door. The hospitality was enticing, but Praveen couldn't allow her consultations to become a family affair. Gesturing at her briefcase, she said, I am very much looking forward to talking with all of you, but I should speak with each lady alone. In the Zanana, there are no secrets. We are all sisters, Sakina said with a friendly laugh that revealed a mouthful of sparkling teeth. How was it that Sakina looked so well when Razia and Muntaz did not? I understand that. However, the judge requires a different letter from each wife. It is just as your late husband made an individual marriage and maha contract with each of you. Praveen regarded each widow as she spoke. Both Razia and Sakina appeared startled. Mumtaz's expression didn't change. She looked as if she were accustomed to being told what to do. Can't we stay? Amina asked. It sounds very interesting. Praveen paused, thinking how rare it must have been for the children to have a visitor. I have an idea. If the children wish to play music with Mumtaz Begum, there's no reason not to do that now. I will come for a performance before I have my visit with her. We can certainly do that, Mumtaz agreed, giving the children a tired smile. Let's practice to make a lovely concert. But the Faluda, Nasreen whimpered. You may have a small glass after you've practiced nicely. Sakina gave her an indulgent look. Paveen Bibi, 
I will speak to you first in my private quarters upstairs. B.B. was the proper honorific to use with Perveen, who was a young single woman. But this was a very unusual household if the second wife decided to speak before the first. Chapter 9 Pierced Walls Bombay, February 1921 Perveen followed Sakina up the wide marble staircase into the Farid widow's private world. Here, every window was shaded with a marble jolly screen, casting dotted bits of light everywhere. It was beautiful, but dim, reminding Perveen of what it was like to try to read on her balcony after the sun had set. The Zanana hallways upstairs were in the shape of an L, Sakina led her through a long hallway and into a shorter one that ended with a metal jolly screen. Drawing closer, Praveen noticed that the delicately tooled metalwork was made to resemble a trellis covered with clusters of grapes and their vines. Such lovely metalwork! It reminds me of the doors of a cabinet in our office. I wonder if your cabinet was made by the same metalsmith. As Perveen moved closer, she saw that the golden jolly appeared to be locked on the other side and had a wide slot in the middle with a hinged covering. What's this? Sakina smiled at the compliment before answering. This jolly makes a border between our zanana and the main house. The opening is a place where we may pass papers and other small things. It is a relic from the old days— but now that Mukri Saab is here, we find it convenient to use it again. Is this the place where you sit when you converse with Mukri Saab? Perveen regarded a small bench covered in pink velvet. Yes, there's a seat on the other side for any gentleman who has been approved to come into the bungalow and needs to speak with us. Perveen wanted a sense of how many personal connections the women had— Besides Mukri Saab, who has come recently? Many mourners came in December. Two weeks ago, a military officer came to discuss some matters of the walk with Razia, but he could not enter the house because of our mourning period. Sakina had referred to the household's senior wife by her first name only, an act that did not show the respect that adding Begum would have provided— Perveen wondered what Mustafa would think. How often do your own relatives visit? My family is from Pune, therefore visits aren't frequent. Sakina had straightened slightly, as if she were less comfortable. But I'm not lonely. As you can see, we have a very lively home, and we can sit outside in our gardens when the weather is fine. Perveen didn't entirely believe her. What about telephoning? Can you have a chat? The widow's long-lashed eyes flared. Telephone calls are expensive, and the telephone set is in the main section. It is for business matters only. Do you visit friends elsewhere in Malabar Hill or Bombay? Perveen was worried that Sakina was putting up a brave front— a few acquaintances. Sakina gave Perveen a level glance. I hope you don't consider us poor, trapped females because we observe Perda. It is entirely by choice. I understand you've chosen to live this way. But Perveen remained concerned about how little contact they had with others, and not even a telephone for emergencies. I thank Allah daily that we are not on the streets surrounded by dangerous types, and that our daughters are growing like roses in a walled garden. This is a special, peaceful life. If only we can keep together and stay in this home, I will have no worries. Of course we will try to ensure that, Sakina Begum. Feeling chastised, Perveen followed Sakina through the doorway that was closest to the Golden Jolly. 
Inside was a sumptuously decorated bedroom, dominated by a big four-poster dressed in pink silk. The drapery color was exactly the same as that of the roses in the blue and pink mosaic tiled borders around the windows and doors. What a charming room! And it looks like another room is attached. Lowering her voice, Praveen said, Is your baby son sleeping there? All the children stay in the nursery with Aya. Jum Jum is always sleeping this time of day. He's just turned one. I use the other room for taking tea with visiting relatives or friends, for simply enjoying some rest, Sakina said with the gracious smile that Praveen realized was her hallmark. Let's go in together. How many servants work in the house? Praveen asked, settling down on a purple velvet settee, while Sakina took a matching wing chair. A black lacquered curio cabinet was filled with English and French china figurines, and a grand mahogany commode was topped by an arrangement of lilies and tuberose in a bowl. There was a feeling of luxury and peace in the room. Did you make the lovely flower arrangements? Yes, Sakina said, looking a bit startled. I must take care of the flowers now. I go very early in the morning when the sun is not strong. We did have a gardener, but to conserve funds we let him go. As well as the governess Amina mentioned, the cook's assistant and our head bearer. You are very talented at it, Perveen said, realizing that Sakina seemed ashamed to be performing an art that many other ladies would have prided themselves in. If so many staff are gone, do Fatima and Zaid take care of the cleaning? Yes, their father, Mohsen, is our Darwan. We still have Iqbal, our cook, and Taiba Aya, who has been with the family since my late husband's childhood. Fatima came in, awkwardly carrying a silver tray weighed down with two tall crystal goblets, brimming with a pale pink beverage. The fruit and milk punch was room temperature, not chilled, and Perveen realized the house didn't have an ice box. Delicious, she said after sipping. And is Mukri Saab staying in the house or visiting when needed? He has taken a room in the main section of the house. Having a responsible man inside the house was my husband's wish. It keeps us safe. We hope he will continue living here although it is certainly an imposition for him. Because of Mukri's casual clothing the day before, Perveen had guessed he lived in the home, but it certainly was unconventional for a man who wasn't their blood relative. She wondered if he had anyone to keep him company on the other side of the house. Has he a wife and children? No, that is the reason my husband thought he would be able to dedicate himself to helping us. Sakina carefully set down her own glass of faluda on an embroidered cloth on the table before them. Perveen Bibi, were you going to explain about the necessary papers? Sorry, Perveen said, realizing she'd strayed too far into the personal. I'd like to start by reviewing the Maher papers your husband signed in 1913. Praveen opened her briefcase and presented the Urdu version of Sakina's Maher agreement. Sakina's eyes ran slowly over the lines. I understand. The paper describes the jewelry set that I'm planning to give to the wakf. I assume such valuable jewelry is in a vault at the bank? Perveen said, taking a legal pad out to begin her notes. No bank, she said dismissively. My father-in-law built safes in all the bedrooms, and that is where I've always kept my jewelry. Oh, it's right here, then. Would you like to see it? I haven't looked at it since before my husband's illness. Certainly. Perveen was pleased that verification would be so simple. Sakina rose gracefully from her seat and went to the wall, 
where she shifted aside a small painting of orchids. Behind it was a brass plate with two round dials. After a few seconds' work, the door sprang open, and she pulled out a drawer with boxes. Sakina returned to Praveen and set down a series of velvet boxes on the table between them. What beautiful pieces, Praveen said, as Sakina brought forward a gleaming necklace of emeralds, diamonds, and delicate gold links. She opened a smaller box, showing the matching bangles, and yet another one with fine emerald drop earrings. The size and clarity of the gems was astounding. Praveen was not the same kind of jewelry connoisseur as her sister-in-law. She suddenly wished Gulnaz was with her. The earrings and the pendant all are made with four carat emeralds from Burma and two carat diamonds from India. The bangles are studded with five single carat emeralds and five single carat diamonds each. Sakina's eyes glowed as she looked up at Praveen. Praveen still couldn't guess how much wealth was lying in front of them. Have you had an appraisal done? Never. As a young bride, I saw how much my husband valued me with this gift. But now he is gone, and there is no use for such extravagant jewellery. It's better to gift it all to the wakf. Praveen nodded, taking note of what Sakina thought about her late husband's feelings. Perhaps Praveen's earlier thoughts of love between the husband and his three wives had been too sentimental. She wrote in her notebook, Consented. Now, what about the five thousand rupees that are coming to you as the second half of the Maher payment? That can go to the wakf. All of us are giving it up. We've agreed. Perhaps Sakina's attitude was natural in a joint family with multiple wives and children. Everything was shared. But Praveen sensed the widow didn't understand the implications of giving up such an asset. How much have you heard about the rules of Muslim charitable trusts? Sakina gave an apologetic smile. Razia is the one who concerned herself with it. She doesn't speak much of it to me. I suppose the best thing is for you to read it. I brought the official document explaining the walk's purpose, including the shares distributed to your family. It's in English, though. Smiling again, she said, Just explain it to me, then. Praveen summarized the wakf's purpose of contributing 15,000 rupees each year toward necessities and continuing care for wounded army veterans. As she'd discussed with Mr. Mukri, the wakf paid each of the Farid wives 1,001 rupees per year. The same allotment would be granted to each of the Farid children, from the age of eighteen onward. At the end of the complicated report, Sakina sighed. Fifteen thousand is a lot, isn't it? When my husband was alive, he donated to the wakf every year. Perhaps he was too generous. The trouble is how to keep funding the wakf with his income gone. There will still be income flowing to you. He didn't sell the company. Praveen explained, surprised she hadn't known that. Did Mukri Saab mention a plan for the wakf to start a madrasa? Yes, he spoke of it when we met at the Jolly Screen last month. It is a sensible thing to do since the war is over. Also, so many poor Muslim boys cannot afford schooling. Praveen looked at Sakina's open, sweet face and wondered whether her own schooling had ended at age fifteen when she'd married, or even earlier. Gently, Praveen said, Literacy is valuable for both boys and girls. Did you know the literacy rate for Muslim girls in India is less than two percent? My girls will read well, she retorted. They must learn the important prayers and to converse politely in Hindustani and Urdu. They also learn stitching and fine needlepoint from me. 
Amina is learning different things, Praveen said, watching her for a reaction. Sakina smiled. It is her mother's choice, and she had the advantage of a governess for more years of study. After the estate is settled and we know our financial situation, Mukri Saab can seek a new governess. But in the meantime, Razia and I can give them their religious training. Parveen realized Sakina could not picture a life for girls different than what she knew in her home. I understand you trust Mukri Saab greatly. However, there's a problem with his desire to use the wakf to fund a school. The law is written so that a wakf cannot change its charitable purpose. Because the wakf was defined as a foundation to benefit injured veterans, only a judge can allow the funds to go elsewhere. Sakina was silent for a moment. Then she looked at Praveen. Does this mean a lawyer could help us? You could do that? Praveen shifted uncomfortably on the settee. How could she answer? Of course, she was there to do all she could to help the family. However, she couldn't go against the law. Such work would be done in steps. Firstly, the plan to change a beneficiary for a wakf must be ordered by the mutawali, the person who is the wakf administrator, and then comes the decision to hire a lawyer. Mukri Saab has already done the first part by speaking to you, hasn't he? Sakina queried. Praveen saw that Sakina was missing the obvious point. Actually, he's not in charge. Razia Begum has always been the wakf's mutawali. Sakina looked as if she'd been punched. Taking a shaky breath, she said, What do you mean? Razia helps with the wakf, but it was my husband's foundation, and now Mukri Saab has naturally taken it over. No, her name is listed in the paper as the Mutawali, the administrator in charge of everything. Sakina still looked disbelieving. A woman can do that? Mohammedan law allows for a mutawali to be any religion or gender. I shall ask Razia Begum about whether she thinks both missions can be accomplished. I imagine that if she looks at the accounting, she might realize two projects could deplete the wakf's funding. Sakina's look toward Praveen was pleading. What should we do, then? Praveen felt awkward because she could not steer Sakina, and her confused, unhappy state was clearly the result of the new information. One thing at a time. Do you still wish to give up all of your mahar to the wakf? I don't know. Her voice was shaky, as if she were about to cry. I'm terribly sorry to have surprised you like this, Sakina Begum. Praveen was belatedly realizing her explanation of Razia's status could become the start of a family feud. I thought this was something you already knew. Sakina wiped a tear from her face. Now I understand why you wanted to speak to each of us alone. Two of us have bad news, and only one person good. Praveen felt apprehensive. What does that mean? Looking down, Sakina murmured, I thought our late husband had treated all of us well. But if he gave Razia the wakf, it means she was his favorite. And how can she decide sensibly on matters when she knows even less about the world than Mumtaz and I do? Mumtaz had surely experienced hard times if she'd had to support herself as a musician. She had to be street smart, although her illiteracy would prohibit her from being able to perform the tasks of a mutawali. But Praveen couldn't understand why Sakina felt so righteous about her own powers. Sakina Begum, weren't you raised inside a zanana? 
Yes, but our compound in Puna was large and always filled with relatives coming and going. It was a happy place. I learned everything from my father, my brothers, and cousins. She broke off, her face pinkening. Sakina probably was embarrassed to give the impression she was brought up with more freedom than she had now. Trying to sound understanding, Praveen said, That must have been a happy time for you. Softly, she said, Children are happiest if they grow up playing with many sisters and brothers. For this reason, I want my daughters and son to live with Amina and their aunts. That is why the Wakf must stay strong. It keeps us together. No one of us wives should have power over the others. Perveen put her hand over Sakina's, thinking she now understood why the second wife had referred to the senior wife by first name only. Although as a lawyer in service to the family, she herself could not. We can't change your husband's decision to give guardianship of the wakf to Razia Begum. I urge you to speak with her about whether there's any change in her intentions for the wakf. Take time to decide whether to sign over your assets. If you don't give your jewelry and money to the Mahur, they could be financial security for you or an inheritance for your daughters. Sakina flicked off Perveen's hand to take up the emerald necklace. She turned the elaborate piece this way and that, so its stones flashed in the soft light coming through the jolly. To Perveen, it didn't look as if Sakina wanted to lose it. But she'd already made the point about choice, and the choice was the widow's. Perveen withdrew one of her business cards from her briefcase and laid it on the silver tray next to the glass of Faluda that Sakina hadn't touched. My card has telephone numbers for my house and office, and also my mailing address. I'm able to come back if you'd rather speak in person. Sakina shook her head. As Perveen took hold of her briefcase and stood to take her leave, she studied the woman who'd stopped putting her jewelry away. Sakina was running her emerald necklace gently through her hands, as if weighing something a good deal heavier than twenty-four carats. Chapter 10 Secrets Between Wives Bombay, February 1921 Opening the bedroom door into the hall, Perveen almost tumbled over Amina. Razia's daughter was sitting against the wall and looked up with an innocent expression. I shall walk you to my mother's room. Won't you please speak more English with me? You couldn't understand my Hindi just now? Perveen asked, challenging her to deny the eavesdropping. Yes, but I want to learn English. Perveen was intrigued by the girl's attitude. Why is that? Amina paused. Ami went to a school. The teacher spoke English. Maybe one day I'll also go to school. Razia must have been listening for them, because after they rounded the corner into the next hallway, she appeared in an arched doorway. Please come in, Perveen Bibi. I've had a pot of tea brought up. Perveen knew that turning down a drink offered by any of the wives would be a slight. How kind of you. Just a small cup, please. I shall pour, Amina said, hurrying to a tea table set with gold-banded mint and china. Razia's room was slightly smaller than Sakina's, but had the advantage of being on a corner, with windows on two sides cross-ventilating it. Its aged plaster walls were covered with framed sketches and tinted photographs of the Taj Mahal and some significant Bombay buildings, Victoria Terminus, the Secretariat, and the Haji Ali Dargah Mosque. While Sakina's centerpiece had been her large, elegant bed, 
Razia's room held twin beds covered by cotton patchwork quilts. The room's piece of pride appeared to be a large mahogany partner's desk with a Queen Anne-styled chair on each side. One side of the desk was covered with children's books and colored wax pencils and pieces of chalk. The other had a stack of ledgers on a blotter and a stack of stationery and a line of old-fashioned fountain pens and ink bottles. Praveen could imagine the mother and daughter working together, the same way she and her father did in the law office. Amina carefully carried two cups of tea over to a wide teak swing that hung from the ceiling by silk-covered cords. The swing was wide enough to seat at least four people. It hung close to the veranda, which was enclosed by a cast-iron jolly that offered a hint of the blue sky and green trees outside. Praveen had more to discuss with Razia than anyone, but she was determined not to rush. As she seated herself on the swing next to Razia, she decided to speak in Hindi to be certain all she said was understood. I appreciate your agreeing to speak with me, but wouldn't Amina like to join the other children for the music lesson? It's a simple song. I know it already. Amina stamped her feet as she made her way to the desk and sat down with her cup of tea. She kept her eyes on her mother. Razia looked shyly at Praveen. I don't mind if she's here. Amina helps me with my papers and knows all that I do. And it's her legacy we will talk about. Praveen sipped the tea, which was blisteringly hot and sweet. Trying not to wince, she realized she could not go against a client's wish when she was trying to make a reassuring impression. Very well. But, Amina, I am going to teach you a word in English. It is confidential. Confidential, Amina repeated back slowly. The meaning? Looking intently at the girl, Praveen said, The word confide is a verb that means trusting another person enough to tell them something one doesn't like telling many others. The lawyer that you share such talk with does not tell others unless you've given permission. And that is how this conversation should be, for your mother's sake. It's secret, Amina said in English. Why not say that? Perveen drank again to allow herself a moment to think of a sensible explanation. Secrets are often about bad things. We are not trying to hide something bad. And it seems to me that secrets almost always wind up being told. Agreed. There are few secrets inside a Zanana, Razia said with a weary half-smile. Perveen considered saying to Razia that she'd been very good at withholding the information that she ran the wakf from Sakina, but it wouldn't have been a tactful way to start their conversation. Thank you for granting me this time. It must be a very difficult time since your husband's passing. Razia shrugged her thin shoulders. Actually, it's not different than the last two years. This surprised Perveen, who'd painted a picture in her head of Razia as the most devoted wife. Tell me about the last two years. After Dr. Ibrahim diagnosed cancer, my husband began going in the evenings to Falkland Road. Mukri Saab brought him. There he found relief of some sort. Razia leaned back and started the swing slowly rocking. He no longer stayed with me much. Then he brought a musician who worked there home. This was Mumtaz. He began to stay in her room only, so we could not see much of him. Perveen was astounded Razia had spoken in front of Amina about Falkland Road, an area known not only for music, but prostitution and drugs. But the Farid females lived in seclusion, so Razia might not have understood. 
Not seeing your husband during that time must have pained your heart. Razia looked thoughtful. I'd lost him once before, when Sakina came, she said quietly. That was the time when he appointed me Mutawali of the Wakf. I think he wanted me to be busy, to have something. And it has been worthwhile work, but it seemed terribly wrong that I devoted myself to getting good care for wounded men all over India. But my husband didn't want my care. Parveen looked over at the desk, where Amina was fiddling with the items before her. Pens, pencils, a letter opener. She wasn't looking at her mother, but Parveen thought she was listening closely. Razia brought her heels down on the floor, stopping the swing. Parveen, Bibi, do you wish me to sign a new paper? Mukri Saab said the document we signed was not enough. Certainly, Parveen said, picking up her briefcase. Are you the one who had the idea of shifting all the wives' maher into the wakf? She shook her head. Mukri Saab spoke of it to me last week, explaining the financial duress we are under, and said we should give more to the wakf. As our guardian, he suggested we all put our maher into the wakf. I thought it was a sensible idea, because we can do good for others, yet not worry we will lose our home. What is the current endowment? Come, I'll show you. Razia stood and walked to the partner's desk. Pulling out a large book, she opened it and showed Perveen columns of withdrawals. It looks like there are 107,000 rupees, and the last addition to the endowment was two years ago. My husband was very set on building the endowment during the war years, when our mills were running day and night. We are losing ground because every year 15,000 flows to the veterans and 3,000 to us wives. The family payout will rise to 7,000 rupees per year, after the children come of age. Razia understood the mathematics, but how far into the future had she thought? At the rate you're giving, the endowment could all be gone in a few years, Praveen said. Razia's expression was grave. I know. There were so many things Praveen had to share with Razia, but first in her mind was what would happen if even more than 15,000 flowed out per year. Have you estimated the extra expense of building the madrasa? Razia's eyes widened. Madrasa? What do you mean? Praveen had a sinking feeling she was spilling another secret, but this one needed to be known by the Waks Mutawali. Mukri Saab told me the Wak funds will build a madrasa for boy students. He plans to hire teachers soon and open this year. Razia was silent for a long moment. When her words came, they were spoken in a grim undertone. I... I am shocked. He did not speak of any madrasa when he gathered us to ask for signatures for the Wakf donations. Sakina had known. Was it because Mr. Mukri had told her, perhaps favoring her as the leader of the wives? Mukri Saab told me, Parveen said, trying not to reveal the unease she felt. It was the reason he wished everyone's maher to be transferred quickly. I suppose that if we gave all the maher we had... There might be enough money to support two projects for a short time. Razia's voice was grave. But truly, our wakf is for helping wounded veterans. Parveen needed to know more. It sounds as if the Foundation's mission is still important to you. How did it come about? It began with the war, Razia said shifting her feet so the swing rocked back and forth again. 
1915, the government requested that Farid Fabrics produce thousands of bolts of khaki cotton drill cloth. For my husband, it was good business. But in my mind, we were dressing men so that they could fight and very likely be wounded or killed. I didn't like that. It's sad to die, Amina commented in her know-it-all tone from her post at the desk. So sad for the people you leave behind. Although if one leads a righteous life, he goes to heaven. I was haunted by the thought that men wouldn't have been able to go into battle without our uniforms. Razia was rocking the swing steadily now. We can do nothing for the poor souls who died, more than seventy thousand from India alone. But the least we should do is give clothing, wheelchairs, and other necessary supplies to the wounded, and extend help to their families, since military pensions aren't sufficient for living. Razia's words reminded Parveen of how she and Alice had seen the condition of some wounded veterans who were housed in some of Oxford's halls. It had been horrifying to see their injuries— what are some of the ways you have provided aid to Muslim veterans? We help all the Indian army soldiers, regardless of religion. The soldier only needs a commanding officer or hospital worker or chaplain to ask. I know one, Captain Arif Ali, who has made it possible to help many of his troops and others beside. May I show you some of his letters? Razia went to a tall bookcase and brought back a heavy album with a letter pasted to each page. As Perveen leafed through, she saw the letters were written in a variety of scripts, Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, English, and Tamil. Captain Ali had written many letters of his own, too, in English, likely because everything he wrote was subject to review by a commanding officer. Your kind transfer of a hundred rupees of May 1918 was most appreciated. I was able to purchase clothing for five veterans, ten walking sticks, and three wheelchairs. Per your suggestion, I am continuing to provide men returning home with a gift of one hundred rupees to spend as they see fit at home, and encouraging family members with special needs to submit claims with specific details. Perveen turned the page and read another letter from Captain Ali. Your payment for the schooling of Private Bhatia's son and daughter was received with heartfelt tears from Mr. Bhatia. His wife has sent a heartfelt letter to you that I am including with this. Mrs. Farid... Your continuing questions to me about the needs of family members are no trouble at all for me. They have given me a greater understanding of the character of my men and how much they gave up to serve the government. After the war ended, Captain Ali came to this house to pay his respects to my husband and me and explain about the ongoing need. Even though the war is over, soldiers are still coming out of hospital and have needs for equipment and physical therapy that are beyond what the army can give. Captain Ali came to talk to army a few weeks ago, but Mukri Saab did not allow it, Amina said, repeating the story Perveen had heard from Sakina. It is Idat, Razia said crisply to her daughter. I saw the captain through the Jali army. He is handsome as a king. Amina, her mother reproved. Perveen thought the women deserved to talk through the jolly with men who had legitimate household business, but that was tangential to the matter at hand. Razia Begum, because you are the Mutawali, all decisions about the waqf are yours. In any matter, the court will likely be hesitant to change the recipient of the waqf's monies. I'm advising you based on previous cases decided by the court. Razia looked almost angrily at her. You speak as if it's a simple matter. How can I push my wishes on Mukri Saab? 
Don't think of it in such terms, Praveen said gently. Your husband appointed him to serve the family. Mukri Saab is the agent for the household, which means he stands as the man of the house. He manages everything. If he doesn't like my behavior, what might he do the next time he goes to the bank to withdraw funds for us? The bankers allow him full privileges. Praveen was suddenly uneasy. She'd seen Razia's ledger, but it was a handwritten account. Mr. Mukri could already be withdrawing money without Razia knowing it. What could happen with the allowances for food and clothing if he's unhappy? Razia's voice rose. Will there be money to pay for electric lighting in the house? For the fans to run? Already the children lost their governess. What are you thinking, Miss Mystery? Your face is so angry. Are you upset with Ami? Amina's voice was anxious. No, I'm not angry. These situations happen all the time with household agents. Praveen tried to relax her jaw. Her thoughts had turned to the possibility of the widows filing a suit for the removal of Faisal Mukri. The best chance of success would be if all of them agreed to participate, and they had hard evidence of malfeasance. It would take at least a month to prepare, and such a case could take months to reach court. And what would their living situation be like in the meantime? There are so many things you can do, she continued, picking up the Maher contract that had not yet been discussed. We should discuss the issue of the dower that was promised to you when you married. A small amount of swampland near the mill district, Razia said dismissively. I don't think it's worth much. Actually, it is. The land was filled in, and two company mills stand on it. Razia's shoulders jerked in surprise. She looked hard at Praveen, as if trying to figure out if the words were true. Does this mean Ami owns the factories herself? Amina asked, her voice rising in excitement. A court would decide, Praveen said, looking at Razia, who was still speechless. The promise is in the Maha letter. However, your husband didn't ever change the title on the land. But it can be done. You would have to instruct me or another lawyer to go forward. Razia was silent for a while longer, then took a long, shuddering breath. I don't know if that's a good idea. My husband was using the land for the company, which benefits all of us in the family. Why should there be concern? Her words gave Praveen the spark of an idea that could protect the wakf. Leaning forward, she said, If the land is not titled to you, you cannot donate it. Razia gave her an incredulous glare. Sakina has her jewelry gift and Mumtaz the instruments. They are giving up these things. How will it look if I give nothing? Listening to her, Praveen realized that perhaps the widows were close enough that they all used first names. Such a relationship might make Razia feel especially bad about having more. For each of you, it's an individual decision. And knowing what you do... Would you want to give up this land to the Mahar, or would you like to retain it as an asset for the protection of your daughter and yourself? Razia hesitated again before speaking. Sakina will be very jealous to know I have land with factories. And what about Muntaz? She takes joy in her musical instruments, but they are worth little next to what I have. I wish to be confidential about the factories on the land. It seems there are a great number of confidences that are being kept in this house. Sakina Begum didn't even know you were the Waks Mutawali. If she had asked, I would have told her. Razia sounded almost flippant. But she had no interest. She enjoyed a rich life with my husband for many years. 
She never knew what it felt like to be ignored until Mumtaz came. Praveen winced, realizing her earlier assumption of closeness had been naive. Jealousy and resentment were the running themes in this household of women. Razia Begum, it seems that you are chained to some people and a large old house that you cannot fully enjoy. Razia looked warily at Praveen. Is that not the meaning of family? A shiver ran through Praveen. A few years earlier, she had felt exactly the same. Pushing away that memory, she said, You three have the right to sell this house and share the proceeds. This would enable you all to live at ease, wherever you might choose. Perhaps you would like to see your natal family again. Or you could rent one of the new flats with seaside views, right here in Malabar Hill. Razia gave her a withering look. A woman like you could live without protection. But I have no experience in the world. I have to worry about Amina's safety, and the danger to me too. This is all so difficult. I don't know what to do about the Mahar. And what you've told me about the wakf is distressing. Tell Mr. Mukri that he needs to speak with me. I'll explain the needful, Parveen said, handing her a business card. I shall leave the translated copy of the Mahra document for you to keep. Write to me if you wish to talk again. Although I hear you have a telephone on the other side of the house. Both my telephone numbers are listed on the card. Razia studied the card and put it in the central drawer on her side of the partner's desk. So now you are going to Muntaz. Packing up her briefcase, Praveen said, What is your relationship like with her, now that she's no longer caring for your husband? It's all right, Razia said with a shrug. She nursed my husband without complaint, and she has been a good help with our girls. Mumtaz Hala is my favorite aunt, Amina said. She says I'm very good on the Veena. You must not say such things about favorites. We are one family, Razia chided. Amina set her mouth in a firm line. Wanting to cut off an argument, Perveen gestured to the jolly. I hear beautiful music playing outside. I wonder whether that is Mumtaz Begum or the little ones. Mumtaz Hala, of course. May I bring you there? Amina asked eagerly. Praveen smiled at her. I'd be grateful for your guidance. Is it really safe for women to live outside? Amina asked, after they'd left the Zanana's second floor and were going down the stairs. I've been fine. More or less, she thought. May I ask you another thing, Bervin Hala? Of course. Will you be confidential with me? Stopping her progression down the stairs, Praveen looked at Amina. I will, unless it's something your mother must know to care for you better. Amina looked at her intently. I love my whole family very much, but... But what? Praveen prodded gently. I would like to go and live somewhere else, like you said. Praveen asked. Do you wish to see the outside world? Everything in the pictures on your walls? The child hung her head. In a whisper, she said, I don't want to live here because of Mukri Saab. Fear rose up around Praveen like a chilly wall. Why? Has he... Has he ever laid a hand on you? Amina shook her head, but remained silent. Praveen had to figure it out. Does he speak cruelly? Threaten you in any way? He speaks terribly to my mother and me. But don't tell him we said this, or things will be worse. 
Amina started walking quickly, as if she regretted starting the conversation. Perveen followed her down the rest of the stairs. Amina, does your mother feel as troubled about this as you do? I'm not troubled. I wish death upon him. Ami is too good, too quiet. She is afraid. Razia's response to the idea of challenging Mr. Mukri on the wakf had already proven that. But perhaps there was more, something that could be used in a case against him. What has he done to make your mother afraid? I can't say now. It is confidential. Nasreen and Shireen are here. Amina had run ahead into the garden, holding out her arms for the younger two to rush forward into them. She embraced her half-sisters, laughing as if her short, disturbing confession had never taken place. Chapter 11 Concert in the Garden Bombay, February 1921 Putting on a calm face, Praveen followed Amina and her half-sisters to the thin carpet spread out in a stone pavilion where several instruments were arranged. Praveen seated herself on a stone bench and watched Amina take a teacher's place to the side of the two little girls. While Amina played with confident dexterity, Nasreen and Shireen were too small for their hands to range very far across the long wooden instruments. The girls plucked randomly. Perveen let her thoughts wander. At that moment, she had no request from Razia or Sakina to donate their mahar. Their explanations made it seem that Mukri was intent on both controlling and altering the wakf. There was a case for removing Mukri as the household agent, but it would have to be done very carefully so as not to cause trouble for the widows. The girls finished with a wild, twanging sound, and Perveen hastily applauded. Beautiful singing and playing. Muntaz Begum has taught you well. But where is she? She went under the almond tree to sleep. Shireen pointed to a grouping of trees. Perveen didn't see Mumtaz, so she stood. I'll look for her. She shouldn't have felt anxious, but she did. Quickly, Perveen moved toward the grove of fruit trees. Just past them, she saw a bit of grey. Mumtaz was lying slumped against a stone step on the other side of the garden, close to a marble jolly. Perveen's stomach lurched. Calling out, she asked Amina to bring a glass of water from the house. Nasreen and Shireen launched into their next song, seeming utterly unconcerned. Perveen went swiftly to the woman and crouched down to gently touch her shoulder. My dear, are you all right? Mumtaz groaned and slowly turned her head. I was just resting, but I feel ill. You must go inside. Perveen let out the breath she'd been holding, relieved that the widow was strong enough to speak. She'd thought the worst when she'd seen the gray heap. No, no. It is my time to play music with the girls. I was only taking a rest for a moment. With Praveen's help, Mumtaz struggled to a sitting position. Amina is bringing water to you, Praveen said. Would you like some sweets? No, no, but you, you are our honored guest, Mumtaz croaked. You must have refreshment. Praveen was too worried to continue the etiquette dance. I'm already full with tea and faluda. There's no need for anything more. It doesn't seem that you are well enough to talk with me. We can do that later. Mumtaz peered at her through half-open eyes. I must speak with you and... and fix things. The words she'd chosen sounded strange. Perveen asked, What do you know about the situation? If I give the wakf my money, 
It will let me keep living in this bungalow. Who told you that? Sakina Begum says if we give the wakf our money, it will keep us living in the bungalow forever. Mumtaz lowered her voice. Isn't that true? Not exactly. Parveen paused. Did you read the paper that was sent to me by Mukri Saab and sign your name? Her eyelids fluttered. Why do you ask? You signed an X on your Maha agreement seven months ago. Praveen was careful not to mention this was what illiterate people did. But your name was spelled out on a paper that he sent to me. I did the X for Maha because my writing is poor. Sakina Begum signed the other paper because it would look better. The court accepted documents signed with fingerprints and X markings, but that was irrelevant to bring up. As Praveen understood it, Mr. Mukri had told Sakina to get the authorization from Mumtaz, but had Sakina explained everything so that Mumtaz realized what she was giving up? If you feel well enough, I'd like to talk to you about what was in the letter, Praveen said as Amina arrived and crouched down to give Mumtaz a brass tumbler of water. Thank you, sweet Amina, Mumtaz said with a sigh. Amina settled down next to them. In a whisper, she said, Parveen Hala and Mumtaz Hala, you should know. Amina, please tell me later when I finish this talk. Will you go listen to the girls? Although Razia had allowed her daughter to be present during her consultation, Praveen was determined not to compromise Mumtaz's privacy. After Amina had slunk off, shooting her a look of annoyance, Praveen began. The document Sakina signed for you said that you wished to give up your musical instruments and 5,000 rupees for the family's wakf, which is a charitable foundation— Lose my musical instruments? She didn't say. Mumtaz's mouth fell open in an O of surprise. Don't worry, Praveen said, responding in her most soothing tone to the stunned young woman. If any wife wants to give up her mahar, she must write her own letter saying that. You haven't done so yet. Music was what calmed my husband. He could only fall asleep when I played. Mumtaz closed her eyes, as if to summon back those nights. The sitars and veenas are as dear to me as Amina, Nasreen, Shireen, and Jamjam are to their mothers. That's fine, Praveen said, glad that the decision had been easy. I'll make sure you won't relinquish any musical instruments. I don't mind about the five thousand rupees. Mumtaz pinched her mouth into a pious expression. Whatever little bit I receive from the wakf is enough. Praveen was curious about the words she'd chosen to describe her wakf dividend. The charitable fund pays each of you wives one thousand and one rupees a year to use as wished, for savings or personal expenses. Did you receive that sum last year? No. Razia Begum said five hundred and one was the proper amount for being married only one half of the year. Isn't that true? Mumtaz pushed the hair back from her face, as if she wanted to get a better look at Perveen. She had high cheekbones and a face shape slightly similar to Razia's. Perhaps Mr. Farid had loved her for this similarity, as well as the music. Razia Begum is correct in her accounting because you married him last July. Praveen thought the senior wife's decision was stingy, but she didn't share this opinion. You will also receive some inheritance from the estate, but I won't know the amount for several more weeks. Mumtaz nodded. But what about the five thousand? 
Mukri Sahab said, because I can't save money, it is better for me not to take it, but to put it into the wakf. Praveen wasn't surprised by Mukri's recommendation, but she was wondering if it was true Mumtaz was bad with money. What is this about you not saving? Holding her palms up, Mumtaz smiled ruefully. Money is like sand running through my fingers. From the walk for money I received in December, I've less than one hundred rupees left. This struck Praveen as suspicious. But you live inside a house, going nowhere. Were you charged for food or household expenses? The special foods I like that are expensive, pomegranates and fresh dates. I've bought new strings for my instruments, too, and some saris and kaftans. A lady tailor came around, and her materials were so fine, more expensive than I realized. That is why my morning saris are so plain. Nodding, Praveen realized that the water was doing the trick. It was giving Mumtaz the strength to speak with her. I also ordered some furniture from a carpenter who comes through the street every month. Mumtaz continued in a whispery tone. I wanted my room to look just a little bit like Sakina Begum's. My room is not a sick room any more. If I spend the rest of my life here, why shouldn't my room be pretty? I agree. Praveen had not realized that a person's illness could saturate a room so much. But, she reflected, she should know. She thought of the rank odor of the little room upstairs at the Sodawala house, and her head started to ache. Quickly, she changed the subject. Are you happy here? Are the other Begums friendly to you? What wife would welcome a woman of my background coming in as the new wife? Mumtaz said in a low voice. Sakina Begum was jealous, even though my arrival meant she didn't have to nurse her sick husband at all. And Razia Begum is her senior, thinking she is better than both of us, and so clever with all her letter writing. Praveen could have soothed Mumtaz and said that things might get better with time. But looking at the twenty-year-old girl with such fragile ties to the other wives and little more than three instruments to her name, she did not feel like saying that. Mumtaz Begum, would you be happier living here or somewhere else? Do you mean go away? Mumtaz's voice broke. Even though I'm a wife? You would still be a respected widow. But think of all the possibilities, Praveen said gently. You could use the second part of your mahar to pay for a small bungalow or house. And you'll also have your inheritance. If the neighborhood is a good one, you could also use your residence as a music school and... Stop your scheming! Instinctively, Praveen turned her head, looking for the origin of the harsh male voice that had interrupted. Nobody was visible, but Mumtaz was staring with a stricken expression at the house wall just fifteen feet away. On the other side of the garden, the girl stopped playing music. Mukri Saab, are you there? Praveen called out to him while she looked at the thick wall. She guessed was attached to the house's main wing. There were no windows. From where was he listening? I trusted you to carry out work for me, and you have abused that by feeding the widows falsehoods. You are a devil. On the contrary, it's my duty to ensure this family's welfare. Praveen was shaking slightly from the shock of realizing he'd overheard her. Telling a foolish woman not to sign a paper that would secure this household's future is against the welfare of the widows. I am hereby severing your representation. Excuse me, Mukri Saab. Parveen enunciated every word to the utmost. 
You should not shout at me. I shall come into the main house and speak with you. Praveen tried to still her trembling and went from the garden into the Zanana entrance, where she came upon Amina and the girls huddled together. He's angry at me, not you. I must talk to him to make my responsibility clear. Praveen put on her sandals with shaky fingers. This was a terrible outcome of the confidential interviews. I tried to say to you that he'd come home. Amina's voice was choked. But you made me go away. I regret I did not listen, Praveen said grimly. Where are the other Begums? Did he question them? A tear slid down Amina's cheek. I don't know. I was doing as you said, just listening to Nasreen and Shireen playing. Are you going home now? Not until I have a discussion with him and make sure that your mother and aunt are all right. Praveen strode outdoors and under the port cochere, where Armand was lounging against the car, spinning his chauffeur's cap idly in his hands. Ready to go, Memsab? His neutral expression told her he'd heard none of what had happened. I'll just go over to the other side to speak to Mr. Mukri. Bring the car around to the main entrance. I shan't be long. The main door was closed. When she knocked, it was opened by Zaid. He looked as anxious as the little girls had been. I've come to see Mukri Saab. She did not offer to take off her shoes, but stood in the entrance of the reception room. She wanted to remain near the exit, because she couldn't be sure of the extent of the Guardian's anger. As Zaid crept out of the reception room, Mr. Mukri came barreling in. He wore a European suit, likely because he'd come from the office. That's where he told her he would be. We've some matters to clear up, Mukri Saab. I believed myself to be having a private consultation with the Begum. I'm willing to address... Shameless. His eyes narrowed. You disregarded my directive as the operating household trustee. And what stupid advice. These women can't leave home. They wouldn't know what to do. I am not trying to cause trouble. It is my duty to give them a full understanding of their assets and how the law works to protect them. Parveen delivered her words loudly, realizing that Razia and Sakina might be listening. You cannot decide what happens with the Wakf. You are not in charge of it. How dare you speak of being in charge? Mukri's voice was contemptuous. You are not even accredited by the Bombay Bar. You have no power in the court. Praveen realized he must have looked into her background and had prepared to fight. His insulting declaration was intended to scare the Begums into thinking she couldn't defend them. Drawing herself up to her full five feet three inches, Praveen said, The women on the other side of the Jali are not weak. They hold more power in their six hands than you have in two. I have it in mind to terminate your association with this household based on your attempts to manipulate their assets. He advanced toward her. I am the only one who can do sacking. I have power of attorney to decide the household's course. Leave this place at once and do not return. I will telephone your father and tell him that mystery law has been terminated. When you arrive home, prepare yourself for a proper beating. A beating? Parveen defiantly met his gaze. My father is a good man, so that is not a fear of mine. Is that so? He walked up very close to her and raised a flattened palm. In that awful instant, she knew he was going to hit her. He meant to prove that he was stronger than her words, that he had rights over her as well as the others. He would hit her again and again. Pain flashed through her, and suddenly she wasn't in Malabar Hill, but a bottling plant more than a thousand miles away. Just as suddenly she was back. 
the surly Durwan had appeared at the door. Loudly, he said, Sab, excuse me. Mukri snarled. What is this? The Durwan was a godsend. Perveen used that moment of distraction to slide out the door. The car was under the porte cochere, and Armand was anxiously motioning her to get in. Mimsab, it is not my custom to ask about your business matters, Armand said, after they'd turned the corner past Alice's house and were going down the hill. But that was a terrible fight. I never expected that man to be listening. Perveen put a hand to her chest, which was still vibrating with fear. He was very angry. I heard the shouting and called out to the Dirwan. He said that man is crazy. Did he touch you? Your father won't forgive me for my lack of protection. Armand's voice broke. Perveen hesitated, still feeling jumbled. Her back ached as if she'd been hit with a series of blows. How could that be? She knew Mr. Mukri had been in front of her. What he had done was break through to memory. What did he do, Memsab? Armand was looking anxiously in the rearview mirror. He shouted, and then he tried to get me to cower. Some men use fear to get what they want, and I'm sorry to say that he raised enough worry in me to make me run away. It is not running away. It is self-defense. I meant to check on the Begums. I left without doing it. Now I won't know if he approached them and forced them to say what I told them. A lump rose in her throat. I didn't keep my word. Sometimes Mistry Saab's clients have been angry with him. Usually it is after losing at court. Thankfully that doesn't happen often. Praveen sighed because Mr. Mukri had been right in guessing that her father would be upset. In less than two hours, she'd turned a straightforward series of private consultations with women who'd never met a lawyer into a dramatic conflict. Perhaps Mr. Mukri really could fire Mystery Law, and then she'd never have access to speak to the Begums again. As they turned off Malabar Hill and onto the Queen's Necklace, Perveen's thoughts became even more miserable. What if it really was true that Faisal Mukri had power of attorney? She'd seen a paper certifying him as the family's agent, but not granting him power of attorney, which was significantly stronger. Had she missed it? What kind of a solicitor was she not to have taken this into account? Perveen reached beside her for a briefcase, but felt nothing. Damnation! she cried. What is it, Perveen Memsab? I left my briefcase behind. The fancy London briefcase? It must be worth a lot. It's what's inside that matters, Perveen said, sickened by this additional evidence of her carelessness. All those documents! I must go back. Armand sucked air through his teeth. I don't know. The gentleman was so angry. Shouldn't you ask your father to return for the briefcase, for safety's sake? We cannot wait, because the papers inside my briefcase could be stolen or destroyed. It would be terrible for my clients. You must turn around, Arman. But, Mem Saab, I am ordering you. Perveen's voice cracked. Arman didn't answer but his shoulders rose as if Perveen's harsh words had affected him deeply. They were already a mile down the seafront. Armand slowed, crossing the road sharply in front of a bus that sounded its horn. He turned around on the rough ground of a construction site and started back for Malabar Hill. Perveen checked her watch. They'd left Malabar Hill twenty minutes earlier. It would be twenty more minutes before they got back at least— as they went back up the incline, past the beautiful mansions, surrounded by tall trees, every twisting road increased Perveen's feeling of dread. It would be wonderful luck if her briefcase was still in the Zanana garden. But she had no idea of the safety of the women. Did she dare to stop to check on them, too? 
She had to. It would mean a visit longer than five minutes, but she would be negligent if she didn't make sure they knew she could help them get away from Faisal Mukri. I want you to go boss the bungalow, Praveen said to Armand when they approached Seaview Road. Why? Armand sounded uneasy. I don't want us to have to ask the Durwan for admission into the property. I will go inside on foot through the second gate, which is the one we use for reaching the Zanana. Musen can't guard more than one gate. He's always been at the one to the main house. But if it's the second gate you want, he will see you passing by in this car. I've thought of that. After you have dropped me off, past his line of vision, I'd then like you to drive back and create a distraction by stopping at the main gate. Then I'll walk in through the second gate. If it is open. That's a good point. If it is open, I shall go in. And when I'm finished, I'll walk back to the same place you dropped me. It sounds very complicated. And what will I say to distract him? Try to find out whatever you can about Mukri from him. I'm sure he's got something to say. To her surprise, Mosen wasn't even in sight when the car rolled past. Out of caution, Praveen told Armand to stop around the bend of the road. He didn't look happy, but he could not refuse an employer's command. The second gate had not been locked, so it was easy for Praveen to slip inside, although the Durwan at the bungalow on the opposite side of the road gave her a curious glance. She made an effort to stroll in looking like a relaxed, respectable person, the opposite of how she felt. Though she was on the property, she could not access the Zanana Garden, which was shielded by a high wall. She'd have to enter the garden the same way as before, through arched doors at the back of the Zanana's wide reception room, Parveen knocked at the Zanana door very lightly. There was no response, and she thought it too risky to call through the window as she'd done before. Tentatively, she put her hand on the knob, and it turned. She guessed that there had been too much commotion after her departure for Fatima to remember to lock up. Nobody was in the reception room, so she went silently into the garden, walking along the house's edge to avoid being seen by anyone looking out a window. The garden was deserted. Her briefcase wasn't where she'd sat in the pavilion and watched the little girls playing music, nor was it where the musical instrument still lay on the rug. Praveen rushed to the spot where she'd spoken with Mumtaz. No briefcase was there. She realized that she couldn't recall when she'd stopped carrying the case. She was almost certain that she brought it out of Razia's room, but she wasn't completely certain. Another possibility was that Mumtaz or Amina had spotted the briefcase after she'd left and taken it for safekeeping. At the Zanana entrance, Praveen peeked through a gap in the curtains. The room was still empty. She went in keeping her sandals in one hand, and eyed the staircase. It was empty, too, though she could hear the muffled sound of voices upstairs. She heard women talking and a young child bawling. Perhaps it was Jum Jum, the baby she hadn't yet seen. Praveen went up. At the edge of the first hallway, she stood, adjusting her awareness to sound. In Razia's room... She could hear a rumble of conversation, but the door was closed tightly enough that she could not distinguish anything except the fact there were three voices. Knowing that the three widows were together made it possible for her to check the other rooms before asking them about the briefcase. She passed the nursery, where Jum Jum's wails were subsiding, just as Shireen's and Nasreen's voices were rising. Why can't we? Shireen was saying. Perveen heard an older woman answer reprovingly, It's not for you. Sakina's bedroom sweet door was open. Inside, everything was as orderly as before. Even the silver tray was gone. 
Praveen looked under the bed and in drawers, and then lifted aside the picture to look at the locked safe door. The safe was certainly wide enough to accommodate the briefcase, but perhaps not deep enough. Being in Sakina's room alone made Praveen feel almost like a thief. She put her head out of the door, checking in the hallway for new sounds. Perhaps five minutes had passed since she had entered the room. It was too bad she didn't know which room was Mumtaz's. Praveen glanced toward the brass jolly that Sakina had said was the conversation place between the Zanana and main house. If Mr. Mukri chose to eavesdrop, he could only do so from there. That was the likely reason the wives were speaking in Razia's faraway bedchamber rather than Sakina's closer quarters. As Praveen studied the patterned brass border, a smear of red caught her eyes. A dash of red, reminding her of the kumkum Hindu and Parsi women used to make a decorative marking between the eyes. But this red marking was slashed across the brass metalwork, and there were droplets and smudges on the floor. It could not be vermilion powder. With a growing sense of worry, Praveen stepped out of the doorway, taking care not to touch any of the red droplets as she approached the screen. Squatting, she could make out a shadowy mass just below the document slot. Although she knew it was improper, Praveen lifted the long, wide brass lid that covered the slot. Her last calm thought was that this lid was about the same weight and size as the one on the mail slot in the door of Alice's ancestral London townhouse. Then she felt sick. On the other side, Mr. Mukri lay collapsed, arms and legs skewed wildly, as if he tried to escape but failed. Half under him was the edge of her Swain Aidney bridal leather document case— Blood covered the back of his head and collar and ran in thick rivulets down his black suit jacket. Something long and silver protruded from his neck. Was it a knife? She didn't care. She couldn't bear to look any longer. Praveen put her hand to her mouth and stepped back. If she hadn't looked through the slot, she wouldn't have known he was dead. Now it was too late. She was aware of this death and the responsibility that would follow. Nineteen Sixteen Chapter Twelve Bottling Promises Bombay, August, Nineteen Sixteen It was as if Cyrus had died and left her bereft, after they had spoken their hearts to each other in Bandra, Praveen didn't hear from him at all. She remained at the family bungalow, imagining one bad scenario after another. Cyrus must have told his parents about her and received a flat refusal. The Sodawalas could have been angry enough to take him back to Calcutta. Believing that was easier than contemplating the more obvious possibility, that Cyrus had not kept his word— his romantic declaration could have been a ruse to allow him to take his pleasure with her. Or perhaps he'd thought things through and decided the girl his parents wanted him to marry was the better choice. The other reason she was stuck at home was because of her parents' anger. At the Ripon Club on Friday afternoon, Jamshedji had awoken from his nap to overhear two lawyers gossiping about whether the government law school's first female student had been expelled or dropped out. That evening, she'd been called into the parlor to face him and her mother. Unable to look at them, Praveen had muttered, I meant to explain that day. I just couldn't think of the proper words. So you mounted a deception. You went into the city carrying books every day and were dropped at the college. What were you doing all those hours if you were not in class? Spending money, going to films, eating in restaurants? Jamshedji railed. You won't be going outside for a while, I'll tell you. I was in the library. Praveen's voice shook. 
I couldn't spend another day with the students and professors in the law school. Can't bear the law school? Now her father looked perplexed. But you are a top student. Nobody wanted me there. And they did all manner of things to make it hard for me to attend class, Parveen said. It's true, Camellia interjected. The students made life hard for her. She's mentioned some tricks they played, but that could have been addressed. Parveen was grateful for her mother's words, but she didn't want to create the impression that she wished to act against her classmates. It was more than tricks, and something happened every day. They killed my desire to study law. I'm sorry, Papa. But... Jamshedji's tense expression was replaced by a look of confusion. What, then? What do you want to be? Why do I have to be something? Can't I simply be myself? She couldn't declare the truth. I want to run away from here and become Cyrus's wife. She wasn't about to hit them with another scandalous confession, especially if it turned out the man she loved had vanished. But two days later, everything changed. It started with a phone call on Sunday evening from Grandfather Mystery. Perveen was the one who picked up, and when she heard his familiar gravelly voice, she braced herself. He typically called to complain about some trouble, his arthritis, a missed delivery from a tradesman, Mustafa's inadequate service. The Parsi family from Calcutta came to Mystery House and insisted on seeing your father. I told them he was out, and they left a letter. What nonsense could it be? He growled. The Gelsuppers said they are not looking for a lawyer. Perveen felt the hairs on her arms standing up. Bapawa? How many of them were there? Husband, wife, and a grown son. Mustafa admitted them. He said the son was most persuasive. I told him never to do such a thing again. I'm glad he did. They are very important people. Perveen relaxed into happiness, although she didn't understand why the Sodawalas had gone to Mystery House. She told Cyrus her home address. Perhaps the family had thought it important to pay respects to her grandfather first. Did you tell them to come here? Why should I send strangers to bother your father? Her grandfather answered crossly. I'll come for the letter then. You shall not travel about in the evenings. But I shall come to you with the letter if you like. He paused. What is John making for dinner? Prawn curry. Please come. I'm sure there's enough. Perveen suspected that he'd mainly called about the letter because he'd wanted to see them. Well and good. He'd get what he wanted, and maybe she would too. Perveen greeted her grandfather when he arrived in the hallway, asking him to reserve the letter for her father until after dinner. She knew that a hungry person was more likely to be feisty, and if her father and grandfather ate well and had a few drinks with dinner, their reactions might be better. After the last bit of pudding was finished, Perveen asked everyone to come into the parlor. She said, Baba Wa has brought an important letter. I have not read it, but I hear it concerns me. Goodness, Camellia said, brightening. Maybe it's from the law school, and there's some hope. Till the hen gets teeth, said Grandfather Mystery. The letter is from some Calcutta Parsis. Jamshedji opened the letter and put his monocle to his eye to read it. After he finished, he looked at the assembled family and shook his head. It's very odd. This is a request for a meeting at the Taj Mahal Hotel tomorrow afternoon 
to discuss a possible union for Paveen. With whom? Rustam, who had been sitting restlessly next to Grandfather Mystery, looked up. They're called the Sudawalas, Jamshedji said. A common enough name, but I can't think who these people are. I know them. Perveen delivered a heavily abridged account of meeting Cyrus at Elphinstone and Sassoon Library, and his presence at the group outing to the pictures. Camellia looked hard at her. Is that all? I heard a rumor you were seen walking out of Bandra Station with a young man. I said it couldn't possibly be, that you don't go about with men. It was the day he proposed, Perveen admitted with embarrassment. He couldn't very well propose to me with a chaperone there. This boy sounds loose at the drawstrings. Chamsheji's mouth pursed as if he'd bitten into a spoiled papaya. He's hardly immoral if he's looking for a bride, Perveen protested. Her father's swift disapproval was exactly what she'd feared. I'm supposed to marry first, and that's not happening for two years, isn't it? Rustam looked for confirmation from his parents. An older sibling should go first, Jamshedji assured him, all the while looking at Perveen through narrowed eyes. We shan't rush. It is better for you to have a higher position in the company before we look. Grandfather Mystery cleared his throat and said, If a younger sister marries before an older brother, people will believe she had to marry for reasons of pregnancy. Every bead of her reputation will be sold. We aren't like that. Perveen struggled to keep her voice level. And what else can I do with myself now that I'm not a student, except get married? The one who digs a hole falls into it, Grandfather Mystery replied dourly, and Rustam snorted. Camellia pressed her manicured hands together as if she was nervous. You were always such a dear, agreeable daughter. You appreciated what you were given, not like some others in town. How can you do this to us? I didn't do anything to you. His parents have asked for a meeting. Won't you at least give them the respect they deserve by going? She pleaded. Wouldn't you rather have us marry within our society's embrace? What's the alternative? Elopement? Rustam snapped. I'll never get a bride if you shame us like that. I don't mean to hurt you. Perveen knew he had a point. But everyone should know that I am prepared to step away if I must. And so is Cyrus. See how you like living on the street, cracked Grandfather Mystery. Then tell us what you think of disownment. Camellia spoke quickly. We would never do such a cruel thing. It's because we love you very much that we supported your schooling. Our love is the reason we wish to keep you with us for a few more years, rather than marrying you off too early. Her mother's gentle declaration began to undo Perveen's resolve. She really didn't want to live her married life without a chance of ever seeing them again. Choking up slightly, she said, You have done everything for me. I love you, too. Jamshedji gave her a long look. We shall go to the hotel and meet these sodawalas. It does not mean I am saying yes, but I will give them a fair chance. That is your business, then. I'm not going. Grandfather Mystery folded his arms disapprovingly. This was distressing, but at least she had her father. Perveen looked gratefully at Jamshedji. One short meeting is all I ask. Thank you, Papa. 
They went to the Taj the next afternoon. As they proceeded through the stately hotel lobby, Jamshedji spoke in an undertone. Just as important as the boy is the family, and there has been no time for checking. That is a real shame. What would you do? Employ one of your detectives? Perveen sniffed. She had a low opinion of the streetwise detectives her father hired to unearth infidelity and other minor crimes. I would have. All I know is what your mother learned from her friends. Mrs. Sodawala is Homi Vacha's second cousin. The Vachas barely know them. Esther likes Cyrus? What kind of an endorsement is that, with your eye-to-eye -eye hatred of Esther Vacha? Jamshedji grumbled. Don't be such a lawyer, Papa. Promise not to grill them. Through gritted teeth, Perveen smiled at the familiar faces in the lobby. The Mysteries knew a lot of people who worked at and frequented the Taj. Grandfather Mystery had even known its founder, Mr. Jamshedji Tata, who had been a pillar of the Parsi community. Enough, you two, Camellia said. Let's find these people. In the dining room, the maitre d' led them through a sea of white-covered tables open to the general public, to a table in the corner. We are so very glad to see you, said Cyrus, who looked handsome in a high-collared white suit. Rising to greet them, he murmured, Mr. and Mrs. Mistry, may I present my parents? Mr. Bahram Framji Sodawala had Cyrus's good features, but had put on the weight of middle age which softened them. Gray hair escaped the edges of his black feta. Benush Sodawala was also gray, but had a young-looking, round face. Praveen noted evidence of wealth in the woman's gara silk sari, which was covered with lavish embroidery. Benush's sari was grander than Praveen's, a blue silk satin with a petty point border, and grander still than the understated yellow chiffon with zari embroidery worn by Camellia. Greetings were made in formal Gujarati. Like Cyrus, his parents spoke with a slight accent. It charmed Praveen and made her think about how her own voice might change if she were lucky enough to marry and move to Bengal. Please sit down, Bahram said heartily. I've already ordered whiskey. I hope you don't mind. A small one on the rocks. Jamshedji said with a nod. A waiter standing nearby moved forward to pour for him from the cut glass bottle on the table, and then for Bahram and Cyrus. My daughter and I will take tea, Camellia said, with a ladylike air that made Praveen cringe. Darjeeling, milk and sugar on the side. This was the English manner in which tea was usually served at the Taj, and not the way they drank tea at home. It seemed as if Camellia didn't wish to allow herself and Perveen to feel comfortable. I am usually a teetotaler, but my husband convinced me to take a little whiskey over ice. I'm all nerves. Mrs. Sodawala giggled, an unexpectedly girlish sound. I'm very nervous too, Perveen blurted out, but I am grateful you acknowledged Cyrus's wish to consider me. Apparently, our niece Esther introduced the two of them, Bahram said cheerfully. Our apologies for being so forward. Cyrus said you are not yet seeking a groom. We hadn't been looking due to the fact she is a student, Camellia said, declining to take anything from the bearer, who was handing around silver bowls of nuts and biscuits. I was a student, Perveen corrected, but I am no longer at the government law school. Cyrus said that, but he's not sure how old you are. Can you imagine? Mrs. Sodawala laughed lightly, scrutinizing Praveen's face, chest, and every other part of her above the table. 
Praveen didn't like it, but she knew anyone considering her as a daughter-in-law would do the same. I'm nineteen. Praveen guessed that Cyrus hadn't told them, because it might have meant they'd refused the meeting. At your age, I already had two sons. Our oldest, Niveid, is married and living in Bihar. Now the only one at home is Cyrus. The house is much too quiet. Mrs. Sodawala looked questioning at Jamshedji and Camellia. We visited your ancestral house and fort, but why aren't you staying there? Mystery house is where I see my clients, Jamshedji said, allowing Mr. Sodawala to pour another two inches in his glass. My wife preferred to shift to the suburbs for the good air and less crowding. I soon came to realize I like the tranquility. Yes, but old city districts hold memories of so many people and events. You can feel them in the bricks and stones. Praveen didn't want the soda wallas to think she wouldn't like living in the heart of an old city neighborhood like their own. What about lunch? said Mr. Sodawala, looking around the table. Shall we eat a bite together? My invitation. I'm not sure if time permits, Jamshedji said. Of course we've eaten here many times over the last few weeks, Bahram Sodawala said, as if to remind everyone they had met plenty of prospective brides. I like the veal a scallop. Pavine is a pretty thing, isn't she? said Mrs. Sodawala, giving her a warm smile. Such thick, dark hair. She must require two maids to brush it every morning and evening. I do it myself, Perveen blushed. She didn't like being called a pretty thing, but at least it meant Mrs. Sodawala's inspection had been positive. Cyrus, tell us something about yourself. Chamshedji had a forced note in his voice. All I have heard is your family business is bottling. Empire Soda Limited, the firm started by our grandfather, is the third largest in Bengal and the biggest in Bihar, where my brother is handling matters. We've just acquired a plant in Haura, across the river from our home. I won't be traveling much, so I can show Paveen Calcutta. Have you been there, sir? Cyrus asked eagerly. Jamshedji shrugged noncommittally. He was playing hard to get. India's biggest and best city, pronounced Bahram. People from all over the world come to see Calcutta. And also to study, Perveen added for her parents' ears. Mrs. Sodawala, is it true there are several women's colleges in Calcutta? Yes, and there are also many ladies' clubs that do good works for the community, Mrs. Sodawala said, looking pointedly at Camellia. We pray at an aggiary very close to our home. What has your daughter's religious training been, Mrs. Mistry? Camellia took a sip of tea before answering. Perveen celebrated her Navjot at Saint Banaji Limji Aggieri. It's where my husband's ancestors have worshipped since the 1700s. And what is her religious activity since her Navjot? Mrs. Sodawala asked. Perveen exchanged glances with Cyrus, who was looking at her with a beseeching expression. She hadn't been prepared for such questions. Her mother answered, We attend Aguieri during religious holidays and ceremonies involving family and friends. But the way our family practices our religion every day is through our actions. My grandfather is an Aguieri trustee, Perveen added, wishing he hadn't refused to come. He would have been more comfortable with the old-fashioned Sodawalas than her parents seemed to be. I told you, she's top draw, Cyrus said, beaming at her. Mrs. Sodawala nodded. That is good. My late father was a priest. Mr. Sodawala drained his whiskey and signaled to the waiter to pour more. We are large supporters of our local Aguieri, 
because there are few Parsis in Bengal. Right now, it's doubtful that we number five thousand. Not enough people to build big housing communities and schools and such. Not like you have here. We may have these institutions in time. Our Agiary Ladies Committee endeavors to raise funds for a Parsi primary school, but of course we need more Parsi children to fill such a place. Benush gave Camellia an appraising look. The Vachas say that you are particularly expert at such charitable work, Mrs. Mistry. You've started up six schools and two hospitals, isn't it? Not by myself, Camellia demurred. But from her expression, Pervine could see that she was flattered to have been recognized for her work. Bombay is growing in numbers, with poor coming from all over the region, and we must respond. It is always up to our community to open up our pockets for these things, and to think Britishers are the ones sitting at the top with the really big money," said Mister Sodawala. "That is true." But they don't have the benefit of the Parsi standard. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds," Pervin said. "Your daughter speaks from the book." Cyrus's mother laughed happily and reached across the table to pat Pervin's hand. The touch was warm, reminding Pervin of Cyrus, at whom she'd been trying hard not to smile. "Yes, Mrs. Sodawala, she enjoys studying," Camellia said. In fact, we remain concerned of the need for her to have further, wider knowledge, as she is not mature. A woman has a lifetime for reading, a whole week every month, Mrs. Sodawala said. Pervin didn't quite know what she meant by that, but she smiled and nodded. That sounds very good to me. If we're permitted to marry. I pledge my life to making Pervin happy," Cyrus said. "I understand that our suggesting the marriage to you may seem disrespectful, but when two people are especially suited, they might meet first and know this so strongly they can't help but share the truth." Softly, Pervin offered another religious phrase: "Truth is best of all that is good." Spoken first by our prophet," said Mister Sodawala with delight. "Listen, I am sincere in saying that Missus Sodawala and I have not seen such a fine one as your daughter." After this proclamation, Pervin felt as if she were melting into a warm pool of happiness. The Sodawala parents wanted her for a bride, but what of her parents? She glanced at them. While Camellia's expression had softened, Jamshedji looked the way he did when he came home after losing a case. Under the tablecloth, Pervin slipped her hand into his. She squeezed it firmly. In the touch, she tried to say what she couldn't. Yes, I want this. Jamshedji let her hand stay in his. Before coming here today. I resolved that this meeting would not be a castigari. It certainly is not," said Mister Sodawala, showing a flare of temper. "We had not met the girl yet. We had our own judgment to make. Our children chose each other without our assistance," Jamshedji said grimly. "They ignored the fact." That marriage is the most serious contract that can be undertaken. Such a union should not come about without investigation. My wife and I expected we would be well acquainted with the groom and his family. Pervin pulled her hand out of her father's. Despite the amiable conversation going around the table, she sensed he was going to deliver a negative pronouncement. She had seen him do this in court before. Build a case, seeking agreement, until everyone had come to see his point as reasonable. I know your expectation," Bahram Sodawala said, who had sat back in his chair and was looking more at ease. We first searched for a bride from a family in our city, 
But as I said, the Parsi community in Calcutta numbers fewer than five thousand. We could not find the right type for Cyrus. That is why I'm pleased his cousin introduced him to a girl from a good family. Her prospective father-in-law was meeting might with right. Perveen appreciated it, and she could not bear to keep silent in the face of his humility and her father's rigidity. Leaning forward, she said, Mr. and Mrs. Sodawala, I am so glad that your family came to meet us. I only wish my parents would realize that your son is the best groom they could ever find. Hush, Perveen, Camellia said, her face flushing. It is not decided. Looking directly at Jamshedji, Mr. Sodawala said dryly, You might think we seek financial gain through our son's marriage, but we have no need for any kind of gift or promise. Jamshedji nodded and took a sip of whiskey. What did that mean? Was he going to listen? The Sodawalas were offering everything possible to get her family to agree. Perhaps they did fall in love at first sight, suggested Benush Sodawala with a demure smile. It is hardly proper before the wedding. But who are we to keep two Parsi children of good families from making an auspicious union? I would like to hear my wife's thoughts, Jamshedji said, turning his head to look Camellia in the face. He always asked his wife's opinion on serious household and family matters. Perveen held her breath. Perveen can be strong-headed, but she is intelligent. Camellia looked down at her plate, still glossy and untouched. I appreciate that she consulted us, and that your son also spoke with you. This is a modern age, and some young Indians are even marrying outside of their religious communities. These two are staying inside our faith. Perveen exhaled, giving her mother a thankful look. After a long pause, Jamshedji said, Yes. It is good the children asked our blessing. Therefore, if Camellia agrees, I shall consent to an extended engagement so both parties might become acquainted. Father, thank you! Perveen turned to embrace him, moving so fast that she knocked her cup of tea between them on its side. Camellia reached over to write it and accepted Perveen's kisses. Nine months to a year should be sufficient time for further chaperoned meetings, Jamshedji said, offering a faint smile. And in this time, Perveen can revise her college field of study. Perveen nodded happily. She had suggested this timeline to Cyrus when he'd proposed to her at Bandra. It had seemed entirely reasonable. Not only would there be time to see each other, but they'd also be able to plan the most spectacular nuptials. Cyrus bowed his head, and when his face came up, there were tears in his eyes. Sir, I am so very thrilled to have your consent. Even though we've spent such a short time together, I love your daughter with all my heart. But there is a problem with the engagement you propose. Oh? Jamshedji put his drink down hard. Perveen stared at Cyrus, wondering what was to come. Glancing sorrowfully at Perveen, Cyrus said, Calcutta and Bombay are more than a thousand miles apart. I'm not able to travel back and forth frequently between them. Will you forgive me? Of course, Perveen said quickly. An engagement is a matter of months, but a marriage is forever. We shall do what's necessary for the marriage to take place. Perveen, you're putting the cart before the horse, Jamshedji reproved. If a marriage is forever, what's wrong with delaying its onset to a mutually convenient time? Very sorry, sir, but my boy is correct said Mr. Sodawala, sounding unapologetic. We increase production for the winter holidays, our busiest season for sales of bottled alcohol. 
We have no time for weddings from October through next March, and then the weather becomes too unpleasant, and we are pushed to full capacity for soda bottling. So you are saying my daughter is just another bottle on the belt? Chamsheji said sharply. Bahram Sodawala chuckled. Ha <laughs> ha, that is funny. Mrs. Sodawala turned to her husband. Now that we have had the joy of finding a bride, can we stay in Bombay a few more days? That would allow time for some chaperoned visits. Camellia spoke softly. That would be fine. I've just had another idea, Benush said, looking from her husband to the mysteries. The wedding could be held later on this year, if it's held in Calcutta. Then there is less time away from the bottling plant. I don't know about that, Camellia said quickly. Perveen's mind was spinning. She would be delighted to marry Cyrus soon, but not having their wedding in Bombay would be a shock. She'd grown up attending dozens of relatives' weddings and wasn't sure if these people would be able to travel to Calcutta. And how strange it would be not to have the wedding in the Taj Mahal Palace's ballroom. Her grandfather expected it to be there, given his relationship with the hotel's founder. We are paying for the wedding. It should be here in the Taj Mahal Palace, Jamsheji said heavily. But Papa... Praveen couldn't bear to say the rest. If you don't go along with them, I could lose Cyrus. This hotel is pleasant, but there are places like it in Calcutta, opined Mrs. Sodawala. Praveen wondered if Mrs. Sodawala didn't know they were sitting in the most expensive hotel in Bombay. But a favorite hotel wasn't the point. Cyrus was. Praveen murmured, I'm happy to marry in Calcutta. It's not the wedding that matters. It's the husband and family. If there is any difficulty with bookings, you must allow us to help, Mrs. Sodawala said, patting Praveen's hand. There are many fewer Parsis in Calcutta, which means the Aguieri should be ready for us when we need it. The warmth of Mrs. Sodawala's smile made Praveen glow inside, knowing she was wanted. Shall we order lunch, Mr. Mystery? Mr. Sodawala asked eagerly. Very well. From the way Jamsheji spoke, Praveen knew he had resigned himself to the situation. Let us not be overly hasty with our luncheon. We need time for these ideas to digest. After ordering, Praveen made an apology and slipped out to the ladies' cloakroom. Cyrus caught up with her in the marble corridor. Looking straight into her eyes, he said, How dearly I love and admire you. You were magnificent with them. I never dreamed you could bring both sides to a compromise. I could not risk losing you, Praveen said. That's why the words came... They certainly could not kiss or hold hands. That would have disgraced their parents. But they could stare at each other for just a few minutes, promising with their eyes all the things that couldn't be said. Chapter 13 Rice and Roses Calcutta, September 1916 all that stood between them was a sheet. Praveen sat rigidly on a small velvet chair on one side of the length of pristine linen, being held up by Rustam and Cyrus's brother, Niveid. In accordance with custom, her gaze remained downcast. Her lap was filled with a bouquet of red roses, a gift from Benush Sodawala that signified fertility and love. Their scent rose up, blending with the rich frankincense already in the air. Praveen felt lightheaded, knowing that within a few minutes she'd be married. Cyrus was on the other side of the sheet, so close that she could hear his breathing. It reminded her of how close they'd been at Land's End. 
Here they were, surrounded by family, living out the dream that had seemed impossible a month earlier. Cyrus had appeared, a vision of strength and grace, when he'd entered the wedding hall in his dogly, the high-collared white suit worn for religious events. The stiff pugli he wore atop his head made him look much taller than he really was, and his face was very closely shaven. She was similarly prepared to look her best. After the morning's ritual bath, Camellia had spent more than an hour draping Praveen's wedding sari. She was wearing a nine-yard length of Chantilly lace, made even more dazzling by seed pearl embroidery over its flowers. Her wrists were stiff with bangles, heavy gold ones from her own family, and ivory bangles inset with rubies from the soda wallas, which harmonized perfectly with her diamond and ruby engagement ring. Around her neck hung a gold and ruby necklace that had been her mother's, and the heavy white and red rose bridal garland. Herveen continued studying the bouquet in her lap, resisting the temptation to pull the flowers close to her for a long, heady inhalation. Her hands lay open, as the priests had instructed, this allowed for a priest to drop dry rice grains into her left palm, the rice she'd be allowed to throw very soon per the ritual. As the group of priests chanted, one of them reached under the sheet to move her right hand into Cyrus's. This was the hand fastening. She imagined how frightening such a touch would feel to a couple that didn't know each other. Cyrus's hand was reassuring, familiar. She squeezed it. Prayers continued as the senior priest wrapped a soft string around their clasped hands seven times, symbolizing the divine heptad of God and his six archangels. Two priests kept the sheet steady as he wound the same string around their chairs. It was a symbol of union, the tying of two individuals into marriage. She'd seen marriage rites like this so many times— but it felt thrilling to be tied into traditions which went back thousands of years. Finally, the seventh circle was completed. Suddenly, many female voices broke the solemnity, shrieking for either Cyrus or Praveen to be first to throw rice. A small shower of rice hit the top of her head before she could raise her own left hand. Laughter and applause erupted, and the sheet was dropped. She saw Cyrus grinning, because he had hit her first. He would be the one to rule the family, according to the proverb. Perveen knew this would please the in-laws, but it meant nothing to the two of them, as they were bound together in a relationship like no one else's. After the noise died down, the chairs were shifted so Perveen and Cyrus were seated next to each other, rather than opposite, with their families behind them. May Ahura Mazda grant you sons and grandsons, plenty of means to provide for yourselves, heartfelt camaraderie, physical strength, long life, and an existence of one hundred fifty years, a priest intoned. Perveen thought she'd be quite happy to live half that long, if only Cyrus was with her. Her smile lasted all the way to the reception line, even though the wedding photographer implored her to look properly serious. But she couldn't hide her joy that the impossible had actually come to be. She was a new woman, no longer Perveen Jamshedji Mystery, but Perveen Cyrus Sodawala, with a gold ring on her finger to prove it. Aside from her immediate family and ten relatives— there were only forty other guests who'd come the distance from Bombay to see her wed. The worst part about it was Grandfather Mystery's absence. His heart had been beating overly fast, so his doctor hadn't allowed such a lengthy trip. But Perveen remembered what he'd been like when the formal Castegari had taken place a few days after the Taj meeting. He'd said very little— but afterward had told Perveen she had done wrong to select a groom for herself when her parents knew better. It had been an irrelevant comment because her parents had consented. 
Trying to create a link between her grandfather and Cyrus, Pravina told Grandfather Mystery that her fiancé was a straightforward businessman who, like him, wasn't afraid to speak his mind. But the family's patriarch had looked off in the distance, as if he already wanted her gone. Praveen shook off the sore memory as the maitre d' motioned her and Cyrus toward the head table, where the wedding feast had already been placed. The Sotawalas had invited 220 guests, and they all seemed to be enjoying the meal. The menu contained the requisite succession of Parsi wedding dishes, steamed fish, fried chicken, egg curry, lamb curry, sago crisps, carrot and raisin pickle, and an extravagantly seasoned mutton pulao. Dessert was kulfi and laganu custard, but Praveen was too full to manage more than a few spoonfuls of each creamy dessert. A small wedding is good, isn't it? Cyrus whispered in Praveen's ear as she gave up on attempting to finish. I'm so glad we are already home rather than in Bombay. The wedding isn't so small. I doubt I'll remember half the people's names. And I thought your memory was magnificent, Cyrus teased. You've been quoting our prophet ever since our engagement. She gave him a mischievous look. Only because it charms your parents, Cyrus murmured. The wedding's gone like clockwork, except for the string breaking. I tell you, my mother almost gasped. What do you mean? Praveen craned her head to look at the Sotawala parents, who sat happily feasting a few feet down the table. It took the priest such a long time to tie our chairs, Cyrus said. I think it was because the string broke. They had to crowd together to fix it before all the guests saw. She shrugged. Relieved it had been nothing serious. Funny little accidents happen at weddings. They become the best stories to tell later. Cyrus lowered his voice. But that string is supposed to bind us together in our lives and eternity. And my mother's superstitious. She's having as much fun as us, Praveen said, glancing again at Benoush, who was chatting with Gusta with a relative. She's overjoyed, he whispered in her ear. She's grieved my sister for so many years, and now she has a new daughter. It wasn't that simple to replace people. Praveen knew she would find it hard to call Benoush Mama, just as her own mother would have a hard time giving up overseeing her life. Days before the wedding, the mysteries had been invited to the Sotawala's large old bungalow, they were shown some downstairs rooms and the wing where Cyrus and Praveen would stay, and Camellia had been concerned with some crumbling plaster, mildew, and a rank smell. Jamshedji had gone to the heart of the matter and offered to pay for renovations to the newlyweds' quarters. Bengali house painters don't get far. They're always dreaming of making masterpieces on the easel rather than doing work on other people's houses, Benush had said with a laugh. And what can one do about these bathrooms when the sewers outside are clogged? Teakwood and gold will never become old, Praveen had said. It was one of her grandfather's favorite proverbs, to prove she didn't mind the aged interior. Benush had bestowed a doting smile that confirmed she'd said the right thing. Praveen pulled herself back to the present. She was at the head table at her own wedding with the most attractive and understanding man in the world. As long as she had Cyrus, nothing else mattered. Shortly after one in the morning... Two cars traveled the short distance from the Great Eastern Hotel to Saklat Place. Praveen rode with the Sotawalas in the family's Buick, its black body gleaming with wax and festooned with jasmine garlands. Praveen's parents and Rustam followed in a smaller car, driven by one of the hotel's chauffeurs. 
the long windows of the Sotawala's bungalow were lit, and the house servants quickly emerged to pay their respects and offer ginger lemongrass tea and the tray of kumkum for Benouche to use in her final formal welcoming of Perveen. Perveen held her breath as her mother-in-law dipped her finger in the kumkum and touched Perveen's forehead. Benouche recited a long prayer in a vestan, adding at the end, May Ahura Mazda guide you, and may you perform your duties as a good daughter. Benush had anointed Perveen with kumkum right before the wedding, but this time her mother-in-law's touch felt different. It seemed to sear. Just as the priests had bound Perveen and Cyrus together, this was a formal bonding. To her mother-in-law and everyone else in the community, she was now Bobby, a brother's wife. Perveen saw her parents standing just behind Benush. Jamshedji's arm was around his wife, as if she needed some kind of support. But it was his eyes that had the glaze of tears. Don't cry, she thought, looking imploringly at him. If you cry, I will too. That's done, Benush said, after she'd taken her finger away and was wiping it on the cloth a servant girl had handed her. Perveen must be very tired. Poor thing. So much heavy food and too many people. You are home now and must take a rest. Cyrus flashed a look at Perveen and said, Yes, she can hardly keep her eyes open. Gita must bring her upstairs to unpack. Perveen would have liked to linger downstairs with Cyrus, who was happily accepting his father's proposal of a whiskey nightcap. But the Sotoalas thought she shouldn't, so who was she to challenge things moments after arrival? Besides, her parents were already making motions to leave, as it was so late, and their train would depart in just seven hours. You must write. I am already beginning a letter. Camellia's voice was choked, and she opened her arms for a farewell embrace. Perveen kissed her mother on both cheeks. I'll write every day. Show my letters to Papa, if he has time to read them. Jamshedji muttered. No legal brief could be more important than a letter from you. Oh, Papa, I will miss you every day. And now the tears were running from Perveen's eyes. For years he'd spoken about the importance of strong writing skills for lawyers— and she'd given up the plan to become Bombay's first woman lawyer, ending his dreams. Good night, my dear sweet daughter. Benush beckoned her to come close, offering her powdered cheek for a kiss. And don't feel you must rush out of bed tomorrow morning. Gita will bring your bed tea whenever you like it, and we breakfast at ten. The young maid named Gita kept peeking at Perveen and giggling as she carried Perveen's valise upstairs. Perveen paused at the door of her marital bedroom, where an embroidered Toran curtain hung across the top. It hadn't been present before, nor had the beautiful chalk decorations made from powdered limestone on the threshold. What a pretty entrance! Perveen said. Who made it? Your mama. Now look. Gita flung the door open, displaying a place unlike what had existed five days earlier. A new high-posted mahogany bed, dressed in a rose silk quilt, sat in the room's center under a modern electric ceiling fan. Silver lanterns glowed from matching carved camphorwood tables on either side of the bed. Happily dazed, Perveen crossed the soft pink and red carpet patterned with flowers and prancing deer toward the archway leading into the adjacent room. The lounge room was another revelation. Candles shone from well-polished brass sconces, illuminating the pair of green velvet chairs that faced a mahogany tea table. 
An ornamental chest stood against one wall, and along the other there was a set of glass-doored bookcases. The bathroom will be fixed next week, Gita chirped. New toilet with flush and a bathtub. First class modern for Bobby. The marital suite was beautiful, but terrifying. How had it come about? If her parents had overstepped, she would have to apologize, maybe even send things back. But it was ever so much more pleasant now. In her heart, she wanted all of it. Praveen turned at the sound of soft footsteps. Cyrus was no longer in the formal white wedding suit, but wearing only a sudra and the white trousers that had been part of his wedding costume. Walking slowly toward her, he asked, How do you like our honeymoon suite? It's the loveliest place imaginable. She hesitated, afraid of having her suspicions confirmed. I'm only worried my parents overstepped and made your family spend on something they didn't want. He stood before her, his face filled with pride. I ordered everything. It's for the two of us. He was truly a man of swift action and deep commitment. If he'd done this to surprise her, what other delightful moments lay in store? Slipping her arms around his neck, she murmured, You are the cleverest, dearest man. It's so romantic. I am utterly overwhelmed. It's the best wedding present I can imagine. We couldn't take a honeymoon, so I had that money to spend. And you can't believe how pleasing it is for me to have my creaky old bed replaced with something so big and new. Keitha began giggling, and Cyrus looked at her with irritation. Go on. We don't need the likes of you on our wedding night. I am your servant, Keitha said demurely, fixing her gaze on Praveen. What else shall I do? Please get some rest, Praveen said, feeling exultant. And don't come to us too early tomorrow. When they were alone, Praveen tilted her face up toward Cyrus, who gave her a long kiss that was sweet with whiskey and desire. When they parted, Praveen looked past him to the tall, luxuriously draped bed. She imagined herself beckoning him toward it, but that would be too fast. She walked into the lounge, knowing he would follow. Filled with a sense of power mingled with delight, she murmured, What a haven you've made for us. I can't believe you managed this in just a few days. How did you do it? Remember, I didn't come along when my parents were taking you here and there. I'll confess that Sahar chose the textiles and furniture. It was also no coincidence that she crossed paths with your mother inside Whiteaway Laidlaw. Laughter bubbled up inside her. It's all very fresh and soft and comfortable, and I can hardly wait to fill the bookcases with novels and my Encyclopedia Britannica. My parents will send it. I'll tell them. Tomorrow, he said firmly. Praveen caught her breath as Cyrus took her by the hand and led her back into the bedchamber. She'd been anticipating this for months, but now it was a little scary. What if she was no good at marital congress? How could anyone be good the first time? And she wanted to please him. Aren't we supposed to bathe? She ventured, playing for time. Camellia had told her taking a bath both before and after the act was customary and might even relax her a bit. Who's watching? Cyrus said, lifting the lay sari away from her face. Oh, Praveen, how long I've waited for you. It's been just two months. Two months too long, Cyrus said, slowly unwrapping the length of lace from around her. I wanted to touch you that very moment we met. I've thought so long about what you'd look like, how you'd feel. 
The ethereal sari fell to the carpet, but she could hardly take time to pick it up. Cyrus was holding her close, tempting her to do the things she had half imagined. With trembling fingers, she unhooked the long lace blouse that matched the sari, and Cyrus pulled off his own sudre and trousers. He stood before her in only his drawers. He was broad-chested and strong as any young man who worked the Bombay docks, although he was much more fair-skinned. The only darkness on him was the mat of curly hair that covered his chest, running in a narrow line down to a place she'd long imagined. Oh! Praveen turned her head away, shocked by the feelings that had come with looking at him. What is it? Cyrus asked, smiling. Awkwardly, she said, You've removed your kushti already. A sacred cord should never be worn during Congress, he said, pronouncing Congress as if the word were entirely natural. Then he laughed. Mrs. Sodawala, where is your kushti? You'll have to find out. And then she lost her breath, because he had pressed himself against her, so she fell backward, and his whole naked, warm length was atop her on the soft bed. Slowly, he began unbuttoning the tiny pearl buttons that closed the front of her silk sari blouse. In moments, her muslin sudre was gone, and he had clasped his hands on her breasts, sending little shocks through the skin and to her core. This was like Bandra, only it would not stop. It would keep going to a place she'd always wanted to travel, the heaven where they were meant to be. I love you, Praveen whispered, her fingers trembling as she began to unknot the sacred cord at her waist. My beautiful wife, he breathed. Don't be afraid. I'm not, Praveen said reaching up to pull him closer. Chapter 14 A Wife's Place Calcutta, October 1916 Cyrus held out his arms toward Praveen as she slipped a gold cufflink into his starched white cotton shirt, I can barely stand being away so long today. I feel the same, Praveen sighed, accepting the fact that this would be another day when he was gone twelve hours or longer. Cyrus was dressing very well that day because he had an appointment with the food and beverage manager of a European social club in Barisol. If all went well, the Sodawalas would get the contract for all domestic hard liquor. Praveen said, I wish I could come along with you and boast about the world-class bottling plant you've got in Sialda. The only trouble is I haven't seen it yet. Nothing to show off, really. It's just an ordinary bottling plant, crowded and such a din from the sound of glass bottles moving along the belt. One hundred every five minutes. Goodness, I'd love to see a place like that. She had a vision of herself moving down the line, seeing ways to make it even better. After all, this was her family business now. And what's on for you today? He murmured, ducking his head to kiss her. Another day in Benush Mami's cooking school. Today she's teaching me saliboti. Praveen kept her tone light. She didn't understand why it was so necessary for her to learn all of Benoush's favorite dishes when the household had a perfectly capable cook. But if a little cooking was the price of life with Cyrus, Praveen would gladly pay. When I saw you just a few months ago in Bombay, I said to myself, there's a girl who can make Sally Boti with the best of them. Don't lie, she said, putting a finger to his lips. 
What you saw was someone who appeared serious, but underneath had the drive to stay up all night with you. Someone with more passion than sense. Cyrus gave the low, rolling laugh that never failed to thrill her. If I'm not too late, let's go out tonight. You've not yet seen the Victoria Memorial, and we can have Gulfi afterward. Really? Perveen's spirits rose, because in the two weeks since the wedding, she'd been outside the house with Cyrus only a few times. Is that time to take the car into North Calcutta? He frowned. That's a bit far. Why go there? Slipping a cravat around Cyrus's neck, Praveen said, I heard from a friend whose sister studied in Calcutta that there's a very lively coffee house in the College Street area. That place is full of Bengalis and training to be radicals, Cyrus said with a chuckle. Not many Parsis in the bunch. I'd love to see what a Bengali radical looks like, Praveen said, tying the silk in a French knot. The servants have taught me some Bengali already. We might make friends. Bethune College must be nearby. Yes, you mentioned your interest in that college. Cyrus stepped away from her, looking in the mirror to adjust his tie slightly. Let's drive there on Saturday and see a picture afterward. I'd love that, Praveen said, coming up from behind to wrap her arms around her handsome husband's bulk. And as for today, you'll do your job and I shall do mine. Don't let my mother drive you mad in the kitchen, Cyrus murmured. Nobody can drive me mad except you. Two hours later, though, Praveen wasn't so sure. Cooking was hard. After a long slog of onion chopping, her eyes stung. She blinked furiously as she worked at slicing potatoes thin as matchsticks. Nobody else's eyes seemed to be hurting. She'd look a wreck with such red eyes when Cyrus came back. Is this enough? Praveen asked when a small white pyramid of potatoes rested on the wooden board before her. Benoush tilted her head and looked down at the pile. A little thinner next time, but it's good enough for a beginner. Now soak them in cold water and salt. Half an hour. Shall I fetch my watch? Perveen had been instructed to wear no jewelry and a simple sari. It turned out that much of her trousseau was too luxurious for kitchen training, so Benoush had taken her to Hog Market to buy a stack of practical cotton saris. The cost of five of these rough saris had been less than the cost of one of Perveen's everyday silk saris. Benoush had dressed ostentatiously throughout her time in Bombay and given Perveen beautiful clothes for the wedding, so Perveen was surprised to learn her mother-in-law had a frugal side. Are those eyes or marbles? Benoush chided. There is a clock over the table. The six-by-ten-foot kitchen was packed with pots and pans hanging from the ceiling, a two-burner hob, a griddle for breads, a curry stone for spice grinding, and a wide stone sink. Perveen hadn't noticed the clock. Never soak potatoes in water from the sink tap. It's full of germs. Use filtered drinking water from the crock, Benoush said, pointing to it. Yes, Benoush, mummy. Perveen was glad to put some distance between herself and the third person in the kitchen, Pushpa, the kitchen servant, who was also Geeta's mother. Pushpa had been kind enough to teach Praveen many Bengali words, but she also had the annoying habit of calling out to Benoush whenever she thought Praveen was an error. Bobby's not using salt, Pushpa sang out, just as Praveen put the potatoes into the water. It would seem you've never been inside a kitchen, Bavine, Benoush Mummy said, her stern words softened by a smile. The last time was when I was thirteen, Perveen admitted, hoping to play on her mother-in-law's sympathy. 
I wanted our cook to teach me how to make trifle. My mother interrupted and told me to get back to my Latin. She said there would always be someone who could cook for me, but never somebody who could study for me. After that, I didn't dare go back. A deprivation! Benu shook her head. In my house, there was only one servant who came for a few hours a day. So, of course, I learned all the cooking and cleaning. I'm glad to learn, Praveen said, because the sweaty, tedious labor had been her first exposure of what life was really like for household servants. Last week, bottling up all those sour mango pickles was good fun. I can only hope they turn out well enough that Cyrus will like them. Making pickles is no game. If it's done incorrectly, it can result in poisoning. Benouche drew her lips into a tight line. Did you know? I didn't. Now you do. And right now we still need the masala, she said, tapping her spoon against the edge of an empty bowl. Pushpa measured all the necessary ingredients while you've been telling your Bombay stories. Perhaps your mother's servants cooked with prepared powders, but here we grind on the curry stone every morning. Praveen didn't answer, but settled down near the heavy black granite slab that Pushpa had toweled clean for her use. Reaching forward, she rolled the heavy black stone pin over the salt crystals, ignoring the slight pulling in her belly. Her period had surprised her by starting shortly after breakfast. She'd learned from her mother that two aspirin and moving around relieved the symptoms. She hadn't mentioned it to Benouche because she didn't want any old-fashioned advice. Her condition was a matter between herself, Cyrus, and Gita, who had brought the necessary bucket to the lavatory. It had been the same with her maid at home, who had delivered the unmentionables to a washerwoman. Rolling the spice pods into powder, Praveen hoped that the stern mother-in-law business would end soon. In a recent letter from Bihar, her sister-in-law had written, Truly, she's a dear, but you must show her that you are respectful. Remember, she's the one who's losing something. And that something was Cyrus. Praveen thought about how mournful Benouche looked when Cyrus came home and barely spoke to her before urging Praveen to come up with him to their rooms. How much fun the two of them had in their getaway, sharing gin and tonics and amusing stories on the veranda, and then bath and bed. Praveen had not thought much about her body before— but she thrilled to journey with Cyrus in different daring directions that always seemed to end at the same mountain peak where sensation mixed with breathlessness. How do you know how to make me feel this, she'd once asked. He had not answered her with words. Praveen scooped up the finished masala powder and put it into the proper brass bowl. She hoped the mixture would meet her mother-in-law's specifications. Benouche instructed her to smear the squares of lamb shoulder meat and set them to rest. The Hobbs burner was taken up with a pot of lamb's livers, heart, and lungs, Benouche's special recipe that Praveen felt loath to taste. Frying a batch of matchstick potatoes would be a delightful respite from blood and bone. Mohit! The household cook carried away the simmering lamb, making space for a new pot into which Praveen carefully poured groundnut oil. She checked the clock, so she knew a half hour had passed, and she could drain and dry the potatoes. Don't add potatoes until it's hot enough, Venus advised, dropping a bit of water in the hot oil. As it sizzled, she looked impatiently at Praveen. What are you waiting for? It's ready! Praveen dropped spoonfuls of potatoes into the golden oil. She jumped back in surprise as they crackled, sending a mist of oil upward. Dudwala has come! Gita called to Benouche from the entrance to the kitchen. He has milk and cream today. He should have come hours ago, so I have words for him. Calling over her shoulder, Benouche added, 
Don't burn the potatoes. Lift them a half minute before you think they're done and let them drain on paper. Praveen nodded, her attention concentrated on the potatoes. She would get it right, because she knew how Sali Boti potatoes should look. As she saw the first flush of color, she reached for the metal strainer and suddenly remembered Benoush's advice. Can you get paper? Praveen asked Pushpa. Paper? Pushpa began rummaging in a cupboard. So quickly the potatoes were transforming from pale yellow to gold. Pushpa still hadn't found the paper. Praveen had a flash of memory. She'd seen the statesman lying on the hall table. Praveen dashed out, grabbed the newspaper, and came back, spreading it two layers thick on a cutting board. Then she dipped the hand sieve into the oil, bringing up a crunchy group of potatoes, which she deposited on the newspaper. Once the pot was clear, she added a little more oil and then the remaining raw potatoes. Benoush returned, bearing a heavy glass jar of cream. Cheerfully, she said, We'll make that custard cake you dreamed of. Now, how about the potatoes? They're right here, Praveen said. Benoush gaped at the perfectly fried potatoes. Gee, you use newspaper? Yes, I... Newspaper with ink! Just look! Benoush jerked the newspaper, revealing that the undersides of all the glorious matchstick potatoes were smudged with black. Horror swept through Praveen. Oh, dear. I was in a rush. I didn't think the ink would spread. How stupid of you! The waste! Benoush continued her tirade, making Praveen dizzy with shame. How could anyone, especially a rich girl like you, think of putting good fried food on such dirty paper? Five large potatoes were wasted, and the oil! I'll make the potatoes again, Praveen said. If it turns out there is correct paper for draining, none was in the kitchen. There are no more potatoes in the house. I must send Mohit to the market. Benush swung around and began shouting in Bengali at Mohit, who'd been taken off duty during the cooking lesson. I'm sorry, Praveen apologized, feeling an utter fool. She couldn't possibly serve such potatoes to Cyrus or anyone. But how many more hours in the hot, tense kitchen would it take to remedy her error? As if sensing Praveen's anguish, Benush said, just forget it. Mohit can make the sali later. Do you remember how to sort dal? Of course. The inspection of dried yellow split peas was a tedious, slavish job she'd done four times in the last five days. She'd grown to suspect that the dalwala added in small stones, the same color and size as his peas, a nightmare for anyone trying to prepare a satisfactory meal. The rest of the morning passed horribly and was followed by lunch at one. Praveen could barely get down the fibrous spiced offal, which was served with plain rice and the dal. At least there were no stones in the dal on her plate. She and her mother-in-law ate together in silence. At the end of the meal, when Mohit filled their cups with too gingery tea, Praveen thought about what course her father would recommend. He handled his own missteps with grace, apologizing to clients, inviting the opposing counsel and judges to supper or cocktails. I wish I could be a better daughter-in-law, Praveen said. Silence followed, and she did not break it. Her father had taught her that speaking rapidly and not allowing breaks confused others and made one appear rattled. At last, a heavy sigh. Praveen looked up from her plate and saw Benoush looking appraisingly at her. You have good manners, Benoush said. You are very well bred. Your mother may not have taught you cooking, but she did teach you to speak well. I do not expect you to cook all the time. That is not why my son married you. 
He married to have a good mother for his children, someone who will take her place in the community. He married me to please himself, Praveen thought, to have nights full of passion and a close friend to joke with and share troubles with, too. But that was not what Benoush wanted to hear. In a low voice, Praveen said, Your cooking is so excellent, I won't ever match it. A man always loves his mother's cooking best, it is true. But do not worry, you can improve. Benoush leaned back in her chair and let out a hearty burp. I became overwrought, so I will take rest after lunch. Along with the sali, more hits shall make the vegetable curry for this evening, and also the custard cake you enjoy. Shall I learn it from him? Perveen thought that the quiet cook would be easier to spend time with than Benoush. No, no, he cannot instruct you properly. It will be my duty another time. Two o'clock. How still the house was when Benoush slept. Perveen had been sitting at the desk, willing herself to finish a letter to her parents, but it felt odd writing to them about how wonderful things were in Calcutta after the events of the morning. Her mother's last letter had included a question about whether she'd visited Bethune and Laredo Colleges, two institutions where Praveen might earn a bachelor's degree in some liberal arts subject, such as English literature or teaching. Camelia had written, "'Your strength is words.' Why not turn to this? Praveen had initially bristled at Camellia's intrusion into her life plans, but after the tedium of household life with Benoush, she'd realized college would give her a valid reason to leave Saklat Place during the day. Her parents had set up a bank account for her at Grinley's, so she wouldn't need to ask anyone for money. It was an unusual arrangement, but it meant she'd never have to ask her in-laws for anything. It turned out that Cyrus was paid an allowance, not a salary. He hadn't minded her having the security of more money for them in her account. Even though they discussed it that morning, Cyrus's plan to visit Bethune with her seemed so far off. He also had a charming but infuriating way of getting interested in other activities. Because Cyrus was usually working— She'd agreed to whatever he wanted. But today she had the gift of a little time to herself. Since Benoush had given her a free afternoon, she would visit the college in North Calcutta by herself. Praveen went to her bookshelves and pulled out the Calcutta pocket guide her parents had left. A section detailed tram routes and fares, with maps of the city's central and outlying areas— Bethune College was on Cornwallis Street, a north-south artery. It would be a long walk to Cornwallis, but once she was there, she could catch a tram for the rest of the journey. Praveen went into the lavatory to bathe and dress in one of her own good everyday saris, a blue and cream patterned silk. Picking up a cream parasol and a straw shopping bag, she put the envelope containing her college and high school transcripts inside— she also took twenty-five rupees, in case the college required a deposit. As she came downstairs and headed toward the front door, Gita came awake on the mat where she'd been napping. Mimsab, where are you going? Sightseeing, Praveen said. If Benush Mummy awakens before I return, please tell her I'll be home by tea time. Calcutta was like Bombay and not. From the wooden seat in the first-class car, Praveen gazed hungrily at her new hometown. The men were intriguing, several of them wearing traditional Indian clothes, along with proper English shoes, spats, and gartered stockings. She imagined they worked at the many British businesses she saw along the route. Ladies also traveled freely, just like in Bombay, as the tram rattled its way north, Praveen saw knots of young men building colorful, sparkling shrines right on the streets. 
Cyrus and his father had been talking about big party orders for the Bengali Hindu holiday honoring Durga, their exalted mother of the universe. Parveen drank in the splendid gilded pandals, remembering what a Hindu classmate had once said about the sword in Durga's right hand, symbolizing the power of knowledge. Seeing so many visions of Durga on the way to Bethune College seemed an auspicious sign. Giving up law didn't mean she couldn't keep learning things. She would become a student of literature, perhaps studying Bengali language and literature. Yes, Praveen decided with new energy. Though her mother had suggested English, this was the right choice, now that she was a Calcuttan. And if she fell pregnant... She could use the quiet hours for reading and writing. It would be an easier field of study than law. Bethune College was much smaller than Bombay's Elphinstone College. She stared at the elegant building with Grecian columns, thinking it looked more like an old bungalow than an educational institution. But she was sure of being in the right place when she saw young women passing through the doors with heavy satchels, just like she'd carried a few months before. Perveen was surprised to feel herself envying the girls their satchels. It had been easy to leave the law school, but she missed the camaraderie of the Elphinstone campus and all her female friends. Getting to be with Cyrus in Calcutta had consumed her thoughts for the months leading up to the wedding. But now, just two weeks into married life, she longed for something to do in the daytime— the bearer guarding the entrance brought Praveen inside and to a high-ceilinged office, where she introduced herself to an elderly Bengali lady and expressed her interest in applying for an academic transfer. She spoke English, because this would show the receptionist her qualifications instantly. The woman had an unpleasant, narrow face that seemed to grow longer at Praveen's request. She answered in Bengali, Many young ladies are inquiring these days, and the school year is already underway. Praveen nodded. She understood the rebuff. We are taking applications for next year, and they must be completed in writing. Giving Praveen a smug smile, the lady went to a file cabinet and took out a thick packet of papers. You may have this application, but only if you will use it. We must not waste. Praveen hadn't come all the way just to be sent packing. Her Bengali wasn't strong enough for her to converse in it yet, so she shifted into Hindi. I'm interested in learning more about the courses before I apply. Who may I ask? The receptionist shrugged. Our headmistress is giving a speech to the second-year students at the moment, and after that she has a conference with the teachers. Praveen sensed the two of them had entered a contest, rather like when her father parried with opposing counsel. Is there a common room where I might be able to meet some of the students? Those areas are closed to the public. The woman licked her dry lips. Actually, Mrs. Kamini Rai is in the office today, but she might be too busy to speak with you. Praveen gaped. The famous poet and social worker? The receptionist gave her a faint look of approval. Mrs. Rai was one of Bithune's first graduates. She teaches in literature and Sanskrit. If she's here, would you please tell her I was formally enrolled at the government law school in Bombay? Feeling desperate, Praveen babbled on. I completed most of the requirements for a first year of college— with regards to the Oxford examinations, I've passed Latin, French, and first-year literature. It's all in the papers I've brought. The clerk held up a finger. Give me those papers you brought. In the meantime, you may sit in the parlor. The student prospectus is on the table. As she waited, Praveen could hardly bear the suspense, and for the first time in ages she wished her mother could be with her. Camellia Mystery was one of Kamini Rai's great admirers, and had convinced the teachers at Praveen's high school to add her poetry to the curriculum. 
She could hardly wait to tell her mother Kamini Rai taught at Bethune College. It would be a more interesting letter than the last one she'd written, about cooking Donsak. A Bengali woman wearing gold-rimmed glasses and a simple white sari walked swiftly into the room. In a cut-glass English accent, she said, Mrs. Sodawalla, how good of you to visit us. Mrs. Rai, I read all your poems in school. Praveen was blushing from excitement. Thank you for seeing me. Certainly. It is rare to see a potential student come without her parents, and from so far away, she said, her eyebrows raised in an unspoken question. Yes, I can imagine. I'm from Bombay, but I'm now living in Calcutta with my husband and his family. Kamini Rai looked thoughtful. Ah, that explains your departure from the government law school, although it must have been a shame to leave. I wasn't aware females could study law in India. A special provision was made for me to attend classes and sit exams. It was not a formal change in admission rules, Praveen said. Kamini Rai still looked questioning, so Praveen added, My father is a lawyer who wished me to join his practice, but at the law school I discovered it wasn't the right vocation. I've always loved reading and literature, so that's why I've come to Bethune. Your Oxford examination result was very strong in languages and writing. The lady adjusted her spectacles as she read Praveen's transcript. Didn't you think of applying to Oxford or Cambridge? We talked about it then, but I didn't want to be far from my family, and I prefer a new field of study. As she spoke, Praveen knew it was only a half-truth. She still longed to practice alongside her father, but there was no way that could be. Mrs. Rye smiled warmly at her. There may be an opening, but before offering admission, the committee must be sure you've got the necessary support. I understand. Praveen's hand touched her purse. My parents have provided the funds. I don't need to ask for a scholarship and have enough for a deposit today. No need. I'm asking what your husband and his parents think about your idea of studying here. Praveen hadn't expected the question. My husband already knows of my interest. In fact, when he was trying to convince me to marry him, he told me about all the educational opportunities in Calcutta. That is a good sign, Kamini Rai said, her face relaxing. Our application must be co-signed by a responsible employed family member. Our principal must meet your husband and possibly his father. But why? I've got my own money. That seems... Unfair. Mrs. Rye gave her a wry smile. I agree with you, Mrs. Sodawalla. I'd like to change the rules to allow women more control, but I am not a trustee with such powers. I suggest you prepare the application and bring it to the interview along with your father-in-law and husband. I anticipate seeing you in class very soon. Feeling both irritated and heartened, Praveen said goodbye. She was thrilled to have met Kamini Rai and guessed that the poet would advocate for admission on her behalf. But now she had to ask Cyrus and Bahram to take time away from the factories to pay their respects at Bethune College. She sensed this wouldn't be easy. It was tea time when she arrived back at Saklat Place. Even before the door opened, the smell of simmering meat reached her nose. After being in the fresh air for a few hours, she found the aromas sickeningly heavy. There was a low murmur of voices, and then she heard Benush Mummy's giggle. Praveen stepped carefully over the stenciled chalk border in the entryway. 
noticing an unfamiliar pair of ladies' chapels nearby. Who has come? Praveen asked Gita. Gita whispered, Her best friend, Mrs. Gandhi, but Benush Mummy is upset. Praveen felt torn between paying her respects and going straight upstairs to begin the Bethune application. Duty won out, and she approached the parlor. Drawing closer, she heard an unfamiliar, high-pitched voice that must have been Mrs. Gandhi. And she just went out? You must be worried. Benusha's answer sounded irritable. Yes, not knowing anything about the streets, the bad types, and so on. A Bombay girl always wants to shop, pronounced Mrs. Gandhi. But why would she go out without a family member? Praveen felt awkward to be listening at the door. Walking straight in, she said, Benush, mummy, I'm sorry not to have told you I was going out. You were still taking a rest, and I didn't want to wake you. Benush batted her eyes rapidly at the sight of her. Rising from her chair, she began waving her hands as if shooing her away. In a low voice, she said, Go. You wish me to go away? Praveen couldn't understand the look of intense embarrassment on her mother-in-law's face. Mrs. Gandhi was studying the carpet, as if she couldn't bear to see Praveen. Upstairs, Benush hissed. I'll come later. Trailed by Gita, Praveen climbed the steps to the second floor. Penouche might have guessed she'd overheard the gossip and felt she needed to behave sternly in front of Mrs. Gandhi. Praveen felt steam rising from her body, the heat of shame at having acted so impulsively and entered the room, ripping up the fragile bond with her mother-in-law. Should I have waited for an introduction? she asked Gita. What did I do wrong now? Instead of explaining, Gita said, this way. You must follow me. Praveen halted in surprise. The three-story house was built in a square with an open-air courtyard in the middle. Gita was taking her to the side that was farthest away, with doors she'd never opened. What do you mean? Praveen asked. I'm going to my room now to take a bath. Nervously, Gita said, Your Benush mummy doesn't want you to. What nonsense, Praveen said, her irritation rising. If she wants to speak with me, she can find me in my quarters. Gita winced. But, Mensab, you cannot do that there. Not now. Praveen put her hands on her hips and addressed her ayah in slow Bengali. I must bathe. I've been outside and it's my monthly time as well. Gita's eyes flared. That is the reason why. Benush Mummy knows what happened, that it started today. She says you must go to that room. What room? Here. Gita opened a metal door that was just slightly taller than Praveen. The cloying smell of urine hit her first. Was it a latrine? Praveen held her nose, trying to adjust her eyes to the dark room, which she saw had one long window shielded by a patterned iron screen. Gita covered her hand with a cloth before pulling the string for the light in the room's center. Praveen blinked, trying to make sense of this place. It was a small room, about twelve by eight feet, with the same red oxide flooring as the rest of the home. The room held a narrow iron cot. There were two sheets folded at the bottom and a worn-looking pillow in a yellowed case at the top. The only other pieces of furniture were a straight-back chair and a small table, both made of iron. On the table there were three small piles. One contained folded rough cotton saris, another clean but worn-looking menstrual cloths, and the last a few stained towels. There were also a few moldering Gujarati novels. 
A door in the back led to a small space with a toilet. These quarters were too bleak for even the lowest servant. Feeling indignant, Praveen asked, Whose room is this? Geetha was standing at the door's edge, looking nervous. It's the place for Parsi women's resting during Binamazi. Don't you know it from home? Parveen swallowed hard. The literal meaning of Binamazi was being without prayer. It was the term used for menstruation. Parsi women were not supposed to wear their religious garments, nor pray at the Agiary during Binamazi. But those were the only rules Parveen had been taught by her mother. Gita, I don't understand. Does this room have something to do with menstruation? Yes, you must stay here because of that. Gita shot her a sympathetic look. The tall pitcher is water in case you need a drink. You can ring the bell any time, and I'll come to the door and bring more water in your daily meals. The small pitcher contains taro. I think you know what to do with it. Taro, she repeated. She knew the urine from a white bull was collected for use as an antiseptic, a Zoroastrian tradition dating from the faith's origins in Persia. Was that what made the room smell so fiercely? Mummy says it's for cleaning yourself. It makes no sense not to wash one's body with water when it's very much needed. I didn't see a sink or bath in the back. I shall be coming out for that. No, you mustn't, Keitha said anxiously. She believes everyone should stay three paces from a bleeding woman, so do not get too close to the door. How many hours must I stay here? Just the first day, surely. No, it's the whole time, and one extra day past the time you stop bleeding. Keitha shifted uneasily in the doorway. That is how she did it. Do you mean Benush, mummy? Geetha lowered her voice. Yes, before her bleeding ceased. But Azara was in Binamazi before she died. Parveen shivered at the mention of the lost family member whom she'd tried to speak about with Cyrus a few more times to no avail. To think that a child had had to stay in such conditions made her sick. When she had cholera, they still told her to stay here? Not cholera. Geetha shook her head. Looking at Geetha's anxious face, Praveen realized she shouldn't keep interrogating the poor servant. Praveen needed to make a compromise with Benoush perhaps staying away from the kitchen, prayer room, and so on. Geetha closed the door, and her footsteps faded down the hall. Now that Praveen was alone in the little room, she realized the full horror of it. This was a stinking prison. She would not tolerate it. As she stepped toward the threshold and opened the door, it smashed back into her face, sending her a few steps back. What?! Who's there? Parveen called out crossly. You hit my nose! Don't come out! Benu shouted. Parveen tried to recall everything she had said since coming upstairs. How much might Benoush have overheard? She didn't want her mother-in-law to know the extent of her annoyance. Oh, sorry. Is your guest still here? Parveen asked, striving to sound conversational. No! Penouche maintained her angry tone. I sent her off straight away for fear of illness. But, but I'm not ill, Parveen protested. It is your time. You will bring disease if you come into contact with others. Gita, tell her. Are you allowed to come to work when you are bleeding? No, Gita mumbled dutifully from somewhere along the hallway. I cannot come and I shall wash carefully after having been near Bobby. Praveen knew this was going to be a serious argument, a litigator's opening statement. 
she swallowed hard. Benush, mummy, people practiced seclusion a very long time ago, but the Parsis are the most progressive people in Asia. My mother didn't seclude herself, nor did any of my aunts and cousins. A silence fell. Benush was on the other side of the door, so Praveen could not see her face. She had no idea if Benush was listening thoughtfully or spinning into the kind of anger she'd shown in the kitchen. When she finally spoke, her voice was choked. This is your house now, and I love my son enough to wish him to stay in good health. Don't you understand about your dirty condition? It's called menstruation. Perveen answered, using the English word. I don't enjoy it, but it is natural and my own business. That's why I'd like you to allow me to return to my room. Penusha's voice was low and fearful sounding when she spoke. I don't know that word you use. Your body is shedding the dirtiest blood and dead eggs. This attracts Ariman. Perveen's heart felt like it was jumping out of her chest. Good Zoroastrians live on a path. We choose the direction of good or evil through our thoughts, words, and actions. That is why I don't fear the devil. From the other side of the door, Benush snapped. I'm telling you, if you leave this room, you leave this house forever. Perveen was alarmed. Mama, no! I don't wish to go away. I dearly love Cyrus, and he loves me. I know you want this marriage. You will do the necessary and remain here while you are in bleeding. Benush's voice softened. And just think, if you fall pregnant, you will have plenty of time outside of this room. Benush's voice was so intimate that Praveen thought her mother-in-law was about to come inside to console her. But she only shoved the door more firmly so that it latched. Nineteen Seventeen Chapter Fifteen A Matter of Testing Calcutta, January 1917 my dearest Perveen, my very best love to you and the Sodawala family. How is the weather in Calcutta in January? You must be looking forward to your first Nauru's celebration there. We are all well here in Bombay. Your father has taken on three new clients who are keeping him busy. Rustam is over the moon to learn that Mystery Construction has approval to build several office blocks in Ballard Estate, a neighborhood coming up between Fort and Ballard Pier. With luck, the project will be underway by your visit this May. It's a shame your in-laws did not agree to your enrolling at Bethune. However, the college is located in the north, and if nobody can escort you, they would naturally worry. Also, if you'd have to miss a week every month, you would hardly make progress— my suggestion to you is to investigate Laredo College, which is closer, and inquire whether you might be allowed to do classwork from home five days per month. You might learn of other Orthodox female students in similar situations. I'm sorry that the Sotawalas are insisting on the practice of your monthly seclusion. They should have mentioned their commitment to this antiquated custom when we met in Bombay— I'm enclosing an edition of the Gujarati women's magazine Stribod that contains a good article explaining the folly of feminine seclusion. I suggest you give Benush Mummy the entire magazine in order for her to discover this gem of knowledge herself, rather than to feel you are challenging her any more than you already have. I continue to urge caution in your behavior." The mother-daughter bond is a delicate one that can be ruined with hasty action. Have you spoken to a doctor? Perhaps one could recommend that it is better for you to avoid this practice. A doctor is a more acceptable figure of authority than a daughter-in-law. 
I have not told you this before, because I never wanted you to think ill of your father's parents. When I entered Mystery House as a young bride in 1890, there was a seclusion room. Both grandfather and grandmother Mystery believed it was essential for the household's health that I confine myself to this tiny room on the third floor for the heaviest part of my cycle. I didn't enjoy it, but I used the time to read and sleep. After giving birth to you, I convinced your father to move out of Mystery House to Baikala, where people were building modern bungalows without those dreadful little rooms. In the event that you and Cyrus decide to move to your own home in Calcutta, we are very happy to help with the purchase. I remain your ever-loving mama. Praveen folded the letter and put it into the desk. This was startling information about her family's life inside Mystery House. A barrier had risen between her and Grandfather Mystery, ever since his avoidance of all her engagement and wedding activities. Because she now understood he'd enforced her own mother's seclusion, her discomfort with him had turned to anger. Staring out of the lounge's long windows onto the street, Praveen thought about her parents' generous offer to fund a new home. Her mother was trying to cheer her up, just as Cyrus did on the twenty days each month that she lived freely. But Cyrus had just finished paying for their suite's modern porcelain bath, toilet, and sink. Furthermore, he was the only Sodawala child living in Calcutta. If he left his parents alone, it would seem uncaring, especially as they were heading into old age. Cyrus had come several times to the door of the little room when she was secluded, knocking only in the early hours of the morning when he was sure his parents were asleep. Perveen had rushed up to open the door to him, maintaining three feet distance between them, after his twitching nose had revealed to her that she'd acquired a stench. It couldn't really be that he believed she was tainted and capable of transmitting disease. Cyrus had explained that it wasn't Bahram who cared for tradition, as much as Benush, who'd been born in a priestly family. They were poor, so this is her only point of pride. It is why she takes you with her to Aguirre so often. You must see her customs as a matter of faith, not any kind of dominance. But I don't think God wants women to lie in filth, Praveen insisted. And I'm your wife, Cyrus, not hers. Can't you be the one who insists on my well-being? He sighed heavily, exuding a whiff of sweet bourbon. I've tried, but they don't listen. And better not come out to the hall again. She knows you did earlier this week. Perveen was indignant. I needed water. I had to call out for one of the servants. Yes, yes. She was worried if you had too much water, you'd break the rule and use it for cleaning yourself. Perveen was on the verge of telling Cyrus she had done just that when there was a banging sound down the hallway. Someone's up, Cyrus whispered, putting a finger to his lips. Panic mixed with defiance. Now's the time. Take me back to our room and I'll take a bath. It will all be over if we stand up to her. I'm not going back in. Soon enough, you will be pregnant. His voice sounded almost merry. I must go. Cyrus pressed her hand one last time and swayed off toward their bedroom. Remembering this, Praveen thought that asking for a new home would make her parents-in-law think of her as even more of a spoiled, wealthy girl. However, if she were carrying a baby, safety for the baby's health could be used as the reason— she wouldn't mention the death of Azara, because it was painful for Cyrus and his parents. But surely they would realize that moving to Alipur's fresh air made sense for a baby. Then again, having a baby would quash any chance of her studying, and that filled her with regret. She'd so enjoyed meeting Kamini Rai, and had written her a letter of thanks, which had been answered by one from the scholar herself asking whether Praveen's family was amenable to coming in for the interview. Which did she want more, 
a life of the mind, or one devoted to heartfelt caring. It was frustrating to have neither choice assert itself. After four months of married life, she had not conceived. Perhaps it was anxiety. Whenever Cyrus lifted her nightgown, all she could think about was whether that night would be the start of her salvation. As the thought remained in mind, her other body parts lost their sensitivity, and she now couldn't always reach the thrilling peaks. Her body was losing its powers, just as her spirit was. Not long after, Benush suggested Praveen see a doctor. Dr. Bhattacharya is highly respected. He is a specialist in women's health. Many ladies from the Aguieri have sent their daughters-in-law. Although he is a Bengali, he's familiar with our culture. What happens in an examination? Praveen knew seeing a doctor was exactly what Camellia had recommended, but she still felt nervous about the prospect of a physician looking at her private parts. I've never had one, Benush said, patting Praveen's hand. I hear from friends' daughters that it is embarrassing, but there should not be pain. Nothing like childbirth. Dr. Bhattacharya's office was on the second floor of a stately white building on the theater road. The waiting room did not have the typical wooden benches crowded with the ill, but plush velvet chairs and couches so the waiting patients could separate themselves. Several other flat-stomached women were waiting with older women, she guessed, were their mothers-in-law. One pregnant woman was seated on a small sofa reading a book, while her husband looked around the room smiling. Praveen nodded approvingly at the man, thinking this would be the ideal way for Cyrus to be, accompanying her and giving loving care throughout pregnancy. Benush pinched Praveen's arm. Don't look at another woman's husband. I didn't. Praveen flushed at her mother-in-law's supposition. She wished she'd thought to bring a book to read. She had paper and pen, but she could hardly write a letter complaining about Benush when the woman was right beside her. After almost an hour's wait, a nurse called for Praveen to come along and meet the doctor. No, madam, the nurse said when Benush rose to accompany Praveen in. I'm sorry, but doctor prefers only the patient in the examination room. He shall speak with you afterward. Praveen was relieved for a few moments, but when she entered the examination room, she felt faint. A table draped with a sheet stood before her, and on a tray table nearby lay an array of long metal instruments and a mirror. There were glass vials and syringes, and so much more she could not identify. She felt dread, and almost wished Benush were with her. The first thing is obtaining a specimen. Dr. Bhattacharya, a man about Praveen's father's age, had silver hair and thick glasses. He spoke English with a heavy Bengali accent. This allows us to know if you are with child. Could she be? Praveen supposed there was a chance. She went into the modern lavatory and managed to urinate a tiny stream into the little cup. When she came out, she marveled at the nurse taking the cup in her gloved hand, behaving as if this was absolutely natural and not an abominable task. The nurse instructed her to remove her clothing below the waist, including her petticoat and pantalettes. A rough sheet was given as covering after these clothes were gone. Praveen stared at the ceiling, thinking of Cyrus. She'd asked him to come on the doctor's visit, but he joked that it was not his body under examination. She wondered what he was doing at the factory. Perhaps he was making rounds of the workers, or sampling the wares. Whiskey was always on his breath when he came home every evening. The only comfort she had was a chauffeur was driving. The doctor and nurse came in together. 
The doctor asked Praveen the date of her marriage and the estimated number of times of marital congress. Had the frequency fallen off since the marriage? Yes, she said, seizing the opportunity he'd given her. My in-laws have insisted that I seclude myself eight days per month. I have to stay one day longer than the first day there's no blood. It's a very long time. Orthodox Parsis observe this custom of menstrual seclusion, he said with a nod. It would be quite unlikely for you to conceive during that time. But the seclusion and not being allowed to bathe can't be healthy, Praveen said. It's not the way I was raised. Even though you are Parsi? Yes, from a modern family in Bombay. In a rush, she said. Actually, seclusion has been very hard for me. I dread it the entire month. It's begun to affect my sleep and mood. How so? Giving her a sharper look, he picked up his pen and began writing notes. I have terrible nightmares that I'm in that little room, even when I'm away from it, she said, remembering the dreams of the prior week. I have a feeling of sadness and hopelessness. It's made me angry with my husband. He won't defend me against his parents, even though he thinks it's old-fashioned. Every young bride, regardless of religion, struggles with adjusting to the in-law's house. It will improve. The doctor's voice was dismissive. I am concerned with your relationship with your husband. What is the frequency of Congress? Between four and six times. A month? He asked, not looking up. Every week, she said, blushing. It did sound like quite a lot, but it was the one thing Cyrus still had time for. Healthy newlyweds. For the first time, the doctor sounded approving. Now we shall commence the examination. Talking with him had helped keep her mind off his hands and instruments. Now the long, double-sided metal tool went inside, Praveen gasped at the pain. As her body stiffened, she wondered whether the examination could be dangerous if she was indeed pregnant. Sorry, it is always hard, Dr. Bhattacharya said, putting his metal tool down on a tray. Now, I have a few questions. Yes, Praveen said, struggling up to a sitting position so she could see his face. Have you had congress or any sexual activity with another man? Perveen was shocked that he'd think such a thing of her. Swiftly, she said, No, only my husband. You are certain of this? No fathers-in-law, uncles, brothers-in-law? Of course I haven't. I do not come from that kind of family. Perveen's voice shook at the indignity. Ever since she'd arrived in Calcutta... All kinds of sly comments had been made about decadent, rich Parsis of Bombay. Any question about her family made her react violently. The doctor steepled his fingers and leaned forward, studying her. You would be surprised what happens in the best of houses. Hindu houses, Parsi, Muslim, and even among the English. Perveen felt her pulse pick up. In a low voice, she said, Are you asking me this because you see signs of a sickness? Is this the reason I haven't conceived? I cannot answer those two questions for certain at the moment. There are signs of change in your body, some lesions and a cloudy discharge. Perveen's pulse was now racing. She had noticed some discharge in the last weeks and had carefully rinsed her underthings before leaving them for Gita to give to the dopi. She didn't want any further reasons to be sent into seclusion. Maladies affecting the reproductive organs are called venereal diseases. I've taken a sampling from your body for our laboratory. Within several days, I will have an answer. What is that word? Venereal, she asked, hearing the sharpness in her voice. She felt angry not to understand what was wrong with her. Originally, it is from Latin. 
Venerius means pertaining to sexual love or intercourse. He spoke dryly, as if giving a college lecture. Oh! She blushed again, wishing she hadn't asked. The visit was becoming more embarrassing by the minute. Sounding stern, he said, There are several of these diseases. They cause discomfort and can gravely endanger the people who have them. Fearing the worst, she ventured, Do you mean that I could die? Dr. Bhattacharya picked up a fountain pen and filled it carefully before answering, in the case of a woman, we worry first about the health of any fetus being carried. This testing will inform us whether you are pregnant. I don't think I am. I had my monthly two weeks ago. If I'm ill, might I... never be able to conceive? In the space of a few minutes, her life as a married woman seemed to be collapsing. Don't leap to conclusions, the doctor said not looking at her as he wrote fluidly on the paper in front of him. You must return for an appointment to learn the results of the cultures, and then all will be known. In the meantime, refrain from intimate contact, and next time you must bring your husband. Just like the lady in the waiting room with her spouse. But how could Cyrus beam proudly if they were awaiting a diagnosis of life and death? Praveen wished she could read the truth that the doctor had surely already written down. Trying not to cry, she said, I don't know if he'll come. He's very busy with his bottling plants. He usually is gone by nine every morning, and sometimes isn't home until ten or eleven at night. I should not release your diagnosis and treatment plan without the presence of a husband. Just as she could not enroll in college without the signature of a male relative, suddenly all the anger she'd been closing inside herself broke out. Why must I bring him? Don't you realize that he may want to divorce me when he hears this news? And if my mother-in-law learns about it? The doctor's voice was unemotional. They have no reason to fault you. But from what you're saying, I've got a terrible illness. Of course they will blame me. Dr. Bhattacharya shook his head. Venereal diseases pass from one person to another, and since you've only had relations with your husband, you surely know the culprit. Chapter 16 Broken Designs Calcutta, March 1917 Squatting on the tiled floor of the foyer, Praveen arranged the tin stencil box and picked up the shaker of lime powder. Carefully, she shook chalk inside the stencil and watched it flow through to the floor. The week before, she had made a special design for Benusha's birthday. Today, it was back to normal, the swastika pattern that represented the revolving sun's life-giving force. Stenciling chalk designs was something she'd enjoyed doing occasionally in Bombay. Her mother had explained that in olden times, the limestone chalk had trapped dirt and disinfected the feet of people entering the home. The custom endured as a way of showing welcome, and also the accomplishments of the household's women. These days... Crouching down to decorate the Sotoala's house was nothing but a chore. It felt like making an elegant frame to go around the ugly picture that her life had become. If Praveen had permission to pick out the chalk's color, it would have been a blackish gray, like the ashes from dirty fires on the Calcutta streets. Just down the hallway, a pure sandalwood flame burned on a table in the parlor. The house would soon be overpowered with sandalwood when the Persian New Year was celebrated over thirteen days. Benush, Perveen, Gita, and Pushpa had cleaned for three weeks, making everything fresh for the relatives and visitors who'd come by. Perveen was highly conscious of how many days of the month she had until she went into the little room. She had calculated that her menstrual cycle would send her into seclusion midway through the holidays, 
and it would be about eight days until she could leave. The previous time she'd been in the room, she'd stared at a pattern of smudges on the wall, until she realized they were more than dirt. They formed a kind of calendar, with patterns of seven or eight, filling a space running from just over the top of the cot down to the baseboard. She wondered if Benoush had marked off her days, or had it been Azara? Praveen had used a pencil to add her own marks, detailing the approximately 43 days she had been confined over her six months in the bungalow. But she hadn't been able to recall the exact length of each stay. Everything ran together. On that stay, the spring heat had made the room stifling, and she'd smelled her own sweat and the blood more than before. She could imagine what summer would be like, as her mother had suggested, she passed as much of her time in the room as she could, reading or sleeping, although she feared her dreams. Sometimes her dreams were terrifying. She was happily pregnant, but then delivered a blind baby. In another dream, Cyrus was plotting with a beautiful woman to throw her off Haura Bridge. More than once, she dreamed she was fourteen-year-old Azara, sick with fever, rolling off the same hard cot. The hardest dreams were the ones about being back in Bombay. In these nighttime escapes, she was still a college student, lounging in a chair on her bedroom balcony. Then she'd wake, realize where she was, and begin to weep. Nothing had been the same since the visit to the doctor. Perveen had told Cyrus that the doctor thought she might be ill, but nothing more. She hadn't had the courage to tell him any sickness was likely his fault. She didn't like how brusque Dr. Bhattacharya had been. He didn't know Cyrus, and the diagnosis was not yet certain. In the doctor's private office, Cyrus had been all smiles and encouragement until Dr. Bhattacharya told him that both of them needed to be treated for gonorrhea. Cyrus's face had gone pale, but he'd agreed to provide a culture for the doctor, who then discussed treatment with a modern drug, Paragol. Dr. Bhattacharya said that because Praveen wasn't yet pregnant, they did not have to worry about a baby being born blind. Later that evening, when they were alone on their balcony, she asked Cyrus how he'd caught the infection. Cyrus shook his head, looking helpless. I don't know but for my sixteenth birthday. My father took me to Sonagachi. He had done the same for my brother. It was his way of teaching me how to be a man. Many fathers and uncles bring boys. We cannot fight it. She thought about her gruff, quiet father-in-law and could hardly imagine him going to such a place. But it must have been true. Your sixteenth birthday was twelve years ago. Did you have symptoms then? What kind of question is that? I feel like I'm in court facing a prosecutor. Hush, I'm your wife, and I deserve to know. Cyrus shrugged. I knew nothing. Remember that the doctor said that some men can be ill for years without knowing... She'd believed that Cyrus's skill as a lover was a gift, and that he brought her to such heights due to their fated connection. But now she could not stop brooding over the idea he'd had sex with other women. Hesitantly, she asked, After that birthday, were there other times? No! Giving her a horrified look, Cyrus launched himself up from the teak chair where he'd been sitting. I won't stay here if you continue such insults. I'm sorry, Perveen said, feeling desperate. I didn't mean to cause offense. I'm just so worried. As Cyrus grudgingly returned to his place, she looked at him critically. At twenty-eight, he was so handsome and assured she thought it might be possible that he had dallied with other women. She had met a few other young Parsi women in the small community. Some of them were quite pretty. 
What if one of them had longed for him, but wound up married to someone else? Cyrus and such a woman might harbor a secret love. No, she told herself. He only loved her. Has Mama asked you about the appointment? Cyrus asked. I put her off. Perveen pressed her lips together and nodded. Yes. I told her the doctor requires us to visit together several more times for treatments to encourage conception. It's not quite a lie, is it? We really can't have a baby until we are free. Do you still want a baby? He tilted his head to one side, as if trying to get a better read on her. Yes, but it's safer not to try this year, Praveen said, feeling a grey shawl of sorrow wrap around her. So many possibilities were vanishing. You'd forgo trying for a baby, even though you hate going into that room every month? Cyrus sounded incredulous. Praveen had agreed about wanting a baby because it was the right thing to say. But the prospect had become terrifying, given the uncertainty of the baby's health, and also knowing Benush Mama would control the way the child was brought up. She couldn't say that to Cyrus, because it would create a new argument. He clearly was upset about the upcoming months of celibacy. Clearing her throat, she said, I must finish that medicine. But if your mother discovers my bottle of Paragol, she'll think I must be confined. You mustn't worry about everything. It's turning you into a crone. Bristling, she shot back. And what might Mummy do if she learned you were ill? Would she lock you in a little room to keep you from spreading the germs? That's not funny, Cyrus said, finishing his bourbon. You were different in Bombay, so sweet and agreeable. But since marrying, you've become shrewish. I'm not like that, Perveen protested, thinking of how many times she'd kept back an opinion and how hard she worked to be pleasant to Bahram and Benush. Just listen to yourself. Cyrus gave her a reproving look before rising and going inside. Perveen did not go after him. She'd been full of righteous indignation, and somehow he'd managed to turn the tables on her. They'd had a small argument about her applying to Bethune or Laredo College, which he'd won by telling her it was the worst time to agitate his parents. She had a lifetime to study, and the degree would take less than three years. This was true, but now she knew that her finishing college might threaten him. The information had emerged when Bahram was scolding his son at supper for not having read through a particular contract carefully. I can't sack you for neglect like they did at presidency, he bellowed, and Cyrus had delivered a blistering look of rage. As she continued chalking the hallway, Perveen thought sadly about what she'd given up back in Bombay. The design she was crafting reminded her of the patterned moldings that bordered the ceilings of the hearing rooms within the high court. As a child, she'd sat in court with Grandfather Mystery, who sometimes stopped in to see his son's performance. Perveen had been too young to understand the long words being used. She'd only loved the building, with so many wolves, monkeys, and birds carved into it, and the graceful gothic arches that made her feel like a princess in a castle. Here was a place where teakwood and gold never would become old. The high court was a place she'd likely never see again. Praveen raised a hand to wipe her eyes and felt the unexpected smarting from the limestone dust. Oh, how nice it looks. You are getting better with chalk. Perveen turned to see her mother-in-law standing over her. The ladies are coming soon. We have some weaving, Benush said. Perveen tried to blink the powder out of her eyes so she could get a clear look at Benush's expression. 
It seemed kind. Are you making kushtis? Parveen asked. Yes, my dear, but don't be disappointed. You won't be allowed to weave. Why? Parveen didn't know whether to be relieved or offended. The weaving can only be done by ladies of the priestly families. My late father was a priest, and Mrs. Banerjee's husband is one. Remember, he ministered at your wedding. Parveen nodded, not remembering that at all. Mrs. Banerjee's daughter and daughter-in-law are coming today. Everyone is working hard to have new kushtis ready for their families at Noru's. I'll greet them. Parveen kept on meeting with every one of Benusha's friends' daughters, hoping that somehow she would find a true friend. The girls were pleasant, but they did not make invitations for excursions or to their homes. Was it her depression that they sensed, or just that she was a spoiled girl from far away? Smiling through her nerves, Praveen presented cups of ginger lemongrass tea to Mrs. Banerjee and her daughter, Saye, and daughter-in-law, Turan, who each sat before a small wooden loom. This tea needs more sugar. Bring it, Benush said after a sip. Praveen found a sugar bowl and little spoons and went around to everyone before sitting in the room's smallest chair. I will tell you about kushtis. Mrs. Banerjee said, judgment in her eyes as she looked at Praveen. Seventy-six strands of extremely fine wool must come together. It is very tight and strong. It cannot be broken. It looks like nice work to do, but I've heard I'm not the right social class. Praveen felt she'd better defend herself for not helping. Saye giggled and said to the group, of course she wouldn't want to weave. Parveen is a real estate heiress. That's not true. Parveen frowned at the smirking girl. She is being too modest, Benush said with a benevolent smile. Mr. Mystery is a lawyer, but his father built up half of Bombay. I've seen their ancestral house. How odd that the family affluence that Benush always criticized was now being exaggerated. Feeling annoyed, Praveen said, Our ancestral house was a hut in Gujarat. Not that it could still be standing after all these centuries. Ignoring her comment, Saye Banerjee said, if the British paid your grandfather to build so much of Bombay, your family must be very rich indeed. A number of Indian contractors got work from the British. Grandfather was just one of them, and he was busiest in the 1870s, Praveen said. My only close family member in the company today is my brother. A brother? Mrs. Banerjee's eyes lit up. How old is he? Twenty-one? Praveen could anticipate the next question. Married? No. He must have a higher position in the firm before my parents will let him. Aha! Uh -huh. Perhaps your brother will build the Sodawala's next bottling plant and meet one of our girls. Wouldn't that be fine? Oh, I'd adore it if he could come for a long visit. But mystery construction is only in Bombay. Imagine the difficulty in transporting cement and such. Yes, yes. Mrs. Banerjee's three chins nodded. But even if they can't come, they can pay for it. Of course. Benush smoothly slipped wool over her fingers. The in-laws are so generous. We tell them we need nothing, but they only give more. Perveen went rigid. What are you talking about? The new bottling plant, Benush said, tightening the fibers on her loom. Praveen hadn't known about this. Benush's statement was likely an exaggeration, but it created a new awful thought that the Sodawalas expected a return for their son's love match. What is it, Praveen? You aren't watching the weaving anymore, chided Mrs. Banerjee. Daydreaming of a handsome husband, Turan giggled.
Penush, mummy, have you or Bahram, papa, written to my parents about this matter of this new bottling plant? As the words left her mouth, Praveen realized how direct they were. Everyone looked up from the looms. Benush's eyes sparkled with irritation. Let's not talk of men's business. This is a time to make friends and learn about our religious traditions. Enough had been said, though, that Praveen finally understood. The Sodawalas had allowed Cyrus to marry her, not because they recognized his love, but because of her family's money. Now she felt frantic. Had Cyrus gone after her in the first place because Esther Vacha had dropped a comment about the mystery's money? She recalled the way he'd gazed up at Mystery House after they'd come out of Yazdani's, and he had brought his parents there rather than to her family's modern duplex in Dadar Parsi colony. But she and Cyrus had had a love for the ages. They had connected so beautifully with both understanding and passion. But now what did she have to show for the marriage? A husband who thought she was shrewish, the gonorrhea infection, one quarter of every month spent in stinking solitude. Praveen stared at her mother-in-law's loom and thought about the unseen threads that had spun around her, creating an unbreakable trap. Good evening, Bahram, Papa. Where is Cyrus this evening? Praveen asked her father-in-law at seven when he came into the house alone. She was desperate to see Cyrus and clarify her fears. He is staying late tonight, Bahram said, taking off his feta. Praveen put it on the high hat rack in the hallway and followed him into the parlor. Mohit had already set a whiskey and soda for Bahram on the little table next to his easy chair and was winding up the gramophone. Every evening, it was her father-in-law's custom to drink his highball while listening to Beethoven. Praveen knew he preferred to enjoy this routine alone, but that night she felt a sense of urgency. She had to find out about the funding for the bottling plant. What is it? Her father-in-law looked distracted. Bahram, Daddy, excuse me, but I'm a bit nervous. Praveen perched gingerly on the settee across from him. I must ask you something. Giving her an indulgent smile, he said, Yes, my dear, but it is time for my music and drink. I'll be quick. When I became engaged to Cyrus, he mentioned you had taken over an existing factory. You are speaking of the place across the river in Haura. Are you trying to build another factory? Yes, in Orissa. Why so curious? I wonder if you and my father chatted about building the Orissa factory. His answer was gruff. I'm sure we did. Her suspicion was growing. Did you ask my father to finance it? Or are you going to ask? Ah, you would like to help, Bahram said, smiling knowingly. Leave the business dealings and talking to me. Your work is with Mummy, isn't it? Nowruz is in a few days, and she says so much is left to do. She is too tired, and here you are chattering to me. She is the one needing your help. Yes, Daddy. Out of rote courtesy, she had mumbled her assent. But inside, she was boiling. She had no intention of going into the kitchen and begging Benush's permission to help cook. Perveen would find Cyrus. Everyone knew it was dangerous to take a rickshaw or tonga when you were a lady on your own. One might be cheated by the driver or set upon by street criminals. But Praveen had seen the proud-looking elderly Sikh Tongawala several times. Saklat Place was his station. He was obviously reputable. He had noticed her, too. You are the Sodawala's new daughter-in-law he said, 
after she'd requested that he drive her to Howrah. Yes, I want to go to the bottling plant. His expression was grave. Your family wishes you to travel alone? She realized how suspicious such a journey might look. It's only because I'm bringing something my husband needs. After a pause, he nodded. I shall take you then. When one or the other of them is away with the car, I have taken the other in my tonga. I know the place. It was just after seven, and the moon was rising. Its pale light and flickering street lamps were the only illumination as the Tonga moved steadily out of central Calcutta. After they had crossed the bridge into Haura, the rough, dark roads were brightened only by roadside fires. Figures were gathered outside ramshackle shelters made of cardboard and cloth. She wasn't surprised to see a chawl established next to the Sotawala's bottling plant. Perhaps only a few men had jobs inside, but plenty of people would seize discarded bottles for their own purposes. In fact, as the Tonga passed, someone was standing on the edge of the rubble, selling dark brown liquid in what she recognized as Empire Raspberry Soda Bottles. It was probably toddy, the poor man's homemade alcohol. The plant was a long, dark box of a building with several lit windows. Their golden glow reassured her that Cyrus very likely was at work. Although she'd flown the house on wings of anger and fear, she was beginning to calm. She'd be able to explain to Cyrus her anxiety about her parents being pressured, and he would do something about it. The driver stopped so Praveen could address the two uniformed Durwans guarding the entrance. The pair waved her through, though she imagined from their desultory air they would have allowed entry to almost anyone. She resolved to warn Cyrus about this. The massive main door was bolted shut. Praveen banged several times, paused, and saw through the glass window an elderly servant dressed in a vest and dhoti coming forward. He unlocked the door, looking frightened as he stood before her in the scuffed wooden hall. She realized her jaw was clenched. Now she relaxed it. I'm here to see my husband, Mr. Cyrus Sodawala. Not here, he said nervously, bobbing his head. Perhaps he hadn't understood her accented Bengali. Patiently, she said, He is working late. Nah, nah. He shook his head with the jerky movements of a puppet. She heard a rumble of voices through a half-open door down the hall. Ignoring the man's mutterings, she walked toward it and pushed the door open all the way. She was inside a neat waiting room with chairs and a vacant secretary's table. A framed portrait of Cyrus smiling and holding a bottle of raspberry soda hung on the wall. A second door marked Operations Manager was closed. She heard Cyrus's laugh through the door, as well as the rumble of another man's voice. Perveen knocked sharply. Finally, you're here, Cyrus bellowed. The door swung open so quickly she almost fell forward. Riding herself, she stepped into Cyrus's office, moving her eyes from her jovial, rumpled husband to the rest of the room. How different it was from her father's office. Bookcases along the walls were filled with bottles, a display of all the sodas, fruit drinks, hard liquors, beers, and medicinal drinks sold by the Sodawala's company. Even the big desk had bottles standing on it, as well as glasses. A typewriter stood on a desk in the corner, but surely the young woman tipped back in the chair near it could not have been anyone's secretary. She was bronze-colored, about sixteen, with long hair that flowed over her filmy pink sari. Realizing she had Praveen's attention, the girl turned her head sharply, hiding her face— as the young woman shifted, she revealed the curves of a bare breast. 
My God, Praveen said. She closed her eyes for a moment, willing it not to be true. But when she looked again, the half-dressed woman was still there, along with two other people. She recognized one man slumped in a lounge chair as Cyrus's close friend, Dexter Davar. The other was a Hindu named Bipin Datta she'd briefly met at the wedding. Bipin jumped to his feet, looking horrified, but Dexter reclined farther in his chair, drunkenly grinning. Paveen, what is this? Cyrus gripped her arm with a hand like iron. That is my question for you. She struggled to keep her voice even. When you opened the door to me, whom did you expect? Our dinner delivery, he said, his hot breath filling her nose with the fumes of bourbon. Not you. A delivery of food? Or another woman? Praveen had guessed that the long-haired girl came from the nearby chal. Perhaps she was often with him in the evenings. Maybe the only reason the Durwans had let Praveen through the gate was they had caught a glimpse of her and thought she was invited to the sordid gathering. What I do is my own affair, Cyrus slurred. You have no right to be here or to meddle. Still sprawled in his chair, Dexter hiccuped and said, Oh, this is bad luck. I only came because... Perveen stopped her explanation. There was no point in addressing anything but the present. Snarling, she said. It seems you've been selling me a lot of stories about why you're staying late at work. You know nothing. Cyrus's hazel eyes were on her, but they held contempt, not love. Perveen broke their mutual gaze to inspect the female stranger, whose face was crumpled in terror. Is she the one who gifted you with venereal disease? Or did you invite her for the first time tonight, which means you'll soon infect her? His eyes shone with rage. May you die. Mrs. Sodawalla, please calm yourself, Pippin interjected. This person came on her own. Your husband did not request her. Don't lie for him. Praveen turned back towards Cyrus, thinking she'd never been angrier in her life. Inside, she was truly boiling, not just with rage, but humiliation. Cyrus's face was flushed a deep red, and his words were menacing. You should have kept your mouth shut. Out of the corner of her eye, Praveen noticed the young woman had left her chair and was sidling toward the door. Sharply, Praveen called out, Get to a doctor before it's... Too late, she would have said, but she was knocked backward with a blow from Cyrus. He had bashed her across the nose and cheekbones. Praveen staggered back a few paces, but there was no time to recover. In the next moment, Cyrus leaned in and punched her in the eye. Pain exploded in her brow as she collapsed against a bookcase, which rocked hard. The display bottles began falling, and she felt them crashing into her back like rocks as she lay on the floor, the sharpness of breaking glass, followed by the cool of spilled alcohol. As she shielded her wounded face with her arm from the tumbling bottles, she was dimly aware of shouting and the sounds of a scuffle. Bipin Datta was trying to pull Cyrus away from her. Don't do it, man. You're insane! Bippin said. Her father's a lawyer. She's my wife, Cyrus roared. I'll do what's needed. She was throbbing with hurt. She struggled up to a sitting position, and as she put her hands on the floor, broken glass sliced into them. You bastard, she screamed, unleashing all her rage at Cyrus. You never loved me, did you? It was all about money. She felt a tug on her arm and realized that the drunken other friend, Dexter, was pulling her up. In Gujarati, he said, You shouldn't have come. Please go now. Cyrus broke free from Bippin's hold and was coming for her again. Dexter reached out to delay him. 
As the three men grappled, Praveen moved from a kneeling position up to standing. Her sari had come loose in the fall. She pulled the silk around her, trying to protect some modesty as she limped out. The Tongawala sprang to his feet when he saw her coming slowly out of the building. Memsab, what has happened? I must send those Durwans to call for the constables. Please, don't call anyone. Her voice came out like a croak. Just take me back. To home, then? Coughing, she said. Yes, as quickly as you can. As the driver cracked the whip on the horse's back, she flinched, reliving the pain of Cyrus's attack. He'd kissed her goodbye that morning. She knew now that it had been the last time. As they rode past the chal, she wondered if the young prostitute had run back to her home or the man who'd sent her out. If she hadn't gotten the pay from Cyrus tonight, she might get it tomorrow. Praveen didn't care what happened between the two of them. She would never speak to Cyrus again. It's not safe for a woman at night, the Tonga driver muttered. Not safe anywhere. Your husband and father must catch the villain who did this. Did you see his face? She was too spent to tell the driver anything, and she wouldn't tell Bahram or Benush either. Like tree, like fruit. They had made their son into a weak, corrupt man. Praveen asked the driver to wait for her a few doors down from the Sodawala's home while she went in to get money. Don't return to your station, because we're going to drive again. I just need to go inside for a quick stop. Will we go to the hospital? He asked anxiously. No. Sialda Station. She paused, thinking of the many things that could go wrong. If I'm not out in five minutes, knock on the door and ask for me. Tell the bearer it's an emergency. An emergency. Slowly, the driver repeated the English word she just taught him. Geetha opened the door just as Praveen approached. The maid's hands flew to her mouth at the sight of Praveen's injuries. Ignoring her, Praveen walked straight into the hallway and toward the stairs. They knew she must have heard the door opening, because she rose to her feet and came out into the hall from the parlor. Are, Marini! she exclaimed. What is this? Praveen didn't answer because she was intent on getting what she needed and escaping before Cyrus arrived. He had the car. He could be back any minute. As Praveen rushed past, a few blood drops spattered the floor. Catching sight of this, Benush moaned, You are soiled. What happened? I'm sorry, Praveen said stiffly. She realized that if the truth of the evening's circumstances came out, Benush might never be able to convince another family to provide a replacement bride. Benush began weeping. Why, why? Why do you go out like that? Why are you leaking blood everywhere? You know the rules. Was she mad? Bahram's voice called from the dining room. What is that racket? Praveen wanted the two of them together and away from her. Clearing her throat, she said, I'm not well. I must go upstairs. Yes, but clean yourself, and it's better if you go to the little room. Benush probably thought a stranger had raped Praveen. Stifling her desire to scream out that the cuts and bruises were Cyrus's work, she answered obediently, Of course I will go there. I'm only stopping in my room for my diary. All right, I will send Geetha later with food. Praveen went straight up to her room, but instead of just reaching for her notebook, she grabbed a shawl from the Almira and wrapped it around her shoulders. 
She pulled out a small valise from underneath the Almira and stuffed in all her spending money and her jewelry, all the treasures her parents had given her, and the wedding bangles from the soda wallas. Thinking again, she opened it and removed the ivory bangles, laying them out on the bureau. She would let her in-laws keep the expensive shackles. She snapped the valise closed and came downstairs, not wanting to be seen. Bahram's loud voice on the telephone could be overheard. You saw her tonight? She did what? She was just stepping into her sandals when Benoush rushed out and saw her. What is this? You cannot go out. You are dripping blood. What will people think? You don't need to worry about those things any more, Perveen said evenly. Tell Cyrus I've gone back to Bombay and not to bother me again. As she left, Perveen stepped firmly into the stenciled chalk border, smearing her delicate powdered designs into dust. Nineteen twenty one. Chapter Seventeen Black Fingerprints Bombay, February nineteen twenty one. At the Farid bungalow, Praveen sat on a rosewood chair and watched Sub Inspector K. J. Singh shake black powder across the floor. The dark powder, late afternoon heat, and the stench of blood had brought up memories of the Sodawala's home, both the horrible little room and the foyer where she had stenciled for hours over the months. What was going on now felt like a nightmare, and although Praveen might avert her eyes from Faisal Mukri's body, she felt a duty to remain. Knowing her father would expect her to report on every detail of the situation, Praveen had asked to stay. It was a nervy thing to do, and Praveen had been surprised that the sub-inspector had allowed her to linger. As the fingerprinting continued, she realized her presence gave the sub-inspector a chance to show off. After all, his boss hadn't yet arrived, and she was the first female lawyer he'd ever met. Sub-Inspector Singh had swiftly dispersed the thick black powder over everything, the marble floor, the walls, and the furniture. He was making a mess of this elegant old house, but she supposed it couldn't be avoided. She studied the junior police officer, who wore a neatly trimmed beard and had an impressively large dark green turban, Unlike ordinary Indian constables who wore blue tunics with pantaloons, the sub-inspector wore the crisp white uniform of jacket and trousers of the Imperial Police. The golden-brown bridal leather briefcase, which had originally been underneath Mr. Mukri's body, now lay blackened with powder. She eyed it, wondering how she'd be able to convince the sub-inspector to return it. As one of very few Indians in police administration, he would probably not want to give the impression he would cut another Indian a favor. Are you finding many impressions? Perveen asked in a friendly tone. He gave her a supercilious look. I was trained in Calcutta in the Henry Fingerprint Classification System. I don't suppose you know that fingerprinting science began in India? I didn't know she said honestly. About how many fingerprints are on file in Bombay? Over 45,000, he said with pride. In these times, whenever a man is arrested, his fingerprints are taken. Are there only criminals' fingerprints on record? Not exactly. Almost every sweeper and guard is requested to let us take impressions. We saw no guard at the gate, that is already suspicious. My inspector, Mr. R. H. Vaughan, will certainly pursue him. Feeling jittery, Perveen tried not to concentrate on her private suppositions that at least one of the women on the other side of the screen might have been involved with Mukri's death. She was supposed to defend them, not throw them to the wolves. 
Praveen studied the hallway, wondering if she might notice something important. She surveyed everything, the floral mosaics on the walls that bore splatters of the blood, the velvet stool that was knocked over, and the open door to a bedroom. Perhaps this was where Mr. Mukri had slept. As Sub-Inspector Singh kept dusting, she got up and entered the room. The handsome bed was neatly made with a red silk quilt. On marble-topped tables on either side, there were crystal goblets. A slight hissing sound caught her attention. She followed it to a closed door, which she pushed open to discover that behind it was a bathroom with a marble tub. She'd heard the faint noise of taps not closed all the way, judging from the moisture beating up on a long rust stain inside the tub. Where have you gone? Sub-Inspector Singh's voice was sharp and close behind her. Praveen felt like a child in trouble. I'm sorry, I did not know this was off limits. Touching the door ruins fingerprints. There may be evidence here. Praveen looked at the trickling tap. She could have pointed it out to him. However, she was not legally obligated to assist. And if she became involved in the defense of anyone within the household, tipping the detective about anything could have disastrous implications. Still, she wanted to foster a good relationship. There were many things a lawyer could learn from the police. This was why her father, the next person she'd telephoned after she'd rung the police, was downstairs with the two constables. My inspector will want to know what was taken, Sub-Inspector Singh said. This will be difficult indeed, since the three widows live on the other side. What can they tell us? Praveen was pleased to have a way to redeem herself. Our law firm has a written record of some of the household's most important assets. I believe we can share this information to assist in your investigation. Singh looked appraisingly at her. When can you give it? Perhaps tomorrow. But I need my briefcase. It's the one lying against the wall. You own a man's briefcase? He looked disbelievingly from her to the case. It's mine, she bleated, feeling desperate. I can tell you that it was manufactured by Swain Aidney of England and has my initials stamped on it, P.J.M. He shuffled over to the briefcase and lifted it up for inspection. Why would your briefcase be with the deceased? Praveen took a deep breath. If she wasn't careful, she could turn his suspicion on herself. I misplaced it when I was visiting earlier today. I'd come on a routine visit that dealt with the estate settlement. The late Omar Farid was originally my father's client, and now I'm helping because the wives will speak to me. Sub-Inspector Singh handed her the case. You may have it, then. But will you tell me if anything's missing? Thank you. I look right now. Praveen shook off her worries about being considered culpable, along with the black dust covering the case. Her notebook, a Bombay street guide, three pens, twenty rupees, and some odd paisa coins were still inside. The maher and wakf papers showed signs of rifling. Mr. Mukri had looked. Not that it mattered any more. Nothing's been taken, not even the small amount of money I always carry, she said. Any thief would have taken the case. It looks expensive. He broke off at the sound of Jamshedji's voice booming from downstairs. My apologies, madam, but this area is not open for visitation. It is under police protection. Is that so? drawled a recognizable female voice. Then what about your presence, sir? You're too nattily dressed to be a constable. Sub-Inspector Singh gave Praveen a comradely glance and muttered, Those ungrays, everywhere they should not be. 
It sounds like my father needs help. Briefcase in hand, Praveen hurried down the main staircase. Alice was dressed in a white linen frock that was not only creased but also stained with red dust. She goggled at the sight of Praveen. Praveen! How did you get here? I'll ask the same of you. She laughed, trying to sound amused, although she wasn't. It was an inconvenient time for Alice to blunder in. I was coming back from sightseeing on Elephanta Island when I saw the hubbub, the whole streets up in arms. Even so, that is no reason to enter another person's property, Jamshedji said icily. Papa, she is my closest college friend, Alice Hobson Jones, Praveen interjected, because as annoyed as she was about the interruption, she didn't want Alice to feel rejected. She lives just around the corner. So you're the famous Jamshedji Mystery Esquire? Alice beamed, as if she was intent on ignoring his unfriendly reception. Praveen has told me loads about you. Actually, I only came because of the commotion. Our guard said a police cart went by, the kind that is used to carry bodies. I regret to say that the information is correct, Jamshedji said stiffly as he shook Alice's outstretched hand. A gentleman from this house has passed away. Alice gasped. But I thought the Nawab died some time ago. Father and daughter exchanged glances. At Jamshedji's nod of permission, Praveen spoke. Alice, you are correct that the householder, Mr. Omar Farid, died last month. Although he was a businessman, not a Nawab, the gentleman who died today was the family's household agent and guardian. How ghastly, Alice said. Was he killed defending the widows and children? What a hero he must have been. We don't know specifics. Jamshedji said in the patient voice he employed with foreigners. That is a matter for police deduction. And now, Miss Hobson Jones, if you don't mind. But, Mr. Mystery, can you tell me, were the ladies and children harmed? Alice persisted. They're fine, Praveen said. I've been inside the Zanana section to check on them, although there hadn't been time to talk. Perveen, perhaps you and Miss Hobson Jones could visit with each other later. Jamshedji's discomfort was obvious to Perveen. The sudden interloper was a social superior who could cause all manner of trouble. Perveen would put him at ease later, for now she'd do as he asked. Perveen walked out to the garden with Alice. Why didn't you tell me that you already knew my mysterious neighbors? Alice grumbled. We looked down at the garden together, and you didn't say a word. I didn't know you were such close neighbors until I visited your parents' house, and I'm duty-bound to protect my client's privacy, Praveen said, putting an arm through one of Alice's. My father only said as much as he did because you'd arrived, and there seemed no way to keep it hidden. But do be quiet about it to others. Alice rolled her eyes heavenward. I shall. But does this gag order preclude me from telling you what I think? Speak, but in a lower voice, Praveen whispered. There are open ears on the other side of the wall. Alice regarded the high property wall with its spiked glass topping and winced. All right. Mother says that whenever there's a murder in India, one can count on the evildoer being a disgruntled servant. Mohsen was still missing from his station. However, Praveen refused to engage in typical prejudices and didn't want Alice to absorb them. Here's what I think. Because there are so many more poor people in India than rich people, they receive most of the convictions, 
Their fate is decided by judges who come from the elite. I hadn't thought of that, Alice said, looking a bit shamefaced. Whoever it was, I hope that he or she is caught. Do you see how fair-minded I can be? I do. Will you come to the bungalow after you're finished here? Your mother said yesterday you'd be busy tonight. I've got that thing where your legs are still rolling the day after you've been at sea. I tripped in the caves. That's why I look such a mess. Perveen hesitated because, although she would have liked to talk about everything with Alice, it would be difficult to resist saying too much. I'll have to see what my father thinks. It was his suggestion, Alice said heatedly. Perhaps but her father had no idea how hard Alice was likely to press her about the case's details. And after all of the truth-telling that she and Alice had gone through over the years, Praveen wasn't sure how much she could deny her. Chapter 18 The Sound of Murder Bombay, February 1921 Perveen bid a restrained goodbye to Alice at the gate, where one constable was holding back a cluster of neighbors and tradesmen who had come to inquire about the presence of the police car. As Perveen began a quick walk back to the bungalow, the Farid's young maid ran after her, calling out her name. Perveen stopped. What is it, Fatima? Can you tell the police to bring back my Abba? She said between sobs. The policeman took him. Perveen was staggered by this new information. But I didn't see him when he arrived, and the sub-inspector was still taking fingerprints. Others came. A white man. I think he's the one who ordered the constables to take him. But it's all my fault. Perveen felt a mix of emotions. First was great relief that a perpetrator had been caught, which meant the widows would be safe. But Fatima's tear-stained face moved her, and the haste of the arrest made her skeptical. Tell me what happened. They came to me and grabbed my hands. They pushed them into black ink. I washed and washed, and I cannot get rid of the marks. Examining the girl's stained fingertips, Perveen said, They might have fingerprinted, because you're the only one who goes on both sides of the house. They must distinguish you from the person who attacked Mr. Mukri. It doesn't mean you are considered guilty. I would rather have them take me than take Abba, she wailed. Who will take care of Zaid? Please try to calm yourself. What did the constables ask you? They asked if I saw Abba go into the house, and I said yes. Remember, he came to save you when Mukri Saab was shouting. But then he was gone. He only just came back, and they surrounded him and wouldn't let me near. Then they took him. I need to know more. In the last hour, did you hear anything unusual? They asked that too. I told them the truth. I couldn't hear anything but Jum Jum crying. He's getting a tooth. She shifted from one small bare foot to the other. Could you please come back to the Zanana? The Begums are terribly upset. The nasty white policeman is still here. It dawned on Perveen that the man was likely Sub-Inspector Singh's boss, Inspector Vaughn. Perveen told Fatima to go to her brother. Then she walked to the doorway of the Zanana, where she found a short Englishman in his late twenties at the closed door. He was hammering it with his fists. Namaste, he shouted in a manner that had little to do with the word's meaning. It was also a Hindu greeting, not used with Muslims. Good afternoon, sir, Perveen said in English. I'm afraid. The man whirled around and gaped at her. 
Farid Begum. Holding out her hand, she said, My name is Bavin Mistry. He didn't take her hand, but peered accusingly at her with bulging blue eyes. Do you have any association with the Parsi gentleman who's bothering my constables? Coolly, Perveen said, I'm the daughter of Mr. Jamshedji Abbas Mistry, and we practice together at Mistry Law. Are you Inspector Vaughan? Chief Inspector Vaughan. He squinted at her suspiciously. I didn't know Lady Vakils existed. I'm a solicitor, not a vakil. Taking out her handkerchief to dry off her palms, Praveen tried to sound pleasanter. I don't know if my father mentioned that the widows who live here are burden machines. They would feel violated if they had to face you in an interview. They have very limited contact with men. One would think they'd wish to relax the rules to capture a murder suspect, he grumbled. Typically, the custom is for men with a valid need to speak with them through a screen, she said crisply. I've been hammering this door for ten minutes and am on the verge of breaking it down. I won't have to do it if you'd convince them to speak with me. Perveen paused, reading the anxiety in the detective's red face. Since Mohsen had been taken into custody, it was unlikely that Vaughn thought one of the widows had killed Mr. Mukri. However, they were all potential witnesses, given that they had been on the scene, and it would be safer for them if she met privately with them first. I'd be very glad to help, Inspector Vaughn, but I can tell you that they would be more candid if I talked to them alone. Would you like me to ask what they might have seen or heard? Naturally, he said, sounding slightly mollified. Do you know where Faisal Mukri's family lives? She shook her head. Sorry, Mr. Mukri was a bachelor and employed at Farid Fabrics, so management may have a family record. And there's the matter of the watchman. The little maidservant told Singh that he was briefly in the house and then went on an errand. But she's his daughter, so he could have made her lie for him. I can't see a reason for a bungalow watchman to leave his post to run errands, he added with a snort. I'll do my best with the ladies, Praveen reassured him. Will you be on the other side of the house? Vaughn blinked as if she'd startled him. Perhaps he wasn't used to being questioned by Indians. Yes, I'll be at the death scene with the coroner. Fans whirred quietly on the ceiling of the downstairs great room, where Sakina sat against the bolsters. The second widow's head was bent over the embroidery piece she was working on. Razia's daughter, Amina, appeared to be reading a book. Soft chanting could be heard from the small side room. Razia is praying, Sakina said, tilting her head toward the room where Perveen had admired the mehrab. I have prayed already with my daughters. Razia wished for Amina to pray, but she has not done it. Amina's lips were pressed together, and her eyes had a dull look. Praveen longed to embrace her, but knew better. She learned about the power structure of the Zanana, and didn't want to usurp Sakina's role. Sakina Begum, shall we go upstairs to talk? Praveen asked. Sakina looked up, revealing reddened eyes. I want to stay near my children. They're just outside in the garden now, with Deba Aya. After what happened, I want to be near them. For all Sakina's concerns about her children, Praveen wondered at the widow's decision to sit inside and leave the Aya caring for them. She suspected this was the custom, just as Sakina chose not to have the little one stay with her in her elegant private bedroom. Praveen hadn't even seen Jum Jum yet. Clearing her throat, she said, I'm so sorry this happened. I wonder if I'd stayed with you this afternoon. It might have deterred whoever did it. We shall never know, 
Sakina said, wiping at her eyes. I keep thinking, what would my husband say if he knew the man he appointed guardian died protecting me and all the others? My poor father, Amina said in a whisper. They'll be in heaven together. Sakina reached out to stroke the girl's hair. A loving gesture, but Amina moved away. Praveen told Sakina about Mr. Vaughn's arrival and how he wished to know if she'd heard or seen anything unusual. Sakina gave her a rueful look. What could we possibly see when we are on the secluded side of the bungalow? We can't hear much except for what's right under our windows. It's possible to see into the main reception room, Praveen said, remembering the shape she'd spotted before. The girls sometimes take turns peeking from the shoe cabinet, Sakina said, but neither they nor I were downstairs after you departed us. Mohsen wasn't at his post. Do you have any idea why? After you departed, I had such a bad headache that I asked Fatima to see if he could go to the market and fetch some atta for me. Sakina touched her hand to the side of her head. Praveen noted the widow had loosened her hair from the elegant topknot she'd worn before, and her long, inky black hair was wet and hung straight down to her waist. I went to lie down. Do you think Mohsen's absence led to this crime? Of course, Amina said emphatically. If nobody is guarding the gate, anyone could come in. And you are always sending him on this errand and that. We hardly have a guard at all. Don't be insolent, Sakina scolded. It's nobody's fault, Praveen said hastily, because Sakina's hand had come up as if ready to slap the girl. The police will surely need to know that Mohsen was away on official business. So thank you, Sakina Begum. Amina, it would be most helpful if you could tell me anything you heard outside of the ordinary. I promised the police I'd ask. I'm sure I heard a scream. Amina's answer came readily. When? Praveen was eager to hear more. About a half hour after you left, I was in the garden with the other two, putting away Mumtaz Hala's musical instruments because she was feeling poorly. I heard this scream. I didn't know who it was. There is plenty of yelling on the street when merchants come through selling their wares, Sakina said. Perhaps it was one of them. I think I knew it was a man's voice, but the shout didn't sound like selling, Amina said. It sounded scary, but the others were chattering, so they didn't notice it. Sakina's expression tightened, as if Amina's description had worried her. I heard nothing, because I was resting in my room. You are a good girl, Amina, to help Paveen Bibi. I shall tell the police what you've said, and they may want to know more. Paveen saw the tension on Sakina's face. What is it? She shook her head. This is such a terrible shock. I just can't imagine how we are going to manage life by ourselves. And we haven't got our money yet from the estate. That is your job, isn't it? I'm sorry for the delay, Praveen apologized, knowing that she had worked intermittently on the paper since December. I was waiting for Mukri Saab to provide me with the creditor's names. I'll do it without him. She paused, not knowing how the next part could come out without offending the child. Amina, I beg your pardon, but I need to speak privately with Sakina Begum for a few moments. Amina gave the two of them a look that was almost venomous. And why can't I be part of it? A man died. Do you think I won't notice? There are things that are too much for someone your age, Praveen said gently. Very well, then, Amina said. I'm going upstairs. There's something I need to see. Your mother wouldn't like to know you're behaving like this, 
Zakina told the girl. Perveen watched Amina tread the stairs up to the second floor, imagining the child would fit herself into some hidey hole to keep listening. Turning back to Sakina, Perveen lowered her voice. I heard your voice coming from Razia Begum's room a few hours ago. What were you talking about? Sakina's eyes flashed with surprise. You went upstairs on your own? Without us knowing? Her question made Praveen realize that her own behavior could look suspicious. Trying not to sound defensive, she said, I was looking for my briefcase. That was all. There was a rustle of silk, and Praveen looked up to find Razia had come from her prayers. Her face was drawn into long lines of exhaustion, and her eyes seemed sunken and despairing. My condolences to you, Razia Begum. Perveen felt awkward uttering the rote phrase. Faisal Mukri had come into Razia's life and made it awful. The sympathy Perveen offered was a response to the shock Razia had suffered and the fear of violence she would perhaps live with for the rest of her life. I can answer the question about our conversation, Razia said soberly. This afternoon, Amina looked through the slot in the jali and saw a man lying in blood. She came running to tell Sakina because her room was closest. She told Sakina that the dead man was Mukri Saab. Sakina told me, and I called Muntaz to join us. Praveen wasn't surprised that Amina knew what Mr. Mukri looked like. The girl had surely peeked through the jolly at him. She had probably been the one watching Perveen through the shoe case the previous day. But if Amina had spied Mr. Mukri's corpse, why hadn't she mentioned this to Perveen? Amina had spoken of hearing a scream, but not encountering a horrific sight. I was shocked and thought Amina could have been wrong, Sakina said, cutting into Perveen's thoughts. Just because the man was dressed in an English suit, it didn't mean he was our household agent. He could have been some enemy from the outside. To answer any doubts, I said we should have Fatima look. She has served him before, so she would know his appearance. Razia sat down, giving the second wife a reproving look. I didn't agree with that. Amina was very upset, and I said that no other child in the house should see such a bloody death. I suggested Mosen should go to look, because he is a man accustomed to the hardness of the world. Sakina said he could not go because she'd sent him shopping. Perveen noted the contempt in Razia's voice, although Sakina did not visibly react. Perveen asked, did you consider calling the police and asking them to make the identification? To make that telephone call, we would have had to go downstairs and into the main house. Razia dropped her gaze to her lap. That was frightening, because we did not know if the murderer was still on the property. We did the first thing that came to mind, taking our children into our private rooms and locking the door. Sakina said, shivering as she spoke. We stayed until we heard the sounds of the police arriving. Did you call them? I did, Perveen acknowledged. Now I'm wondering something. Do you have any knowledge of trouble between Mosen and Mr. Mukri? I have not heard of any trouble, Razia said. Mousen used to work for Farid Fabrics on the docks, but my husband shifted him to this job at the house when his wife died, because this was a safer place for children without a mother to grow up. We could direct them, as could Teba Aya. In the six years we've had Mousen, I've spoken to him through the Jali just a few times. Usually Fatima is the go-between. Perhaps you should ask Mumtaz, 
She was acquainted with Mukri Saab when he went with her husband to see her on Falkland Road. As Sakina mentioned the name of the entertainment district, she raised her eyebrows as if to remind both of the third wife's unsavory past. Mumtaz's absence from their conference seemed to be another example of how she lived on the edge of the family's framework. Praveen said, Before I speak with Mumtaz, tell me which relative you'd like to come and stay. Sakina was silent for a long moment and then shook her head. My brothers are doing business in Pune, so it is impossible. I don't believe I can suggest anyone. Really? Praveen was surprised because Sakina had such a dominant role in the house. I am speaking of any relatives who could give company and also assist with needs you have. Or perhaps a good friend? Looking tiredly at Praveen, Razia said, The situation is a bit difficult because of Mumtaz. How so? Praveen asked. Our families look down on women who go about the world, and even more so on those who have entertained men, Sakina said bluntly. They believe to stay in the same bungalow with her would soil them. That is why we've had very few social callers in the last year. Our husband made a choice that has affected this house forever. If this was the way both women felt, Praveen wondered if they had ever tried to convince Mumtaz to leave. Razia's raspy voice interrupted Praveen's thoughts. Allah must be looking kindly on her for the care she gave our husband. She has nothing to do any more. That's why I suggested she teach the children to play music. Do you have a suggestion for the next household agent? Praveen asked Razia. My people are even farther than Sakina's. They have an agricultural estate in Aoud. Amina enjoys them very much. We last visited two years ago. But it just isn't possible for anyone to shift here. Are there any friends in Bombay who could come? The two remained silent. If you can't think of anyone, I'll ask Mumtaz Begum for a suggestion. Razia's eyes widened, and Sakina gave a small exclamation of dismay. Yes, Praveen said. Please think some more about who you'd like to have visit. Maintaining a hard silence, Sakina guided Praveen upstairs to Mumtaz's room. It took several knocks before Mumtaz responded. The room was dark, with curtains drawn across the jollies, and the air held a thick, musty odor. Please turn on a light. Mumtaz whispered from the rumpled bed where she lay. I see you're still not feeling well, Praveen said, moving to the bed to take Mumtaz's hand. Shall I call a doctor? No need. I was feeling better, Mumtaz murmured. This will pass in some hours. I heard from the others that Mukri Saab's body was discovered before I came to the house and called for the police. Apparently, the three of you talked about there being a body on the other side. Mumtaz pulled the sheet closer around her body, as if shielding herself from Praveen. Sakina Begum wanted me to look through the jali, because I'm the only one who's seen his face. But I wouldn't. Why not? To look on a dead man would bring the worst misfortune to future generations, Mumtaz said vehemently. I would not risk it. If the belief was true, Praveen thought it just as well she'd been the one to see Mukri. She would never bear any children. What did you do after Mukri Saab interrupted us in the garden? She shuddered and said, It was just dreadful. I was so frightened I ran to my quarters and then went to take a bath. 
A bath? Praveen found that hard to believe. It seemed like an indulgent act in the midst of a storm. But both Sakina and Razia had retreated to their rooms. While I'm in the bathroom, nobody will bother me. It is too far from the hallway, she added. I'll tell the police where you were. However, can you recall any kind of noise or commotion in the time before the other wives called you for the discussion? No. The bathroom is close to the outside garden. I hear only birds from that place, and sometimes people in the street. Purveen caught an inconsistency. How did you hear the other widows call you for the discussion, then? Amina came into my room and knocked on the bathroom door. Thank you for your explanation. Praveen considered her next words carefully. Can you think of anyone trustworthy to come here as a household guardian? Must we have a new man staying here? Mumtaz sounded alarmed. Who will choose him so we don't have such a terrible time again? It doesn't have to be a man. However, unless one of you decide to give up Burda, you will require someone to get money from the bank and deal with merchants and other officials. I will help as best I can, but I regret to say I cannot stay here as a household guardian. After a pause, Mumtaz said, I have a sister who is married. Her husband is a good man who makes his living building sitars and venas. I think they would gladly come, but the other wives would never allow it. A lady with a husband sounds like a good idea, Purveen reassured her, and neither Sakina Begum nor Razia Begum have made suggestions yet, so I will bring this to them. Shyly, Mumtaz said, if they are willing, I would like to speak to my sister, Tanvia. Can you send word to her to come? If you give me her name and address, I'll send a messenger. Mumtaz gave her an address, which she duly wrote down. Then Mumtaz said, It's all so frightening to have had this happen. I can't think how someone could have entered the bungalow without Mosen stopping him. Mosen was away from the gate running an errand for Sakina Begum, Praveen said. He does that for us, Mumtaz said, nodding. Always keeps a bit of the money for himself, the service fee. But what choice do we have? The widows had lived a life at the mercy of men who were supposed to serve them. Praveen thought as she left Mumtaz and emerged into the dappled light of the Zanana hallway. She walked slowly down the hall and descended the stairs. Fatima was there, apparently waiting for her. What is it? Praveen asked. Is your brother all right? Looking about as if to make sure no one was watching, Fatima whispered, Yes, I told him you would help us. Razia Bacon wants to speak to you alone. The timing wasn't good. Praveen wanted to tell Vaughn the brief reports she'd received from all the women. I shall be back to speak with her in just a bit. But Razia Bacon must see you now. She's waiting in your car. Inside my car? Praveen was stunned. Did Razia want to leave the bungalow? And if so, would she take Amina? I suggested the car to her because it's parked so very close to the Zanana entrance. But my driver doesn't know about the customs of ladies and Burda. He's not there, Fatima said quickly. I went out to that driver and said your father needed to speak with him. He went in the bungalow. When he returns, I shall tell him you are inside and ask him to stay away until called for. How clever, Praveen said, 
patting Fatima's small shoulder. Despite her youth, she was a master of subterfuge. But then again, such a talent could prove suspicious. Razia was in the back seat of the Daimler, with the window rolled up. Perveen peered in from the other side of the passenger row, watching the widow's bent head and her moving lips. Her eyes were closed, and it looked as if she was whispering a prayer. A veil covered much of her head and face. Perveen supposed it was for protection against the gaze of Armand and any other men who might come by. Perveen tapped on the glass, not wanting to startle her by suddenly opening a door. It's only me. Shall I come in? Razia turned toward the window and nodded. Perveen opened the car door and spoke in a whisper. This car is very warm. May I roll down my window? Nobody else is nearby. Are you certain? Perveen turned all the way around to survey the scene. Armand had come out of the main house, but was sitting on the step, too far away to see or hear them. It's all right. Tell me, did you come out to my car because you want me to take you and Amina away? No. I've something to tell you that I didn't before. Razia's face was drenched in perspiration, either from the warmth of the car or her emotion. Perveen's suspicion of some connection between her and Mukri's death was growing. Looking sick, Razia murmured, I've come because I want to confess. Tell the police not to question anyone else about Mukri Saab's killing. I am the one who did it.